members, the President. Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should live as social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society. Bless this Legislative Council now assembled to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the well-being and good order of society in Western Australia, that all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role for which they have been chosen, and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory, the honour of Her Majesty and the continued benefit of the people of this State. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. This House acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajak Noongar people, and pays its respects to their elders, both past and present. Thank you, Member. I was really pleased to see Santa made a visit to the Chamber, but, um, but you know the rules, so thank you for disrobing. I'm not too sure about the, the loud and leery tie, but we'll see how we go. <laughs> might, might be a new... We're calling the Beau Brummel of the Legislative Council. So, um, Members, are there any petitions? The Honourable Aaron Stonehouse. Thank you, Madam President. I present a petition containing 7,176 signatures couched in the following terms. To the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament Assembled, we, the undersigned, call upon the Legislative Council to facilitate the legislation, the legalisation of the use of nicotine and electronic vaping devices as a less harmful alternative to smoking tobacco. Current laws in WA are not only behind the times, but are putting people's health at risk. For this reason, we call upon the Legislative Council to a amend the Tobacco Control Act 2006 to legalise the sale of vaping devices and b amend the Medicines and Poisons Act 2014 to allow for the sale and use of nicotine in such devices. The people of WA deserve free and easy access to a harm reduction alternative to smoking, and we call upon the Legislative Council to make such access a reality in law. And your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. Are there any further petitions? Are there any statements by ministers or parliamentary secretaries? The parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Education. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Last year, the Honourable Sue Ellery, Minister for Education and Training, asked me to review the Department of Education's policy on community use of public school facilities and resources, following correspondence from a number of members of parliament and the school community. Schools are often seen as the heart of the community. In addition to providing a space for students to learn, they are also important facilities for the community. Sports clubs, local government, community groups and residents can all benefit from a school's facilities, including ovals, gymnasiums, undercover areas and performing arts centres. In fact, some new suburbs, schools are the only places where there are sports ovals and facilities such as playing courts. However, it is important to strike the right balance between sharing facilities and maintaining security and safety so that schools are not disadvantaged for opening up and sharing their facilities. There were concerns raised by some members of the community that school facilities were not widely available for community use by local sports clubs and the wider public. Existing Department of Education policies on community use were unclear. As part, of, as part of my project, I visited a number of schools in both metropolitan and regional locations that were identified as great community hubs and a review was undertaken on existing policies and procedures. During my visits, schools were able to share with me the real benefits that come with sharing their facilities, as well as some of the challenges. These are outlined in case studies from my school visits to Beldiva Secondary College, Subiaco Primary School, and Hammersley Primary School and She Oak Grove Primary School. These benefits included providing access to services to support families and communities, opening up green space, which is vital in new suburbs, and lower risk of willful damage to schools. 
I am pleased to advise the House that, following my review, a range of initiatives have been developed to encourage and support greater community use of these valuable public facilities. The Department of Education will now release a renewed position on community, community use of public school facilities and support for schools to provide a more consistent approach. This will include a simplified community use of school facilities policy and supporting guidelines, promotional materials outlining the benefits to the community and a suite of resources to support schools to make their facilities available to the community. This work reflects the extensive consultation and feedback from schools and stakeholders as part of the review. Information on the renewed policy and support for schools is available on the Department of Education's intranet. The community can access information on a dedicated page on the department's website. This announcement is not compulsory. There are some schools where it will not work, and that's OK. This announcement is to provide the tools necessary to empower those schools who choose to open up their facilities. I'm confident that this support will encourage access for the community to a wider range of facilities and resources. From these visits, I have seen the very best of what schools can do to become the heart of their community. Are there any further statements by ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Members, I have the following papers for tabling. Auditor General's papers regulating minor pollutants report number 8, November 2020. Western Australian Registry System application controls audit report number 9, November 2020. Reports Corruption and Crime Commission report on electorate allowances and management of electorate officers, November 2020. And members, I've also today received correspondence from the uh, Minister for Mines, Petrol Mines and Petroleum, Energy, Industrial Relations, the Honourable Bill Johnston, MLA, in relation to report number 35 of the Standing Committee on Public Administration, and I table that correspondence as well. Are there any further papers for tabling the Minister for the Environment? Madam President, I have the following papers for tabling determinations, Planning and Development Act 2005, Ministerial Determination by the Minister for Planning regarding structure plan of lot 3082 Cable Beach Broom and reports disability access and inclusion plan Minister's progress report. Are there any further papers for tabling? The Honourable Jim Chown. Uh, Madam President, thank you. Uh, I'm directed to re present report number 17 of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission, meaningful reform overdue the Corruption and Crime Misconduct Act 2003. If that report's tabled. Would you like to make a statement? Yes, I would, Madam President, a, sh a brief one. This report of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission is entitled Meaningful uh, Review Overdue, the Corruption and Crime Misconduct Act of 2003. Over the course of the 40th Parliament, the Committee has observed various areas where the Corruption, Crime and Misconduct Act is deficient, obsolete and, or unclear. Key stakeholders have brought the Committee's attention to issues arising from the application of the Act in its current form and areas where the Act would benefit from improvement. These stakeholders have functions provided on the Act. They include the Corruption and Crime Commission, the Parliamentary Inspector and the Public Sector Commission. In addition, the committee has heard from other individuals and agencies who also identify areas of the Act that could be improved. The need for a comprehensive review of the CCM Act is necessary and overdue. The former CCCC Act required that the Minister carry out a review of the operation and effectiveness of the Act. Uh, this was undertaken by uh, uh, Gail Archer, Senior Counsel, who published her report in February 2008. The report made 58 recommendations concerning the Act. One of these was that a further review be conducted of the Act eight years after its commencement. The committee is concerned that a, review, uh, that a further review of the Act is necessary but has not yet occurred. In repairing this report, the committee has collated feedback from diverse stakeholders endeavouring to draw attention to these comments as areas should be afforded throughout, through, through, through thorough consideration when the Act is finally reviewed. What is made abundantly clear through the collation of feedback from these stakeholders is that a comprehensive review is necessary to support much needed reform of the Act. Are there any further papers for tabling? The Honourable Matthew Swinburne. Uh, Madam President, I'm directed to present report number 57 of the Standing Committee on Environment and Public Affairs, overview of petitions the 1st of July 2020 to the 1st of 30th. 1st of October 2020. That report's table. Would you like to make a statement? Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, the report that I have just tabled advises the House of the petitions that were finalised by the committee during the four-month period between July and October 2020. During this period, 15 new petitions were tabled in the Legislative Council, and the committee concluded its inquiries in relation to nine petitions. 
environmental issues, particularly the impact of emissions on human health and wellbeing, were the focus of petitions concerning the Coburn Cement Factory and the dust emissions in Port Hedland. Environmental concerns were also raised in a petition that called for a review of a broad-scale prescri prescribed burning in the southwest. Throughout the course of this parliament, the prevalence of petitions about planning and transport matters are uh, evidence that these issues will often provoke community action and protests. Opposition to the redevelopment of the Mount Pleasant Bowling Club and the Glen Iris Golf Club are two such examples outlined in the report. At the end of this reporting period, the committee was continuing its inquiries into a further 14 open petitions. I commend the report to the House. Are there any further papers for tabling? The Honourable yeah. Alana Clossy. Thanks, Madam President. I'm directed to present report number 83 of the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations 2020-21 Budget Cycle Part 1, Estimates, Hearings and Related Matters, and 2019-20 Budget Cycle Part 2, Annual Report Hearings. That report is tabled. Would you like to make a statement? Yes, Madam President. Madam President, the report I've just tabled advises the House that uh, one, the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations conducted joint hearings with 14 agencies regarding their 2019-20 annual reports and 2021 uh, budget estimates in mid-November 2020. Understandably, the COVID-19 pandemic was a significant topic for members' questions. Although no theme was adopted this year, the committee initiated a series of questions seeking further information from agencies on how they intend to remedy their qualified audits, matters of significance or emphasis of matter in their audit reports, on their separations under the Voluntary Targeted Separation Scheme and on progress made to integrate key systems arising from machinery of government changes since 2017. Consistent with previous practice, the committee compiled a table of occasions when ministers, for various reasons, did not provide requested information. The committee was satisfied with the conduct of its hearings, the level of attendance and member participation. Both government and non-government members asked a wide variety of questions and a significant number of subject matters were canvassed. Overall, 47 agencies were asked 306 questions prior to hearings. During the hearings, some 341 subject matters were canvassed. The committee extends its appreciation to those members who participated in the hearings and the assistance given by ministers and their agencies. The 2019-20 Budget Cycle Part 2 Annual Reports Hearings is now completed and closed. I commend the report to the House. Are there any further papers for tabling? The Honourable Dr Sally Talbot. Thank you, Madam President. I'm directed to, report, to present report number seven of the Joint Standing Committee on the Commissioner for Children and Young People discussion paper in their own voices, the participation of children and young people in parliamentary proceedings. That report's table. Would you like to make a statement? I would. Thank you, Madam uh, President. As chair of the Joint Standing Committee on the Commissioner for Children and Young People, it is my pleasure to present this discussion paper, which arises from the proposition that hearing the voice of children and taking into account their views on matters that affect them is, worth, is important and worthwhile. This discussion paper acknowledges the rights of children to form and express their views on matters affecting them. This right is set out in Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the convention to which the Commissioner for Children and Young People is under a statutory obligation to have regard. It has been more than 30 years since Australia became a signatory to this convention, yet its provisions are seen, still seen as controversial by some and realising Article 12 in practice remains problematic. Working with children and young people in a meaningful way is made more difficult if there are limited tools available to help organisations such as Parliament plan and engage in this type of participation. While it is a matter for the Parliament to consider, the Committee's view is that the development of detailed guidance about how to engage with children safely and appropriately will help future parliamentary committees ascertain how and when to engage with children and young people. The parliamentary system is one that strives to reflect the voices, interests and concerns of the entire population. Given that a quarter of the Western Australian population is under 18 years old, incorporating the views of children and young people on matters that affect them will help make the parliament more representative and inclusive. In the committee's view, better decisions will be made if children can have their say about decisions about what matters to them. 
With the end of the 40th Parliament in sight, the Committee hopes that those in the next Parliament will use the information put forward in this discussion paper to start considering ways in which children and young people might be encouraged to participate in parliamentary proceedings. With other jurisdictions showing us the way, there is good reason to suggest that now is the time for this matter to be taken seriously by the 41st Parliament in Western Australia. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members for their commitment to this issue and acknowledge the support of the committee's advisers, and I commend the discussion paper to the House. Are there any further papers for tabling? Are there any notices of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? Are there any motions without notice? The Leader of the House. President, I move without notice that the Honourable Yorn Sidma be appointed as a member of the Standing Committee on Procedures and Privileges. If I may, uh, Madam Leader President, of the House. Um, this arises as a result of the result of the resignation uh, from that committee of the Honourable Rick Mazza. Um, I just uh, make the point that this is um, a major, one of the major parties replacing a representative uh, from the crossbenchers. So I just, um, the House at one, some point may want to uh, reflect on that, but that's what the House is doing today. Members, the Leader of the House has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Without notice that the House at its rising adjourn until a date and time to be fixed by the President. Members, the Leader of the House has moved that motion and the question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, we now move to orders of the day and we're dealing with order of the day number one, Curtin University Statute number 12, admission and enrolment disallowance. The Honourable Robin Chappell. Madam President, I move without notice that, pursuant to the recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 1, Curtin University Statute No. 12, Admission and Enrolment, be discharged from the notice paper. And by way of explanation, uh, the Committee's concerns in relation to this particular matter have been resolved to the satisfaction of its members. Members, the Honourable Robin Chappell has moved the order of the day number one, Curtin University Statute number 12, admission and enrolment disallowance be discharged from the notice paper. The question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, we now move to, uh, that's agreed, we now move to order of the day number two, Curtin University Statute number five, election of council members disallowance. The question is the motion be agreed. The uh, Leader of the House? Uh, yes. I don't know if it's the normal protocol that the chair would go first, because I'm fine if he wants to. Well, I might, if that's all right, the, the Honourable Robin Chapman. Uh, look, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, we did table a, a committee report and uh, we did give a, uh, a statement to that report and uh, we would urge members to support uh, the disallowance standing in the name of the Delegated Legislation Committee. Okay. Members, the Honourable Robin Chapel has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. The Leader of the House. President. Um, the Government will be uh, supporting uh, the report's uh, recommendation. So on the 18th of March 2020, the Curtin University Council amended Curtin Statute 5, which related to the processes for electing representatives of students, staff and graduates to the Council. Uh, the previous Statutes 5, um, election by staff and 9, uh, elections by students, went into some detail about the election processes. Previous Statute 5 staff uh, elections included considerable detail about the election process, including electoral rolls, the processes for nomination, the provision of ballot papers and the counting of votes. Previous Statute 9 student elections prescribed issues such as the eligibility of candidates and filling of vacant positions, but the rules made by Council under the authority of Statute 9 provided more detail about the process for electing student representatives. The new Statute 5 does not go into adequate detail about the processes, stating that those details would be contained in the rules to be made by the Council. The university contended that the new Statute 5 was to consolidate election processes for different groups into one statute, which would also include election of graduate representatives, 
provided for under the 2016 amendments to the Curtin University Act. The university further contended that this approach to delegate more of the administrative uh, details to the rules is consistent with its approach over a number of years. The committee wrote to me on the 24th of September 2020 asking why the processes for electing members of the council have been dealt with in the rules rather than in statutes and what the legal basis was for this. Curtin contended that it was empowered by its legislation to prescribe these procedures in the rules. While the matter is not beyond doubt, after considering the concerns raised by the committee, I consider the manner of electing council members should be substantively addressed in a statute and not by rules. While this interpretation has not been agreed to by the university, it has agreed to remake Statute 5 at its December 2020 council meeting to contain the detailed provisions which they've included in the rules. On the 23rd of October, I wrote to the committee advising them of Curtin's decision and requested the committee consider postponing further consideration of Statute 5 so the committee can be informed of the revision of Statute 5 by the Curtin University Council at its December 2020 meeting. In its November 2020 report to the Parliament, the committee has recommended that Statute 5 be disallowed based on its reading of the Act that the Parliament intended the election of the University Council is to be subject to parliamentary scrutiny. The committee states it's unable to delay the question of disallowance uh, because under our standing orders, uh, where on the proposed last sitting day prior to a general election, uh, a motion to disallow regulation remains unresolved, then the question shall be put before the Council rises on that day. Um, given I share the view that Statute 5 in its current form is not acceptable, and given the time constraints, uh, we will be supporting the disallowance motion. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, look, I rise as the, the lead spokesperson for the opposition with regard um, to this disallowance, and I, um, I also indicate that the opposition will be supporting um, the, di the disallowance. I have read the uh, committee's um, report, and I thank them um, for that. And it is clear from that report, and certainly my reading of both the Act and Statute 5, um, that the committee was correct uh, in its recommendation that the statute be disallowed. Um, the minister has gone through the process, but um, it is also clear to me, um, and this was also reflected from the committee's report, that the previous Statute 5, um, which has been replaced, did correctly set out the manner in which council members were to be elected, and those were deleted from the current uh, Statute 5. So given that, um, the opposition will support the recommendation of the committee and will support the disallowance. I will just also add that in reading the committee's report, I did and I appreciate that we have had statute number 12 now discharged from the notice paper. Um, but uh, I did read that report, which did cover off on, on statute 12 as, as well. Just for the record, um, I will indicate that I actually agreed with the committee's um, interpretation um, of, uh, of the Act, and if it hadn't have been discharged, I actually would have supported the disallowance. Members, we're dealing with order of the day number two, Curtin University Statute number five, election of council members disallowance, and the Honourable Robin Chapel has moved that pursuant to the recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, the Curtin University Statute number five, election of council members published in the Gazette on the 24th of July 2020 and table in the Legislative Council on the 11th of August 2020 under the Curtin University Act 1966 B and is hereby disallowed. The question is the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, we're now moving on to deal with order of the day number three, Public Transport Authority Amendment Regulations 2020 disallowance. The Honourable Robin Chapel. Madam President, uh, I move without notice that pursuant to the recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day Number 3, Public Transport Authority Amendment Regulations 2020, be discharged from the notice paper. And again, by way of explanation, the concerns that the committee had in relation to this matter have been addressed to the satisfaction of its members, and so we seek discharge. Members, the Honourable Robin Chapel has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. That's agreed. Now we move on to order of the day number four. City of Albany, jetties, bridges, boat pens and swimming structures, local law 2020. Disallowance. The Honourable Robin Chapel. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I move without notice, pursuant to the recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the day number four, City of Albany, jetties, bridges, boat pens and swimming structures, local law 2020, be discharged from the notice paper. And again, by way of explanation, 
the concerns the committee had in relation to this matter have been addressed to the satisfaction of its members, and therefore we seek discharge. Members, the Honourable Robin Chapel has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. That's agreed. We now move on to order of the day number 37, Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020. Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. I move that the bill be now read a third time. Members, the minister has. Uh, oh, sorry. The question is the bill be read a third time. Oh, sorry. The report oh, yeah. Yeah. Members, I have received from the Deputy Chair of Committees a certificate in writing that this is a true copy of the bill as agreed to in the Committee of the Whole House and reported. And the question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Swan Valley Planning Bill 2020, third reading. Members, we now move on to order of the day number 13, Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment Change of Name Bill 2018. Leader of the House. I move the report be adopted. Members, the question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And now I want to move to the third reading. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended so as to enable the bill to be now read a third time forthwith. Thank you. Uh, members, the Leader of the House has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. Uh, I will say that uh, we do need an absolute majority in the House. Uh, so before I put the question, I'll just do a quick head count. An absolute majority is present in the House. The question is the motion be agreed. Those of, the, those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Madam President, I move the bill be read a third time. Members, the question is the bill be read a third time. Oh. Same thing. Sorry. Members, I've received from the Deputy Chair of Committees a certificate in writing that this is a true copy of the bill as agreed to in the Committee of the Whole House and Reporter. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Births, Deaths and Marriages Registration Amendment Change of Name Bill 2018, third reading. Members, we now move to order of the day 22, Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates Bill 2019. The question is the bill be read a second time. It's the continuation of the remarks of the Honourable Alison Zamon. President, um, I'll continue my remarks from yesterday where I was addressing the problem of uncertain dates in four particular scenarios. And the four sets of provisions that I outlined are not uh, mutually exclusive. They can operate together where necessary. For example, if there is uncertainty as to both the date of the offence as well as the age of the victim uh, when that offence was um, committed. Um, I, do, I do note that the bill is not retrospective and the bill applies um, to, instead to all alleged acts and omissions regardless of whether they, uh, um, oh, sorry, the bill applies to all of that. Uh, um, sorry, I note that the bill is retrospective and the bill applies to all alleged acts and omissions regardless of whether they occurred before or after um, the bill's commen uh, commencement. However, it's not retrospective in the sense that it doesn't create new offences, it doesn't render anything illegal that was previously legal. Uh, and nor does it expose um, an offender to the risk of a higher maximum penalty, nor does it expose a person to double jeopardy if they, if they were previously acquitted uh, because of uncertainty about the dates. Um, and so, as a result, they're not going to be re retried because of this bill. So what it does do is remove a barrier that can stop prosecution from proceeding. Um, how often this has actually been occurring isn't known uh, because data is, hasn't been kept regarding the decision of investigators about whether to lay charges or not. However, I do note in the other place two examples were given of, mat of matters where charges had been laid uh, and uncertainty of, of dates had, had subsequently become an issue. Um, one was um, SI versus the State of Western Australia number two, where a conviction of penetrating a child under 13 years was overturned because of uncertainty about the date of the offence um, uh, and, and how that and um, making it uncertain whether it was the old offence or a new offence sh that should apply because it spanned a period of, of, um, of a change in law. And also Kalis versus the Queen, uh, which was another appeal case, and in that case there was uncertainty about whether sexual offences had actually been committed before or after the victim's 13th birthday. Uh, bail eligibility, parole eligibility and aggravating or mitigating factors will apply as usual to the offence um, with which the accused is charged. 
Uh, I note that the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse did some excellent work in this space. Uh, the Commission found that many uh, victims are not disclosing, they do not disclose uh, child sexual abuse until many years after the abuse occurred and often until they're well into adulthood. Um, so survivors who gave evidence um, to the Commission um, to, uh, rep uh, reported taking on average 23.9 years to tell someone about the abuse. Uh, and men often took even longer to disclose than women. Uh, so the average for females was 20.6 years and for, for men it was 25. 6.6 years. So there are many barriers to disclosure and there's still a lot of work to do to break down these barriers and of course the Royal Commission made a range of recommendations in that space and I know work is being done on addressing those recommendations and I think it's incredibly important that this work um, is made a priority. So the Greens are very happy uh, to support this bill. We think this is a, an important mechanism to try to prevent the miscarriages of justice uh, where perpetrators uh, evade conviction because it could not be conclusively established when the offending took place. I particularly welcome uh, the potential positive impact on prosecution of, ch of children uh, sexual abuse offenders, uh, which we know are particularly heinous and, and, they, and has a, often a lifelong impact on victims. Um, and so it, we are very happy to support. Um, I, I do note there is still more work to be done, in particular um, I would like to see a prioritisation of additional important law reform in this space, like ra raising the age of criminal respons responsibility. That would have been a bill that I would have loved to have seen brought in and debated um, and passed um, before the, the end of this year. These are the sorts of related bills which I think would help to complement these important law reforms that we have in front of us um, here today. So I'm certainly hoping that this is the suite of reform that will be prioritised uh, in the next Parliament. Second time, the Honourable Nick Goran. Thank you, Madam President. We're dealing with the Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates Bill of 2019. There are several things that I'd like to say about this bill. Firstly, Madam President, um, my understanding is that the bill as drafted is intended to provide a remedy to situations in which uncertainties as to particular dates prevent a person from being found guilty of a crime that is otherwise proved to have occurred. The bill before us is expected to have application across a range of matters in which there is uncertainty of relevant dates, particularly facilitating the successful prosecution of child sexual abuse offences and cases in which the trauma of the victim and the passing of time make it difficult to provide sufficient details to a court as to when the abuse occurred. Now, in light of that policy and what this bill is going to do, Madam President, it has my support. Because if this bill is going to provide greater opportunity for a conviction in child sexual abuse cases, then it has my overwhelming support. Now, it has been a significant concern to me that members that um, uh, accused, those who are accused, are often acquitted in circumstances where there has been uncertainty surrounding the date of the offence. And yet there has been no particular uncertainty about the guilt of the offender. And it's my understanding that the purpose of this bill is to ensure that that can no longer occur. This type of injustice was something that I spoke of, Mr Acting President, in my maiden speech in 2009. Now, Mr Acting President, I am uh, disappointed I am disappointed that the McGowan government have decided to bring this bill on on the final scheduled sitting day for the Legislative Council in the 40th Parliament. And by way of explanation, Mr Acting President, I note 
that this bill was introduced into this House on the 22nd of October. Now, for the casual observer of the proceedings of the Legislative Council, they may say that that is a reasonable period of time because today is the 26th of November. What they miss in their casual observance of the proceedings of the Legislative Council is the fact that the 22nd of October to which I refer is not the 22nd of October from this calendar year, it's the 22nd of October from last year. And why this is a particularly outrageous situation, Mr Acting President, is because if members take just a micro moment to have a look at Clause 2, they will see that it is the intention of the government, with the support of this chamber, to have this Act come into operation on the day after Ascent Day. There is going to be no delay by the executive, that is the McGowan government, there is going to be no delay in these provisions coming into operation. And we know, members, from events that took place earlier this year, that the McGowan government have the capacity to ensure that the governor is available even moments before midnight on the day that a bill has passed, if necessary. We have seen that happen. <clears throat> so there is no reason, Mr Acting President, why this bill could not get the royal assent today. There's no reason why this bill couldn't get the royal assent today and come into operation tomorrow. <clears throat> that being the 27th of November. There's no good reason why that couldn't happen. <clears throat> this is not a bill where the government are asking for the House to agree that it commence by proclamation because they need to work on some forms, some form of regulations or anything like that. There's no upgrade in technology that's needed. This could come into effect tomorrow. And if it does, that would be a good thing. However, Mr Acting President, for reasons known only to the Leader of the House and the Premier of Western Australia, the McGowan government have deliberately and intentionally made sure that this bill, which would see proper redress for victims of child sexual abuse, they have purposely buried this bill on the daily notice paper for the entirety of this calendar year. None of the rest of us had any say in that. The Leader of the House decided that this bill, which will allow proper redress for victims of child sexual abuse, will be buried until the final day of the 40th Parliament and the Legislative Council. That is disgraceful. That is unacceptable. And it is the latest example in the mismanagement of the legislative program in this place by the Leader of the House and the government. We have had a variety of bills, Mr Acting President, over the course of this calendar year, where the government have urged us to pass it as quickly as possible, only for us to find out that the government are not ready to bring it into operation because they have to do a range of things. It was only yesterday, Mr Acting President, that the Leader of the House informed us that the Births, Deaths and Marriages Amendment Bill, which has now been third read earlier this morning, will need a period of three to six months before it comes into operation. Now, we could have dealt with that bill today. And had we dealt with this particular bill yesterday, it would be law today. But once again, the Leader of the House and the McGowan government continue to ensure that victims of child sexual abuse receive a low priority on the legislative program. It is significant, it is significant that they have decided to take this course of action. 
and I express my grave disappointment that this was not dealt with earlier. Members, you will all remember that at the end of last year we were dealing with a very controversial piece of legislation. And the House agreed to extra sitting times to allow the government to pass that legislation. And it is no secret that I was one of the members who did not, did not support that legislation. However, Mr Acting President, it is significant that that particular legislation, the voluntary assisted dying legislation, has not yet come into operation and will not come into operation until next year. Now, members are quite entitled to have a view to say that that was an important piece of legislation that they wanted to support. The reality is nothing's going to happen on that until the middle of next year. And this bill, which would have helped victims of child sexual abuse, could have been brought in last year. It was last in the House on the 22nd of October last year. Now, I was the lead speaker on that controversial bill, and I know exactly which day that we started the debate. It was the 15th of October, because it happened to be my birthday. It wasn't the most particularly um, pleasant bill for us to be dealing with on my birthday, but nevertheless, I was the lead speaker, and you do what you need to do in this place. So from the 15th of October last year, we were dealing with that controversial bill, which the government decided would be its top priority, and it is entitled to make that its top priority. But this, the consequence of that is that this particular bill has not seen the light of day until now. The McGowan government need to be held to account for that. Even if you are the biggest fan of voluntary assisted dying, Surely you would agree that we could have passed this bill in the course of one day, one day last week, last year, one day last year, and made sure that victims of child sexual abuse had this available to them. Surely we could have sacrificed one day last year, not according to the McGowan government, and we certainly haven't been able to sacrifice any days this year. That's the record of the McGowan government as we now close the 40th parliament. That's the level of priority that victims of child sexual abuse receive from this government. <clears throat> now, there is an issue here, Mr Acting President, that I hope that the government will be able to respond to in their reply to the second reading debate, so that at least from my perspective, even though I'm not the lead speaker for our party on this bill, there would then be no need, from my perspective, to be asking questions in committee of the whole House. But this really is dependent upon the quality of the responses that are provided to this question. And as we know, Mr Acting President, we've had three and a half years of responses provided by government rather than answers provided by government to a whole range of issues. Now, my question to the government with respect to this bill that they have decided purposely and deliberately to bury over the last 12 months is, has anyone in government given any consideration to the intersection between this bill and our Criminal Injuries Compensation Act of 2003? Now, by way of explanation, Mr Acting President, this will take a few moments. <coughs> Members may be aware that in Western Australia we quite rightly take a compassionate approach to victims of crime and that that compassion is manifested in several ways. One of those ways is through our Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme and what it allows is a victim of crime to apply to the Chief Assessor of Criminal Injuries Compensation to seek an award for their, um, for their loss. Now, members will appreciate, and in this particular context, we're talking about uh, victims of child sexual abuse. The sad reality is that there is no amount of money that could possibly compensate and provide 
any sense of adequate redress to a victim of child sexual abuse. For those particular survivors of those heinous crimes, they live with that for many years and in my experience, having worked with an inordinate number of such victims, they live with that for decades. And so there is no amount of money that we, as a community, can properly give them to address these concerns. Nevertheless, we do the best that we can and we provide support in a variety of means. And one of the ways is that we provide an amount of compensation. Now, the relevance of this, members, is that if a person, date of offence, if the date of offence, the specific date of offence for a victim of crime is on or after the 1st of January 2004, then the maximum amount of compensation that a person can be awarded is $75,000. Now, I don't want to get bogged down, Leader of the House, into a debate as to the various mechanisms in the criminal injuries compensation scheme as to how a person can get more than $75,000. Yes, that is possible. Uh, yes, there is a mechanism where there can be two times the maximum amount. That's not the purpose of today's debate. The purpose of today's debate is about the specificity of the date of the offence. The Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme requires there to be a specific date of the offence. What we're doing with regard to this bill, which has my support, is we're saying that the date does not need to be specific. <coughs> Now, obviously, if the, uh, if the event, the date of the offence is after the 1st of January 2004, a person is going to be able to apply for compensation up to $75,000, subject to the various provisions under the Act which allow for some additional amounts. But where things get particularly interesting, members, is if the date of the offence is before the 1st of January 2004. And there is a, sh a, a table in the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act which sets out the various provisions. For example, and remember we're talking here about historical cases of child sexual abuse. That's part of the reason why it is so difficult for a victim to be able to identify a specific date because often by the time that they have reported the matter to the police it can sometimes be decades after the original offence and it is very difficult to then specify a particular day. And there are sadly circumstances where um, the date is very vivid in the mind of uh, victims of crime but it is often the case particularly where there has been a course of conduct that has taken place over a long period of time that finding specific dates is incredibly difficult. Now members it is the case under our scheme in Western Australia and much to our shame I think that if an offence takes place or took place between the 22nd of January 1971 and the 17th of October 1976, so over that five and a half, approximate five and a half period of time, the maximum amount of compensation under our scheme is $2,000. Now, on, a, on another day when we have more time and we can have a debate about these things, I think that's a matter that needs to be addressed. But nevertheless, if you are a victim of, of crime during that five and a half year period of time, you're entitled to $2,000 of compensation. Now what happens if you're not sure if the offence was on the 17th of October, which is the final date in that period, or it was the next day, the 18th of October? The significance is that the amount of compensation that you're entitled to jumps from $2,000 to $7,500.
What happens, Mr Acting President, if the victim is unsure whether the offence took place on the 31st of December 1982, where the maximum would be $7,500, or the next day, the 1st of January 1983, which was $15,000? What happens if the amount of uh, if the date of the offence is not clear to the victim of crime? They're not sure if it was on the 31st of December 1985, which would limit them to $15,000 of compensation, or whether it was the next day, at which point it would jump to $20,000. Now, each of those increments, I must say, members, are particularly in the consequence of a victim of child sexual abuse a pittance, because we're, at, we're talking here about a figures of maybe an extra $5,500 or an extra $7,500, or in the last example, an extra $5,000. And really, in the scheme of things, it is, it is uh, as I say, a mere pittance for their uh, pain and suffering and loss of enjoyment of life. But where things get particularly difficult, members, is if the lack of clarity is on or around the 30th of June 1991. If the offence took place on the 30th of June 1991, the maximum amount of compensation is $20,000. If it was the next day, it's $50,000. Suddenly, we're starting to talk about a sizeable difference which has a material impact for the victim of crime. There is a very big difference between $20,000 and $50,000. And indeed then, of course, the same principle applies when we get to the 31st of December 2003, where the maximum is $50,000, and the very next day, the 1st of January 2004, we kick into the new system, the current system, which is $75,000. Now, I do make this other passing remark, Mr Acting President, and that is that the, that the amount of compensation that is currently available has not been reviewed now for more than 16 years. And I would call on whomever wins the election on the 13th of March next year to make this a priority to review this for the last 16 years, there hasn't been any movement, any movement, not one cent, with respect to compensation for victims of crime in Western Australia. For 16 years. Now, this is too important an issue for people then to be pointing fingers at each other and saying, well, hell, you didn't do it in the last four years, McGowan government, and then they say, well, you didn't do it in the eight years in the Barnett government, and then we say, well, you didn't do it in the Carpenter government. This is too important an issue for that. No, the point is, whomever has been on the Treasury benches over the last 16 years has not reviewed the amount of money that is available to victims of crime. It has stalled on $75,000 for the last 16 years. Now, $75,000 on the 1st of January 2004 was a darn sight larger amount of money than what it is in 2020, notwithstanding the global pandemic and everything else that's transpired in the intervening period of time. It is well overdue. Members will be aware, particularly in this 40th Parliament, that we have routinely and regularly, and I've been quite proud of the performance of the Legislative Council in this 40th Parliament in this respect, we have routinely and regularly put in statutory review clauses into bills. And often those review clauses have been for a period of five years, but there have been variations to that effect. There's been some times where it's been three years, four years, and, and so on and so forth. In fact, I seem to recall one recently I think it might have even been the Guardianship and Administration uh, Amendment Bill to which the Honourable Sally Talbot just ta tabled a report, I think, yesterday on, uh, where the review period was one year. So we have routinely done that, and for good reason. This ensures that whoever is in government is obliged under law 
to review that particular statute and report then to the House on whether there are any need for changes. Sadly, this has not been the case in the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act of 2003. That hasn't been done. And so then you get yourself in this situation here where 16 years later, 16 years later, we still haven't done anything. Now, as I say, members, this is not a new issue for me because this is something that I even raised in my, in my maiden speech in 2009. The last 11 years have passed quickly. So, Mr Acting President, I simply make the point that just one day, one calendar day, can make all the difference for a victim of crime under the Western Australia's Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme. And whilst this particular bill has my support for the reasons that I've mentioned, because it is likely to increase the probability in certain cases of securing a conviction, we nevertheless must not just leave it there, members. Because imagine for a moment if you're a victim of child sexual abuse, <clears throat> some substantial period of time later, you decide that you're going to go to the police to report the matter. An incredibly difficult decision made by that victim of crime. They then have to endure the taking of a detailed statement And as a person, Mr Acting President, who has had over the course of my previous professional career the obligation to take some of these statements, I can attest to the fact that the taking of the statement is traumatic, let alone if you're the person having to give the details and recount the details of what's taken place sometimes decades ago. So I say, members, imagine you're that person. You're that person, you're the victim of child sexual abuse. M many years later, you've decided that you're now ready to go to the police. You go through this very difficult and in its own way, traumatic exercise. You now have the benefit under this legislation that we're looking to pass today to have at least the comfort of knowing that if you don't get precisely right the dates, that is not going to be detrimental to you being able to secure some sense of justice and a conviction. And that will be a great feeling for that person if they are able to secure a guilty verdict. But what happens then, Mr Acting President, if your next interaction with the so-called justice system is to be told, sorry, we can't really be sure about the date, and so we're going to award you $20,000 of compensation and not $50,000 of compensation. Imagine you're that victim of child sexual abuse and you're in that situation. This will be the system that we are responsible for collectively compounding, compounding the trauma on this victim of child sexual abuse. We have an opportunity, Mr Acting President, to get this right. We have an opportunity to get this right. And so I'm simply asking the question, Mr Acting President, is to what extent, to what extent have the members of government given consideration to the intersection between these laws? And in particular, what I would like to know is has there been consultation, has there been consultation 
with the Chief Assessor of Criminal Injuries Compensation specifically in relation to this issue. Now it's the last day, in theory, for us in the 40th Parliament and the Legislative Council. This issue is too important. I don't want obstructive answers in respect to this issue. I want a proper and comprehensive response. I don't want us to get into the table and be told we don't have that information available to us. It's not going to be satisfactory. This bill could have been brought on last year. It's being brought on on the last day. There's no other opportunity for me to raise this. I can't raise this tomorrow, next week. I can't raise it until after the election. That's not good enough. We're going to pass the bill now. We need to have an answer to this. Has the Chief Assessor of Criminal Injuries Compensation been specifically consulted about the intersection between this bill and the legislation that the Chief Assessor is responsible for administering? Yes or no? None of the equivocation that we've seen over the last three and a half years, none of the fake answers, yes or no? Has there been any consultation with the Chief Assessor? Now, if the answer is yes, when has the consultation taken place? If the consultation is taking place right now as I'm speaking, fine. When has it taken place? That's the next question that needs to be answered. And thirdly, most importantly, what has been the specific feedback from the Chief Assessor for Criminal Injuries Compensation in respect to this issue? Now, it may be the case that the Chief Assessor of Criminal Injuries Compensation says, starts talking about how they currently, how they currently manage this situation. Because, members, it will be the case already that the Chief Assessor for Criminal Injuries Compensation has to consider this issue. Why is that? Because there are, for simplicity, Mr Acting President, there are two avenues in which a victim of crime can access compensation. One is if there has been a proved offence. In other words, there has been a guilty verdict and the other is if no person has been charged. So members can imagine a situation where a victim of crime for a historical child sexual abuse case reports the matter to the police, the police start to investigate, and the alleged offender is deceased. Well, the police can't bring charges against the deceased person. And so therein, therein ends that aspect of the criminal justice system, but it doesn't necessarily preclude the victim of crime from being able to seek compensation. They can still make an application. And at that point in time, the Chief Assessor has to determine on the balance of probabilities, on the lesser standard of the balance of probabilities, whether the offence has taken place or not. Now that again is a, 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 an issue that needs reform and is a conversation for another day. Because as I have said previously, it is most unsatisfactory and incredibly traumatic for a victim of crime whose alleged offender is actually alive. They go through the court process, they get a not guilty verdict and then they try and get criminal injuries compensation and they can't, and they can't. They're shut out from the system because of the not guilty verdict. And why did they get a not guilty verdict? Because quite rightly, under our criminal justice system, we require the prosecution to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt at that highest standard. So they weren't able to achieve that standard, and now they're shut out from compensation. And yet we have this situation where a victim of crime from a deceased accused only needs to prove their case on the balance of probabilities. That's an area of reform. And I say only needs to in the context of being a supporter of that lower standard applying for compensation. 
I just think that it's wrong that a person who has obtained a not guilty verdict can't then go to the criminal injuries compensation assessor and say, look, I wasn't able to meet that high bar, but I can demonstrate to you, a bit like OJ, the OJ Simpson case, that on the balance of probabilities it did occur. And so I'm entitled to compensation. And I was sexually assaulted. People should be able to obtain that in Western Australia. They can't. And so the point is, members, is that the Chief Assessor of Criminal Injuries Compensation already needs to deal with this complexity of uncertain dates when an application is made when a person hasn't been charged. And so it may well be the case that the government have at their disposal at some point today information about how the Chief Assessor already deals with those type of matters. And I hope that we will be able to be provided that information. But that information alone won't answer this question. Just because the assessor is handling those particular cases in that way, the question is, how is it going to impact upon those cases that are brought on a proved case? On a proved case. Where the case has been proved in the criminal court, a guilty verdict has been obtained, thanks to the benefit of this legislation, the uncertain dates, but the criminal injuries compensation scheme doesn't allow for uncertain dates for a proved offence. Not talking about where no person's been charged. We already know full well that the criminal injuries compensation assessor has a scheme to deal with that. It's that technical intersection that arises only because of this legislation. It doesn't exist at the moment. This is a new thing that's happening. And I'd like to think that at the very least, given that the McGowan government have purposely, deliberately, intentionally buried this bill over the last 12 months, that the only reason that's happened is because they've been busy consulting with the Chief Assessor of Criminal Injuries Compensation and getting to the bottom of this matter to make sure that there is no gap, that there is no problem, there will be no trauma further compounded for victims of crime. I'd like to think charitably that that's the reason why there's been this extraordinary delay. We absolutely have to get to the bottom of this today. There is no other time to do it. Now, if it is the case, members, if it is the case that we find out in a short while <coughs> that this remains in a grey and murky space and that there isn't clarity about it, that should not hold up the progress of this bill. We, we must pass it. I'm not suggesting that there should be any delay about that whatsoever. As I've said earlier, I'm disappointed this hasn't been dealt with over a year ago. But as an absolute minimum, as an absolute minimum, if this matter has not been properly addressed and if it is the case that there is going to be some kind of gap and if it is the case that the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act of 2003 requires some minor amendments to bring it into line with what we are doing here, then I would hope that whoever wins government on the 13th of March will expedite this type of reform. And I mean expedite, Mr Acting President, in the true sense of the word, not in the sense that has been used by the McGowan government over the last three and a half years, where expedition has, mean, has meant to move at the, at the speed of a tortoise or a snail. I'm not talking about the McGowan version of expedition. I'm talking about real expedition. That means drop everything after the 13th of March and get this sorted. And Minister for Regional Development, I suggest you say nothing on this topic. Us sitting longer and getting more bills through. Because, because me, because yeah. Minister. Well, that's good. Order, 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 order members. Uh, I think we're going to look around. We might return back to the substance of the bill. Uh, and if you direct your uh, 
comments to me, I will ensure that we don't have the background noise that we currently have. The Honourable Nick Garamas Thank you. Well. Thank you, Mr Acting President. Uh, the reason is because when the Minister was away on urgent parliamentary business, I was busy saying that this matter is far too important, far too important for us to be busy pointing fingers at one another. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed for the benefit of the victims of child sexual abuse in particular. Now, as it so happens, Mr Acting President, this type of reform that we're dealing with at the moment and the reform that I'm talking about is actually going to be of benefit to all victims of crime. But I don't know whether other members agree with me, but in my view, some crimes are more heinous than others. And uh, it's very difficult uh, for me to get past uh, the view, and I don't think that I'll ever be persuaded uh, that there is a uh, anything more heinous uh, than a sexual assault on any person, on any person, irrespective of age. But it does seem to go again to a whole other level if there is anything that can be worse than the worst when we're talking about children. And so this matter needs to be addressed, as I say, by whomever wins government on the 13th of March. Now, it may be the case that there is a simple explanation to all of this. A simple explanation to all of this. Frankly, I doubt it. I frankly, I doubt it. If we can address all of this today, well and good. I would like to facilitate that. But if it can't, the purpose of me speaking for the last 40 minutes about this particular matter is to emphasise and to underscore, especially to those members who will be here in the 41st Parliament, this needs to be addressed. This cannot go on any longer. We have the opportunity to make sure that there is real reform for victims of crime, victims of child sexual abuse. It's within our power to do it. It's not complicated. Members who are here for the first time will see how amazingly quick some pieces of legislation can go through. It's staggering at times what can be done in this place when there's a will, how, how bills can actually be brought on and passed through both Houses of Parliament in a day, in a 24-hour peri period of time. How can that happen? It can happen if it is considered by everybody in a unanimous fashion to be a matter of great importance of great importance, and I would like to think that we can all agree that trying to address any of this type of systemic trauma on victims of crime is something that we can all unanimously agree on. Now, sure, Mr Acting President, we can have a robust debate amongst ourselves as to what should be the reasonable level of compensation available to a victim of crime. At the moment, the maximum is $75,000. And we could uh, select any figure. We could say 80000 we could say 85000 we could say 100000 And, and, sure, and uh, well-meaning, uh, reasonable-minded members could have a strong view about what it should be. No problem with that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about making sure that there is not a technical gap that can unintentionally create trauma for a victim of crime. That's what we're talking about. Now, Mr Acting President, as I um, uh, conclude my remarks, I note that um, since the 1st of July 2016, in Western Australia, we have had the catastrophic injury scheme. That's the no-fault scheme that was introduced for motor vehicle accidents, and that was funded through an increase in our third-party premiums. So if you've been catastrophically injured as a result of a motor vehicle, you have 
a very significant amount of compensation available to you, rightly so, to be able to deal with your needs for the rest of your life. It's a no-fault scheme. It's funded by our, our premiums on third-party premiums. And yet a, crime, a victim of crime who has been catastrophically injured, catastrophically injured, can only receive a maximum of $75,000. There's no equity in that. So if you have catastrophic injuries as a result of being a victim of crime, $75,000 maximum, if, you, if it's as a result of a motor vehicle accident, well, in a sense, and there's a bit of exaggeration on my part here, but in a sense, the sky's the limit in terms of how much compensation you can get. Now, in no way am I diminishing the trauma the trauma for a catastrophically injured person as a result of a motor vehicle accident. They have my support for their access to that scheme, that no-fault scheme. I simply make the point that for victims of crime, they should not be treated like second-class citizens in this way. So I think it's time for us all to act, Mr Acting President. I think it's long overdue for us to be properly reviewing these matters. I think that there is capacity for all of the members in the 41st Parliament to work together to ensure that there will be real and measurable justice for victims of crime. I hope that members are persuaded that there is a need for this, and I hope that members are persuaded that it is long overdue. And so with those remarks, Mr Acting President, I once again re-emphasise my support for the bill before the House, as it's going to provide a greater opportunity for victims of child sexual abuse in particular to be able to secure a conviction. And anything that we can do to lessen the systemic trauma for those people continues to have my overwhelming support. Members, we are dealing with the Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates Bill 2019. The question is the bill be read a second time. I call the Minister in reply. Thanks very much. Can I thank members for their support uh, for uh, the bill before us now? Um, the Honourable Michael Mission uh, asked a question uh, about the um, similar provisions in New South Wales, uh, so that he referred to the similar section 80, capital A, capital F of the Crimes Act of New South Wales, and whether there had been any issues arising out of their recent uh, reforms in a similar regard. Um, so the proposed changes to the Criminal Code here have regard to, but don't actually mirror, uh, the recent New South Wales amendments regarding uncertainty when a sexual offence against a child occurred. <coughs> Uh, the New South Wales Act came into effect on the 1st of December 2018, and the, uh, the legislation introduced a new section 80AF into their Crimes Act uh, to provide for an accused to be prosecuted in respect of the conduct under which uh, ever sexual offence had the lesser maximum penalty, regardless of when during that period the conduct actually occurred. The New South Wales Government has previously indicated there's been one case that has, been, uh, that has relied on uh, that section since its passage and no particular problems arose in that matter. The department has recently sought advice from the New South Wales uh, Department of Communities and Justice, which has confirmed uh, that there not be any issues identified with the operation of section 80AF. The honourable member also asked whether um, we would have um, be able to provide information on the number of cases uh, that um, uh, had been put on hold in the hope that an amendment to the law would be uh, able to rescue those prosecutions. Now, I can't, I can't give you advice. It's not possible to provide specific information of the kind sought, um, though this issue can arise at any stage of an investigation, uh, prosecution and even in the trial. It may relate to some or all of the incidents alleged to have occurred 
Sometimes alternative charges can be pursued, even if they have a lesser maximum penalty. Decisions arising from the issue may be made by WA Police, the DPP or a judge uh, and or a jury. Um, so there's no way of accurately collecting that kind um, of data. The office of the DPP, though, advises it has on occasion considered cases and determined that no prosecution can currently be commenced or properly commenced due to that issue. Um, as this bill operates retrospectively, it will enable charges, charges to um, be laid and convictions to occur where that's not been previously possible. And as in many other situations, if a case which once could not have been prosecuted now can be, uh, the Office of DPP is open to commencing a prosecution if there are reasonable prospects of conviction. Uh, and following the passage of this um, bill, the uh, Office of Director of Public Prosecutions will liaise with uh, WA Police in the normal um, way. Um, the Honourable Alison Zwan, thank you for um, your uh, support out of the House on Urgent Parliamentary Business. Um, thank you for uh, your support for the bill. The Honourable Member uh, set out um, the four scenarios uh, in which the bill will um, address the uncertainty um, of uh, dates. Uh, the Honourable Nick Goran, thank you for your support um, for the legislation. And the um, essential um, uh, question, I guess, asked in the second part of the Honourable Member's uh, contribution was around the intersect. Uh, between this bill and the Criminal Injuries Compensation Bill, and in particular noting the um, periods of time which attract different um, levels uh, of compensation uh, payment, to what extent might uh, victims uh, whose uh, cases are um, able to be resolved and get a prosecution as a result and a conviction as a result of this, to what extent may they be disadvantaged? Um, to paraphrase him, um, you know, is there a gap? And uh, essentially, in the last part of his contribution, the honourable member was asking um, whether or not, obviously, the chief assessor had been involved um, in consideration of how the two uh, pieces of legislation uh, might be, uh, might be, uh, how they how they come together. And so, indeed, the chief assessor of the criminal injuries compensation has uh, been consulted and has provided um, ad advice. Um, so there will be no change. Um, to a victim's right to apply for criminal injuries compensation or the way the assessor determines an application in accordance with the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act. So criminal injuries compensation can be awarded under the Act in the following <coughs> circumstances, where the perpetrator has not been identified, according to section 17 of the Act, where a person has been charged with an alleged offence, but the charge has not been determined, according to sections 16.1a through to g, where there has been an acquittal, the assessor will determine the application in accordance with section 13 um, of the Act. So the bill is not intended to affect the manner in which any uncertainty in relation to the date of an offence is dealt with under the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act. Um, the table that's set out in section 31 of the Act sets out the maximum amounts for various offences committed on a date in a period set out in that table. In order to apply the particular maximum amount, the assessor needs to be satisfied on the balance of probabilities that an offence occurred in a particular date period. If, for example, um, uh, the claim is for an offence committed on a date unknown between, say, the 31st of December 81 and uh, the 31st of December 1983, the assessor may apply the higher maximum amount if satisfied on the balance of probabilities that the incident occurred in the period that attracts the higher maximum amount. So the bill doesn't seek to make uncertain dates certain, but rather removes that technical barrier to allow a conviction for the offence with the lowest penalty, uh, notwithstanding the uncertainty. The government recognises that there are challenges uh, with the operation of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act and has asked the Commissioner for Victims um, uh, of Crime to provide uh, advice um, specifically on how these challenges can be um, addressed uh, in the best interest um, of victims. Um, and so um, on the other matter around uh, the um, honourable members, uh, I guess, um, side comments about the Criminal Injuries Compensation Act, I am advised. I'm, 
sure the honourable member is probably aware of this already, but there was uh, the government has tabled a review of the Criminal Injuries uh, Compensation Act uh, some time ago. We can probably answer that question in um, in committee if necessary. Um, but with those comments, uh, I commend the bill to the House. Members, the question is: the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Believe the ayes have it. Criminal law amendment, uncertain dates bill 2019, second reading. Right, are we moving to committee stages? Yep. All right. Move to committee. Right, members, we are dealing with the Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates Bill 2019, um, unaware of any uh, supplementary notice paper, uh, so we shall simply proceed. The question before the House is that Clause 1 stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Garant. Thanks, Mr Deputy President. Uh, Mr Deputy Chairman, uh, Minister, just taking up this issue a little further, um, you mentioned in your reply that the Assessor will determine the date dependent on the uh, standard of balance of probabilities. Now, I agree that that will be what the assessor does moving forward, and in fact that's what the assessor has done. In any application that's been made to the assessor, other than when there's been approved offence. So in all of those type of circumstances that you raised, and no person's been charged. Maybe somebody was charged, but they never end up stood at standing trial because they've been found mentally unfit, or so on and so forth. So there's been no conclusion to the uh, criminal procedure process, and therefore an application is made under those other uh, gateways, and the assessor has to work out a date and says, well, I'll work that out based on the evidence provided to me and the standard that I'll apply is on the balance of probabilities. So that's, that's conceded and not up for debate. <clears throat> the question that arises is how will the assessor deal with it where there's been a proved offence? Now, this is the most common, as I understand it, the most common type of application that's been made. A guilty verdict has been obtained. Um, I just want to make sure that I haven't misunderstood the advice that's been provided to the House in the reply. Is it intended that, irrespective of uh, what has transpired under the criminal procedure, when an application is made, even for approved offence, there will be capacity for a victim of crime to persuade the assessor about the date on the balance of probabilities? Minister. Thanks, Chair. So, yes, Honourable Member, you're right. So, the current arrangements, you're quite correct, apply to where the, um, uh, the case has not been proved. The assessor will apply the same uh, mechanism that is determined on the balance of probabilities um, in a proven case as well. The Honourable Nick Garan. Okay, well, um, that's uh, good news for victims of crime. So, um, thank you for that uh, information, uh, Minister. Now, you. Um, referred to the fact that the government is aware of these various uh, challenges in a general uh, sense and that the victims of crime it, uh, sorry the commissioner for the victims of crime is looking into it I think you indicated 
So is that some form of uh, inquiry that's taking place? If it is, are there terms of reference? Is there a scheduled date for, for this to be concluded? Is it going to be in a report that might be tabled in Parliament? Just some further information about that. Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. So, yes, so once the uh, review of the Criminal Compensation, um, Criminal Injuries Compensation uh, Act uh, was uh, published, um, the government has sought advice from the Commissioner uh, for um, victims, um, victims of Crime. Um, advice on, that, on the matters contained in that, but also specifically on the matters that you raised around uh, the issues for victims um, of sexual offences. Um, now, I don't have a specific timeline on when that um, advice is going to be received. Um, I'm told it's anticipated in the next couple of months, but I can't, I can't give you anything more specific than that. Question is clause one, standards printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Chair. <clears throat> uh, picking up on a couple of comments you made, Minister, in the course of um, your second reading reply, uh, you mentioned uh, the, that uh, advice had been sought <coughs> regarding New South Wales' experience with like provisions. Um, uh, my understanding is they go nowhere near as far or as comprehensively as what Western Australia is proposing. But uh, when was that advice sought? Minister. Thanks, Chair. So advice was sought during drafting, but further advice was sought literally this morning to check there'd been no development since that initial uh, advice, and the advice remains the same. The Honourable Michael Mission. Thank you. Um, I, uh, so there has been a response to that, uh, that request for further information, that there have been no difficulties experienced, no challenges, no cases that would affect the the merits of these or require something to be addressed. Thank you. Are there any other jurisdictions uh, in Australia that have adopted a similar well, or uh, uh, similar amendments to uh, their uh, to their criminal law? The Minister. Thanks, Chair. Not that we're aware of. The Honourable Michael Mission. Thank you. All right, moving on, uh, you, the Honourable Alison Zamon mentioned uh, that uh, this does operate retrospectively. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the right way of categorising it, but I understand what she was driving at. But uh, if I understand what you've told us, the Director of Public Prosecutions will revisit cases and review circumstances where either no charge has been laid by reason of uncertainty as to date or age or uh, change of law, or cases where no indictment has been presented by reason of those uncertainties that are being addressed in this bill. Um, I take it that uh, considerations such as the age of the accusation, whether there's been an adequate penalty that uh, reflects seriousness of other conduct and so forth, if there were though, the charges will be addressed. Would that be right? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Yes. Okay. Honourable Michael Mission. So there's no guarantee that simply because a, a charge or a case did not proceed because of one of these difficulties, there will be a charge or an indictment laid. Okay. How far back will the director be looking at these things? No, it's a question of uh, horses for courses, but uh, surely some kind of a line is going to be drawn. Um, is it going to be um, 
nothing before the 2014 case of SI and WA, or is it something more recent? A more uh, recent uh, threshold date that we are looking at. Now, I'm not asking the director to, to hold hard and fast to that date as a commitment, but simply to get an idea of how far back we're going to be going. The Minister. So, um, what I said in my second reading reply is that the OD Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions will liaise with WA Police. Now, they're not going to actively go back to a certain point. They're not going to actively go back to look at all cases, but there may be some that WA Police brings to the attention as, you know, this is a glaringly obvious um, a, a case. So, um, the advice I have is that um, some matters may be revisited. Where, other, where an otherwise strong case could not be proceeded with because of the uncertainties um, that the bill now addresses. And the uh, Office of Director of Public Prosecutions anticipates that it may be asked. So in addition to um, uh, some matters that the Office of Director of Public Prosecutions might revisit themselves, they anticipate that they may be asked by the WA police force and or victims to reconsider cases which have not previously uh, been able to be proceeded with or which were uh, discontinued. Um, and of course, the prosecutors will still have a duty to evaluate the reasonable uh, prospects of conviction before uh, proceeding any further. But there's not a, um, it's not going to be driven by a timeline. It's going to be driven by the particular uh, characteristics of those cases and then being brought to the attention uh, of the Office of uh, Director of Public Prosecutions. Honourable Michael Mission. Okay, um, I'm just concerned as to uh, whether there will be some that uh, might be overlooked for a variety of reasons. One of them being that if it is being driven by the Western Australia Police, and this is no reflection uh, on their uh, their diligence and the like, but as time goes by and the older a case gets, and if a file is closed, uh, there may not be an appetite or indeed uh, an awareness of that matter that will have a police officer, uh, go, an investigator going back in order to check whether or not there was now a viable case. Um, I, mean, I, I take it that that's accepted, that that may be the case. The Minister. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. Yes, Honourable Member, um, you're right in that there's not a um, there's not an automatic, we're going to go back and screen every single file. That's, that's not going to happen. But there may well be cases that officers at DPP are aware of now, and there are highly likely to be cases that WA Police are aware of, and indeed um, victims uh, of crime who are uh, generally engaged in following these, many of them, engaged in following these kind of debates may also bring those to the attention, but you're right. If you're asking, is there going to be a kind of, all right, we're going back and we're going to look at every single file? No, that's not going to happen. And as a consequence of that, it may be the case um, that something is lost in corporate history. The Honourable Michael Mitchell. Thank you, and, uh, and that would be a similar situation with the DPP. I expect that the director or team leaders or uh, file managers may very well be aware of files that they have had, which. Uh, they thought were viable but frustrated by these particular problems and then may, if they have the time, go back to them and dust them off and uh, have another look and propose um, uh, that they be proceeded with, uh, subject to <coughs> complainants, uh, evidence still being viable, if you like, and other considerations. Uh, but again, there is, there's no, um, that would depend, if I understand it, on either the director, uh, a senior officer or a particular file manager, and the file managers may have changed over time, or not even be there, the original file managers not even be there anymore, um, being aware of those cases and revisiting them. 
Minister. Thanks. Yes, your characterisation is correct. Okay. Honourable Michael Mission. Are any difficulties foreseen regarding double jeopardy, either on the basis that someone has been uh, already charged with an alternative offence because as a second best because the, uh, the best one was frustrated by this, uh, by these problems, or likewise a case where someone has been acquitted on an alternative charge um, and uh, is the director aware of roughly uh, just a ballpark figure of uh, if there are many or few cases of that character that uh, will be affected by these considerations? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, so the answer to your question is no. Um, a, a, a new prosecution would not be taken against someone mm -hmm. who had been prosecuted uh, under a lesser charge, and maybe that you know that prosecution had to go to the lesser charge because of the problem that's been fixed now. Um, so that it's not going to trigger the double jeopardy uh, principle, if you like. Um, the Michael Mission. And um, just finally, perhaps uh, you may be able to assist. Again, I'm not looking for a firm figure. I just want to get an idea, a flavour of the uh, significance of this reform. Uh, perhaps the director is aware either of personal knowledge or anecdotally through her staff uh, of uh, roughly how many offenders have not been prosecuted, say, in the last 12 months uh, because of this difficulty or how many charges that might otherwise have been laid that have not been laid or indictments not presented? Now, I know that's a difficult question, but you must get some, some idea of the, the extent of the problem, because I presume, well, I know the director is anxious to get this reform through, uh, so I want to get an idea of just what difference it will make, how many, and, and particularly how many prosecutions may have been compromised entirely because there was no other way of approaching it but getting this through, and so no alternative charges may have been available or, or the like. Minister? Half a dozen a year, a dozen a year, what it would Yeah, thank you. I do understand the question that you're asking, and I did ask uh, it myself because you raised it in your second reading reply. Um, so I'm, but I'm sorry, I'm not able um, to do that. Um, there would be um, matters that didn't proceed, for example, because the police took a certain view that it wasn't worth even you know, bringing to the attention of the, uh, of the DPP's office. So I, I'm not in a position, I, I understand why, you would, why it would be of interest, but I'm not in a position uh, to provide you with that information. The question is that clause one stand as printed. Just to know more. Uh, the Honourable Michael Mission. Lastly, and just on a more general issue. Um, which does relate to sexual offences. Uh, as I recall, it was a, a government election commitment that there be a committee of the parliament established to review the director's decisions in respect of discontinuing cases of uh, sexual assault and the like. Um, that has not come to fruition, but uh, the Attorney General, when in opposition, was pretty firm on the necessity for that. Uh, are you able to assist us as to why that has not been done? And uh, is it because uh, there would be a, I mean, it was holding a practical idea to my mind and an undesirable one, but the government was pretty firm on it when it was on, in opposition. Can you help us out there? Minister. Thank you, Chair. So, in 2018, the policy and guidelines for victims of crime, uh, including formal, a formal um, victim review process, were put in place, um, basically removing the need to proceed uh, down that fashion. 
The Honourable Michael Mission. Well, more of a comment, but it falls far short of what was the commitment for public scrutiny and parliamentary <coughs> scrutiny of those sorts of decisions, which is what the Shadow Attorney General at the time thought was essential. But uh, I always thought it was undesirable and, and not practical. So I'm pleased that it hasn't proceeded. But uh, uh, of course, there's always improvements in uh, internal processes, and so I commend the director on on uh, improving those. Uh, I have no further questions in respect to clause one. Question is clause one stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed no. Believe the ayes have it. Uh, do an indication of further clauses members wish to discuss. Other do you have a clause, member? Yes, uh, clause four. Uh, the question before the House shall be that clauses two and three stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Leave the ayes have it. The question is that clause four stand as printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. Uh, the, the focus. In respect of um, clause four and the amendments to chapter two, capital B, or the insertion of chapter two, capital B into the criminal code is on sexual offences. Is there any reason why it's limited to sexual offences and not to uh, other serious offending? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. So um, if I take you to 10L, which is uh, over the page, that applies to indictable offences, including sexual and all other indictable offences. Sections 10M and 10N apply to uh, uncertain age of the victim being uh, uncertain and is limited to sexual offences as these are where the age-related issues present in terms of the appropriate charge. <laughs> The question is that clause four stand as printed. 
Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, indication of further clauses, members? Seven. Seven. The question shall be that clauses five and six stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. The question before the House is therefore that clause seven stand as printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you. Um, this was a late addition to the bill along with the amendments to the Evidence Act that appear in clause nine, amendment to the Evidence Act in clause nine, as I recall. Uh, when was it realised that further amendments were necessary in order to achieve the ends being sought by those provisions? Stay standing if it's by interjection. Sorry. Thank you. You may be right. I mean, it's not you know, it's not unknown. Um, well, order members. Yes, right, part four. Too much yes, in the yes, house. Yes, uh, no, no. Look, uh, <laughs> congratulations, leader. <laughs> Credit where it's due. Yeah, you're right. Part four and part five with a late addition, so I'll move on. Uh, so the question before the House is that clause seven stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, would you like to examine clause eight, member? Yeah. Or nine? I, I repeat the question, but in respect of uh, parts four and five of the bill. Well, I'll put the question that clause eight stand as printed. Um, we just, I think we're checking for an answer. Question, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. um, we just that those needed to be addressed. Sorry. Yeah, we'll close that. Sort of. Minister. Thank you. So, were inserted uh, when the bill was in the Assembly, um, and that they were, they are of themselves consequential amendments, but they've been overlooked uh, in the drafting, so that was picked up in the Assembly. The question is clause 8 standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. The uh, question is clause 9 standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. The question is that clause 10 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. The question is that clause 11 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. The question is that this be the title of the bill. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. That concludes the committee stages. Minister, the question is we put the bill to the House. Those of the opinion say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. I believe the ayes have it. Mr Deputy President, uh, I have to report that the criminal law amendment uncertain perhaps dates Bill 2019 has been debated and agreed to without amendment. Okay. Leader of the House. Um, Mr Deputy President, I move the report be adopted. The question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. I move that the bill be now read a third time. Members, I've received from the Deputy Chairman of Committees a certificate in writing that this is a true copy of the bill as agreed to in the Committee of the Whole House and reported. So the question now is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Criminal Law Amendment Uncertain Dates Bill 2019, third reading. Uh, members, we now, there's that uh, bill there, John. 
Uh, members, we now come to order of the day number 43, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020. Uh, resumption of the second reading. So on the question that the bill be read a second time, the Honourable uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr um, Deputy President. Uh, I stand to, on behalf of the Opposition to offer our support for this bill. Uh, I don't intend to take too much time with regard to the bill. Suffice to say, um, we think it's an, an imperative component of the National Disability uh, Scheme in an overall sense. Now, um, as most people would know, the NDIS or the genesis of the NDIS um, stemmed from um, an initiative from former Prime Minister Julia Gillard back in 2012. And as a result of that, it was met with universal applause and universal support. But of course, the transition for the theory of a, uh, of a national disability insurance scheme um, is fine in theory, but in practice, of course, it was always going to have uh, some problems with regard to the implementation. Fundamentally, it's been relatively seamless, although, of course, there are uh, some uh, pockets of, uh, of concern within some um, people with a disability that feel that they are perhaps, some feel that they are worse off, some have had difficult ac difficulty accessing funding, etc. But across the board, the whole point of the dis uh, NDIS is to ensure that people with a disability, those that are some, one of the most marginalised groups in our community, uh, are empowered. That is, that they have control of their own destiny, which in a lot of instances they feel they haven't had before. Now, as I said, from that perspective, the theory of it is magnificent. In Western Australia, of course, um, we, uh, the previous government decided to take a path where uh, the, the actual operation of the NDIS was contained within Western Australia. The, um, as a, there is a bit of a maverick state, which is fairly common for Western Australia. Um, but uh, our mob lost government back in 2017, and the current government decided to go at the, into the national level. Um, no issues with that at all. Now, I acknowledge and respect that decision, and we've worked. The opposition's worked constructively with the with the government and the disability sector to ensure that those people that do have or are eligible for the NDIS are provided with those that service delivery. Now. Um, with regard to the one of the areas, not just the funding, because of course the funding is one component of it. The other area, which sits hand in hand with the funding challenges, of course, is with um, the workers, accessing workers. And of course, you're going to need tens of thousands of workers in the disability sector to, um, to service what is close to half a million or 400,000 or something along those lines, people with a disability. And in Western Australia, we're talking around 39,000, 40,000 people that could access, can have access to the NDIS. And of course, the service providers and individual providers um, have got a huge task uh, in front of them. Now, um, this has been, you know, getting people, uh, uh, accessing uh, uh, quality staff is always problematic in an area like disability services. So we've got to make sure that, an estab that established protocols are available, are, in are there, to ensure that those uh, people or people with a disability are not in any way remotely discriminated against. So with that said, um, I think we've landed in a pretty good place with this um, screening legislation. I thank the Minister for his support um, in terms of providing every avenue for information had two briefings from the minister's office and um, advisers, and I thank them very much. Um, pretty much, I was I've been I've, I've been satisfied with, as I said, with what's been provided. So I haven't got too much to go through. But essentially, um, the intergovernmental inter agreement on nationally consistent workers screening for the NDIS uh, was it was an intergovernmental agreement that was signed by the premier on the 4th of June 2019, and it will. It literally will uh, introduce a high standard of screening per for persons engaged in, in DIS work, and that is so important. You know, people that are so vulnerable, as I said, one of the most marginalised and vulnerable groups in our community are people with a disability. It is ab absolutely imperative that we prevent um, any sort of exploitation 
from those people, particularly from a financial perspective, but also from a physical and a sexual perspective in terms of exploitation. So, um, you know, people with a disability, every body, but, but particularly people with a disability, deserve the right to live a life without abuse, uh, without violence, without neglect, and without exploitation. And that's the aim of this piece of legislation. And this applies equally to the State Administrative Tribunal in review, reviewing decisions which are consistent with the IGA. Now, people who may apply are the subject of requirements under the NDIS Act who work for a registered NDIS provider or are delegated by a CEO with authority under the bill or are doing work for the CEO uh, that the CEO is satisfied makes it necessary or convenient for them to make uh, to hold a clearance. They must be engaged or proposed to be engaged in the NDIS work with a connection to WA. Now, um, for the screening, for a screening to be successful, a successful grant, a, a grant or a cleaning, uh, that, that, uh, for a successful check, a grant uh, a, must be granted a clearance and provide an NDIS worker check clearance certificate. The certificate uh, clearance granted for five years subject to ongoing monitoring and can be cancelled earlier. Um, the, the, um, if you're, there's an unsuccessful check, it is, there is a, to refuse to grant a clearance and to provide an NDI, NDIS worker check exclusion certificate. The exclusion is indefinite until sooner cancelled under the bill. Um, that's information that's been provided as said, on the advisors on the day. Uh, and ultimately, the, um, the commencement of the NDIS worker screening will commence on the 1st of February 2021. That's why it's important that we uh, pass this legislation today. Now, in terms of the um, in terms of the national consistency with regard to, um, to um, the bill, all other states and territories uh, will be joining the NDA worker screening um, legislation. I think that's, a, well, that's imperative for it to work. The role of the, the federal government or the Commonwealth government is fundamentally uh, to coordinate information and um, establish uh, a clearing database, and that's important. With a, with a nation like Australia, a federation like Australia, uh, it is really, really important. You do have that clearing base and also you do have a central repository of, um, of um, information. And as I, I mentioned this yesterday when we talked about the, um, national, uh, the mutual recognition legislation, that is for something like this where you do need that national consistency with workers, or you do need that national consistency with themes, that you do have the opportunity to um, you do have a, a central database, for want of a better term, but fundamentally do have the, um, the, um, the provision for the states to have a degree of autonomy. Um, it's not mirror legislation. The IGA aims for national consistency in worker screening rather than exact uniformity between jurisdictions. And I understand that and I recognise that and I support that. I think that's probably a good thing in the fact that it, de and it does provide for the individual changes between states. So it does provide uh, states and territories with significant discretion in implementing certain elements of the national policy, including, for example, um, consistency in relation to penalties, enforcement, the issue of physical cards and the ability for workers to commence work in advance of their applications being determined. Um, so as far as Western Australia is concerned, um, the bill is drafted so it's consistent with the Working with Children led, uh, Criminal Record Checking Act in 2004 as appropriate, and it implements a worker screening scheme broadly similar but not identical to that of Working with Children legislation. In um, some jurisdictions, have proposed legislation that combines NDIS worker screening with other vulnerable person screening requirements. That is not the case in Western Australia, so the Working with Children legislation and the worker screening legislation are two discrete pieces of legislation and um, that was done intentionally. Um, notwithstanding, there are a few minor differences. Each state and territory's legislation is implemented uh, to implement national consistent worker screening will mean that the results of worker screening will be portable across Australia and across NDIS employ, uh, employers. And as I've said, that's an imperative component about being in a federation, and particularly when you've got worker screening situations. Um, if you do have a, 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 a situation where um, you have a worker that has, um, that has uh, met the criteria for uh, worker screening in Western Australia, you'd like to think there is that national consistency. So if that worker um, 
does transfer or does move to one of the other jurisdictions that those qualifications are portable. And that's exactly the same with most um, qualifications now. Um, with regard to applications for clearance, people who engage or intend to engage in NDIS work and who uh, either do so in WA or reside in WA may apply for an NDIS clearance as required by the NDIS Act and other rules, persons employed by or otherwise engaged by registered NDIS uh, providers, including contractors and some contractors who are at risk assessed roles will require a clearance. Risk assessed roles include key personnel, such as those holding executive and senior uh, management positions and roles for whom the normal duties include the direct delivery of specified uh, supports or services. Two, uh, or are likely to require more than incidental contact with a person with a disability. Self-employed people or volunteers um, used by registered national disability insurance scheme providers and their subcontractors and risk assessed roles will similarly be required to apply. Um, now, just with regard to, there's one area that I did bring up with the, with the um, advisors on a couple of occasions. And look, I think it's stating the bleeding obvious. Here I'm talking about those workers that um, uh, have an incidental contact with an NDIS participant will not be required to have a clearance. So, Minister, fundamentally understand what we're talking about here in terms of uh, in terms of perhaps someone that does some clerical work or someone that comes in as a, de a delivery operator or something along those lines. But it is rather subjective. So, if and uh, you're advisors will be well prepared for this, I'm sure. If you could just give some clarification on what is meant by an incidental worker with regard to the NDIS, uh, with regard to this particular piece of legislation. I would appreciate that. Um, and um, what else have we got? Automatic exclusion, interim bars and suspensions if the applicant or clearance holder has a criminal record showing a conviction for a class one offence committed as an adult. The CEO must issue an automatic exclusion as these persons are disqualified from NDIS work. Disqualified persons are permanently excluded from NDIS work and will not be entitled to reapply. Again, eminently sensible. Um, so that's uh, it basically, I think, from, uh, from the, uh, the actual um, requirements of the bill itself. With regard to other key features, the um, uh, the bill does provide information sharing provisions to ensure that all risk assessments of applicants, uh, uh, sorry, of applicants and clearance holders undertaken in Western Australia and other jurisdictions are informed by all relevant information, and that public sharing between organisations, between administrators and between jurisdictions, again, is eminently sensible. Um, Transitional arrangements will be provided for in the regulations to ensure that the orderly uh, phasing in of national disability insurance scheme workers under the new screening requirements in the bill or in continuing in strengthening, to, uh, strengthening the current safeguards that apply to disability service uh, um, provision. Now, the, the, um, the uniform, uh, uh, the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation Statute Review did a first-class job of assessing the, this piece of legislation, this bill, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Michael Mission and his strong leadership and his committee for forensically going through the, uh, the bill. They did identify basically, well, essentially, they've, they've given, they've given, um, uh, they said there are no problems with the bill apart from three recommendations. Um, the recommendations relate to clause two. It says clause two of the national recommendation one says clause two of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020 be amended to require the proposed National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Act 2020 to be automatically repealed if not operational at the end of expiration of 10 years of receiving royal assent. Seems eminently sensible from the Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, recommendation two: the second reading spectra explanatory memorandum. The second reading spectra explanatory mem memorandum for a bill should identify any Henry VIII clause in that bill, provide a rationale for it, and explain its practical effect. And recommendation three: the Minister for Disability Services takes an amended explanatory memorandum for the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020 
in the Legislative Council that identifies all Henry VIII clauses and the rationale for them. And I do understand through discussions with the minister behind the chair that he intends to support those recommendations and he intends to address the concerns from the committee in his response today, which I'm pleased about. So fundamentally, what we've got here is a piece of legislation that's going to provide a framework for integrity behind workers that are in the disability sector. Um, as I said, they are one of the most vulnerable groups in our community. They deserve that respect. The last thing that we want is a national scheme that is open to abuse, either physically, financially, verbally or sexually, for one of the most vulnerable groups in our community. What this piece of legislation does is it does exactly that. It provides standalone legislation for each jurisdiction, while at the same time providing a national framework to ensure we do have national consistency with regard to particular standards. That means that workers, uh, that there is a portability uh, availability. Uh, that's, uh, sorry, it's, it is uh, portable with regard to the standards for workers, so workers can uh, transfer from one jurisdiction to another. While it does provide clarity for particularly service providers, believe it or not, there are some charlatans out there that do try and exploit people that are vulnerable, in particular people with a disability, and. You know, the heinous values that those sorts of people cannot allow to, be go, un to go unchecked. So if we're going to have a national disability, um, national disability um, uh, uh, program policy, uh, um, which we have with the NDIS, which is, I've got to say, um, as it's despite a, a number of issues that existed in its uh, at the primary implementation, will ultimately benefit um, people with a disability, it is absolutely imperative that we cross all the T's and dot all the I's. And one of the most profound areas that, upon which those, that, that quality, uh, quality uh, assessment must be ensured is uh, the provision of workers. As I said, a lot, of, a lot of people with a disability rely very, very heavily, very heavily on, um, on um, their workers, on the, their carers, sorry. And yes, we'd like to think, we, we would really like to think that all carer, carers are very honest, law-abiding, altruistic people, but unfortunately that's not the case. I mean, you do have people with a disability that are open to exploitation. They are extraordinarily vulnerable. It is absolutely essential that we do have um, um, a, a standalone piece of legislation in Western Australia that is unique to Western Australian circumstances, and that's exactly what we've got here. Uh, I know the Honourable Nick Garan's got a, a couple of questions with regards to the working with children uh, legislation, the associated uh, and the associated um, connection with this particular bill. Because, of course, as I said, we have decided to go along the path of having those two discrete pieces of legislation. Um, so I'll allow him to go down that path. Suffice to say, um, we think that or the Liberal Party, the opposition, does support this piece of legislation. It's going a long way to ensure that we do protect the interests, the rights. Um, the livelihood of one of the most vulnerable groups in our community, and that is people with a disability. And for those reasons, the opposition will be supporting the bill. Question is the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Alison Zamon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. And I rise as the lead speaker on behalf of the Greens on the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020 and indicate that the Greens will be supporting um, this, the, this legislation. It's an important bill. Uh, the aim of the bill is to ensure the safety and wellbeing of people with disability and their right to live free from abuse, violence, neglect and exploitation. And that's clearly something that the Greens fully support. Uh, it's clearly important and this is a, a much needed reform. Uh, abuse of people with disability <coughs> has been um, described as endemic and accounts of rape, and neglect and violence are all too common. The Disability Royal Commission was established in April 2019 in response to community concern about widespread reports of violence against and the neglect, abuse and exploitation of uh, people with disability. And that commission has uncovered shocking examples of abuse with, of people with disability. We also know that the cases that have become public are really only the tip of the iceberg. I do remind members of the mistreatment of Anne-Marie Smith, 
uh, who lived the final 12 months of her life alone on a wicker chair until she died of septic shock and multiple organ failure from severe pressure sores and irreversible mal malnutrition. And remember, she was, on, she was only 54 years old. So the safeguards have been lacking in WA. We've had no process for screening people uh, working in this area. And although police checks might be required by many service providers, uh, we know that they are simply uh, not enough and they aren't thorough enough. So this bill is implementing WA's obligations under the Intergovernmental Agreement on nationally consistent worker screening, and that provides for screening and ongoing monitoring of some disability workers in WA, in, uh, those delivering some NDIS services, and it is due to commence on the 1st of February next year, which is why this has rightly been prioritised um, as uh, a bill needing to be passed this year. So this legislation is required uh, in order to ensure that we are creating nationally consistent NDIS worker screening, uh, the, and the results of that will mean that we have also have portability across Australia. So it aims to prevent people with disability from experiencing harm um, from poor quality or unsafe supports or services delivered under the NDIS. It's that there is an intention that therefore it will deter um, unsuitable people from working in the sector. It will exclude some people from working for registered NDIS providers in certain roles and also reduce the potential uh, for uh, NDIS uh, providers to employ workers who pose an unacceptable risk of harm to uh, people with disability. Uh, the Commonwealth's responsibilities include establishing and administering a national clearance database uh, to record outcomes of those work worker screen screening checks and to enable employers to verify workers and also to check their clearance status. So the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission um, has been established for this, for this purpose. It's, I note that it's not mirror legislation. Uh, it aims for national consistency rather than ensuring exact uniformity. Uh, the state do, still does have discretion in relation to penalties and enforcement and if the issue of physical cards. Uh, the ability for workers uh, to commence work in advance of an application being determined, and I've got some questions about that in a moment. Um, and it's also drafted in WA to aim for consistency for the Working with Children's Clearance um, Act. So workers in WA will pay a single application fee that's going to entitle them to be able to work throughout Australia, uh, as, as screened workers from other jurisdictions will be able to also uh, work here. So I'm interested to know if that if, minister, if the fee uh, will be the same as applying for a working with children check, uh, and it's important that it's um, affordable, given that so many of the workers in this area tend to be tend to be low paid. Um, having a national scheme is a welcome move, and it's going to help prevent gaps. Uh, we know that the scheme will cover persons employed by or otherwise engaged by registered NDIS providers, including contractors and subcontractors, who are in uh, risk-assessed roles. Uh, and that the people who are going to require a clearance are key personnel, such, uh, such as those um, holding executive and senior management uh, positions, uh, roles for whom the normal duties include the direct delivery of specified supports or services to or are likely to require more than incidental contact with a person with disability, and self-employed people and volunteers used by registered NDIS uh, providers and their subcontractors in risk assessed roles. So there's also um, people who don't require a clearance, uh, workers of unregistered providers and people in non-risk assessed roles. So the scheme seeks a balance between flexibility, choice and individual control, and I understand that that is an important underlying tenet of the NDIS, um, and quality and safeguarding. So the workers of unregistered providers um, can apply for an NDIS clearance if they're delivering or are planning to deliver NDIS supports and services, and the application is in endorsed by their employer, but there's no requirement uh, for them to apply. So I want to briefly um, make some comment about those gaps and the fact that worker screening um, isn't going to be uh, comprehensive. Um, I, workers of unregistered providers will not require a clearance. Um, I also assume that workers providing care for people with disability who are ineligible for the NDIS, um, I, 
for example, because of their visa status, um, but who receive state disability services and support will similarly not require a clearance. And I would like to know whether that will also be the case for people who acquired their disability when they were aged over 65 and so who are, in a, are by de definition, in ineligible for NDIS services. Um, the question I've got is, um, if they receive aged care services and supports instead, does that mean that this, uh, that this class of people will, will miss out on worker screening protections? Because what I'm concerned about is that we may be um, creating a two-tier uh, system, and I, if that is the case, I, I would like to know whether the government has any plans um, to address these uh, potential gaps. Uh, I acknowledge the right of people with disability to individual choice and control, and I, and, uh, I do know that um, there is a spectrum of, of uh, opinions on in terms of what this actually looks like. Um, however, what we want to see um, is a reasonable uh, balance struck. So this legislation is about protection and it's, um, and it's important to ensure uh, that if workers of unregistered providers aren't being screened, that this is not going to place NDIS recipients at, the, at increased risk. Uh, similarly, if workers who provide services to recipients of non-NDIS services aren't being screened, is this going to place um, vulnerable people at higher risk? So I really hope that this will be an area closely monitored by the state government uh, and that they, will be that they will be able to swiftly respond to any concerns as they arise. Um, but to return to the bill's provisions, uh, the CEO of the Department of Communities has, has the ultimate responsibility for undertaking NDIS uh, worker screening. And screening involves a criminal record check, uh, which is also going to contain any convictions, including spent convictions, uh, non-conviction charges and current pending charges, including for offences committed or allegedly, allegedly committed as a child. So clearances are going to remain in force for up to five years and they are subject to ongoing monitoring. Uh, I also note the Auditor General's uh, findings about working with children clearance screening processes and the use of interim negative notices. So it's obviously vital to ensure people are protected as the screening is being undertaken. And, and I do ask the Minister, how long is it estimated that the screening process will, uh, will take? And can people still work while screening is being undertaken? Um, class 1 and Class 2 offences against uh, WA legislation are listed in Schedules 1 and 2, and these offences were agreed uh, nationally. Uh, additional offences and additional conditions for the offences listed in the schedules may be prescribed um, in the regulations. And I note that the Legislation Committee found that these provisions, um, which enable the addition of Class 1 and Class 2 offences through regulation to be of concern as a Henry VIII um, clauses, but to be justifiable by reason of the need uh, to ensure that there is national uh, consistency in worker screening. Um, now, the Greens, of course, would prefer to not see Henry VIII um, clauses used, but we do accept um, we do accept this finding. Uh, conviction for a Class 1 offence uh, committed as an adult results in automatic exclusion from, from NDIS work. Uh, the individual isn't entitled to reapply um, as they are permanently excluded from this work. Um, and the question I have is what, it, what happens if that same individual then seeks work for an unregistered provider? Um, are there any protections in that instance? So exclusions must also be issued if the CEO conducts a risk assessment of the applicant or clearance holder and determines that there's an unacceptable risk um, that the person may cause harm uh, to people with disability in the course of carrying out their ND the NDIS work. And the CEO must impose an interim bar on applicants and a suspension on the clearance um, holders who are or become disqualified or presumptively disqualified when a risk assessment is undertaken. So the CEO may impose an interim bar or suspension on any other ground uh, that they determine appropriate. So the, one of the questions I have is, the, is whether there is a particular type of risk assessment tool that, that will be used. Um, 
does the minister have any information on its validity? Um, so I acknowledge that while these tools can be very useful, they're not immune, of course, from systemic bias. Um, information gathering isn't confined, isn't confined to simple criminal record uh, checking. Uh, other information relevant to risk might be considered. Uh, the CEO may request and consider information from any person or body in, in conducting a risk assessment. So I do note from the second reading speech that an unacceptable risk may arise from events that are not recent and need not be based on any assessment as to whether any conduct is likely to occur. So uh, I was hoping the Minister could provide an example of past behaviour that may be unlikely to reoccur, but that would result in an exclusion being issued. Uh, I, I acknowledge that the bill takes a strong um, precautionary approach and that doubts about risk need to be resolved in favour of protecting people with disability from harm. Um, and again, this quote from the second reading where it says, when the information considered in the risk assessment gives rise to significant concern, that cannot be resolved one way or the other. For example, where allegations of offending or misconduct are unable to be proven to any standing Given standard, the unacceptable risk test to be applied to decision making under this bill embodies that precautionary approach. So that's outlined. It's made quite clear that that is the intent of this bill, and the bill. But the bill and the bill is also um, uh, contains important information sharing provisions and powers investigation and enforcement. Um, and noting that the bill also provides for the CEO to take submissions uh, from applicants and clearance holders in advance of decisions to refuse or cancel a clearance. Um, the transition arrangement is going to be in the regulations. It's, I'm pleased to see it's got the um, standard five-year review clause, which is always welcomed by the Greens. Um, and, but I just have a few, uh, just the, another final question I have is, um, is about the issue of exemption for work experience students. Um, and I understand that Queensland introduced such a measure and I was wanting to know whether something like such as that had been contemplated here within Western Australia. So um, it's really clear from our existing frameworks um, that they are simply inadequate to um, ensure that we've got protect appropriate levels of protection for people with disability. Uh, the evidence to the Royal Commission really highlighted how big those current gaps are. And I think the bill before us, um, therefore, is going to be a very welcome and important mechanism that's going to address some of those gaps. But it is important to note that they won't address all that it won't address all of them. So I I think it's important to recognise that passage of this bill isn't going to negate the need for robust training and supervision and that it really is only one part, albeit an important part, of the solution to, pre to preventing abuse and neglect of people with disability. Um, members, we all have a role to play in supporting people with disability and in calling out and reporting harmful behaviour and treatment if we witness it. So I do welcome the bill. I note that's important we continue to work to strike the right balance in supporting and facilitating the right to self-determination for people with disability, i.e. not over-regulating over um, the area, uh, whilst also ensuring there are appropriate safeguards which seek to realise the right of people with disability to live in a healthy environment uh, free from neglect, abuse, violence, intimidation and exploitation, and this bill is part of that. Um, that spectrum of supports. The question is, the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. And uh, I had not originally intended, in order to expedite the proceedings uh, in respect of this bill, uh, to, to speak. But given that uh, there is some time available because of the expeditious way that uh, we've facilitated the government's passage of its legislative agenda that it has nominated uh, for this final sitting week. I thought I'd make a small contribution in respect of the report that has been mentioned uh, uh, by the Honourable uh, Steve Dawson, who, uh, as the Minister for Disability Services. Uh, by way of background, because this was a uniform legislation bill, it was um, on, uh, referred to the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review by way of Standing Order 126. And uh, we uh, were due to report 
Uh, I think it would have been on the end of the start of the first week of the um, November sittings, I think about the 3rd of November. Uh, but bearing in mind that the government uh, was, uh, had hinted at its uh, desire to uh, have this legislation, this important piece of legislation passed before Parliament rose, and in order to uh, assist in that process, we actually tabled our report with the President in accordance with standing orders a week before that sitting uh, when we had finalised the report. And uh, I'm pleased to say that we were able to assist the Minister in that regard because he had an additional week in order to be able to explore the recommendations that had been made and, uh, uh, and to deal with anything that the committee felt needed to be addressed. And I have to uh, say that on behalf of the committee, uh, we thank the Minister for the spirit of cooperation with which he engaged with the committee in providing information. And uh, when one looks at some of the recommendations made by the report, which primarily dealt with uh, three areas, uh, one being the commencement clause with the uh, suggestion of uh, an appropriate um, time limit on the proclamation of any provisions so that it, uh, if they are not for some reason proclaimed they can be automatically cleansed from the statute book. Uh, but two others dealing with potential Henry VIII clauses that were identified by the committee in the course of its analysis of the legislation. And uh, there are two features to that. Uh, one of them being that, uh, and we've raised this in the course of other reports that the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review has delivered, is the desirability of questionable clauses, or those that are even questionably Henry VIII clauses, and certainly those that plainly are Henry VIII clauses, being identified by the government when it uh, introduces its bills to this House. These things tend to be overlooked in the other place. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but they tend to uh, not notice or address those sorts of clauses, uh, which is a bit of a surprise and a disappointment, because if there, had, if there was, as a rule, greater uh, diligence in that regard, it would certainly take the burden off members of this House having to deal with that sort of an issue, and certainly our committees in having to deal with that sort of an issue. If they are addressed in advance of a bill being introduced, either in this, this place or the other place, it would be helpful if those sorts of concerns were to be solved uh, before the bill was introduced. Given that sometimes that may not take place, however, given that sometimes Henry VIII clauses are useful and indeed unavoidable, particularly in the case of national schemes that we are required to adopt, or because there is a, a restraint on the operation of those clauses, but they are necessary, for example, for transitional provisions in domestic legislation. It would be helpful if the government were to identify those, if not in the second reading speech as part of the policy of the bill, but certainly in the explanatory memoranda that are tabled as a matter of course to, uh, ex to uh, assist members understand what the intent and effect of those provisions are and to provide some rationale, some justification for the need for a Henry VIII clause. And regrettably, what the committee has found more generally is that that does not occur. Uh, I am pleased to say, and I commend the minister for this, that uh, us pointing out that there were such clauses in his bill, uh, rather than receiving the response that we have received from some other ministers saying, well, there's no requirement to put it in this explanatory memorandum, or to simply, as part of an explanatory memorandum, effectively paraphrase the clause in the bill rather than give an analysis and a reason for its necessity. I'm pleased that the minister, uh, in the spirit of, uh, of, of his responsibilities to parliament and in facilitating the passage of this legislation, 
uh, did take that on board and undertook to provide a supplementary explanatory memorandum and to give some explanation for the need of those clauses. How they were intended to operate, why are they unnecessary, why, despite the fact that they may be prima facie objectionable, for the very sound reasons that this House has expressed for just about every report that has been tabled which has identified such a clause, they, uh, a clause in that form may be uh, required. And so uh, I'm pleased to say that he has done that. Uh, I believe that he is now distributing and plans to table in the course of uh, either his uh, second reading reply or in the course of Committee of the Whole to table such a memorandum. I, I, I might just observe without uh, uh, too much criticism that it would have been helpful if it had been distributed earlier so that members would have been able to absorb the, uh, what he has to say about it. But uh, I commend him for the, the fact that he is prepared to do so and did not quibble with the idea that uh, there, there ought to be some explanatory uh, material provided to support the government's position. And uh, I might take the opportunity to urge other uh, ministers, uh, not only in the uh, current government but in future governments, whichever their colour, that it is part of uh, the purpose of an explanatory memorandum to assist members in understanding the thrust of the bill, what not only um, expand on the policy but I would have thought to give some idea as to how clauses work and interrelate with each other rather than simply providing some comment about this is what the clause does. Uh, an explanatory memorandum should weave together the various threads, and particularly in the case of a very large and complex piece of legislation, so that members uh, do not have to expend unnecessary time and indeed delay through uh, unnecessary questioning uh, the passage of, of legislation. As I mentioned, there were only three significant, um, three recommendations, and uh, the, the recommendations relating to uh, explanatory memoranda uh, are ex recommendations two and three, and uh, I'm pleased that the Minister is dealing with it and will address the question of the Henry VIII clauses. I'm also um, pleased that the Minister has taken the initiative rather than it being necessary for the committee or a member to move the amendment to clause 2 to uh, provide for the, uh, the sunset clause, if I might term it that way, um, uh, rather than uh, having uh, a member deal with that and that it is a government amendment as pa and as part of the other government amendments that are felt necessary, although uh, most of those really deal with a, a title to some legislation uh, to uh, provide for the High Risk Serious Offenders Act in place of the Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act. On that note, uh, I'd like to uh, thank the, uh, the Minister for his uh, cooperation, his provision for inform of information and the like. I uh, was pleased that the committee was able to uh, assist him in uh, addressing as early as possible any need for, uh, for uh, comment and uh, response to the committee's report and thank uh, my fellow members on the committee for their, uh, their, their work on this and other legislation that we have had to deal with and to the legal advisor uh, Ms Felicity Mackey, uh, who's done a sterling job over the years analysing some very complicated le legislation and in helping to devise ways that it can be improved uh, and to facilitate indeed the incorporation into Western Australian law of national scheme legislation and uh, also to the committee clerk, Mr Mark Warner. Members, the uh, Mr Acting President, um, can I thank, uh, uh, first of all, can I thank the Honourable Peter Collier uh, for his indication of support for the bill before us. Can I also acknowledge the bipartisan way that you do 
undertake your role as Shadow, uh, Shadow Minister for Disabilities. I'm very grateful that we, we have a good collaborative relationship, and I thank you for um, the ongoing relationship that our, both our offices have together. I think it's um, um, when you're dealing with people with disability, I think it's important that we you know, are on the same page, and we certainly are in this regard. Um, can I thank the Honourable Alison Zamon for her contribution too, and for her indication of support of the bill, and the, the Honourable Michael Mission, uh, and I'll get to his points a little bit later on. Um, the Honourable uh, Peter Collier had asked for some clarification about what is meant by an incidental worker. And so registered NDIS providers are responsible for identifying which roles are risk assessed roles and ensuring all workers in these roles have an NDIS worker screening clearance. Um, a risk assessed role is a role for which the normal duties include the direct delivery of specified supports or specified services to a person with disability. A role for which the normal duties are likely to require more than incidental contact with people with disability, which includes physic physically touching a person with disability or building a rapport with a person with disability uh, as, an, as an integral and ordinary part of the performance of normal duties, or having contact with multiple people with disability as part of the direct delivery of a specialist disability support or service or in a specialist uh, disability accommodation setting. Uh, it includes physical contact, face-to-face -face contact, oral communication, written communication and electronic communication. Uh, registered NDIS providers will not be required to ensure that workers who do not work in risk assessed roles have an NDIS worker screening clearance or an acceptable check under the transitional and special arrangements. Now, if I give two examples and put those on the record. Um, so, example one, uh, Lee works for a mobility company, mobility equipment company, that is a registered NDIS provider and delivers mobility equipment to the homes of people with disability. As a standard part of that role, he provides training and instructions to the customer about how to use the equipment safely and makes adjustments to the, to the equipment to make it suitable for the customer. The provider will have to ensure that Lee uh, has an NDIS worker screening clearance. An example of someone who wouldn't, so would be Sue. Sue is an accountant who works in the back office of a registered NDIS provider. Um, Sue often has uh, coincidental contact with people with disability while she's moving through public areas of the business, such as when she walks through the lobby, at which time Sue nods and says hello to the customers. The provider does not have to ensure that Sue has an uh, NDIS worker screening clearance because her role does not involve the direct delivery uh, of, uh, of services uh, to, to, this, um, to this person. And she's not required to have more than incidental contact with people with disability. Um, so I just put those examples, examples on, on, the, on, the, on the record. Uh, the Honourable Alison Zamon had a couple of questions, uh, a few questions. Uh, in relation to the fee, um, the fee will be similar to the fee for a working with children check. Uh, the, final the final decision will be, uh, will be in the regulations, but it will be a similar fee. It won't be any greater than the, than the working with children check um, per year. Um, and obviously, uh, and I agree, uh, it is important to keep the fee as low as possible. Um, she asked, the Honourable Alison Zamon asked, if somebody got their disability after 65, will they be captured? And so if you're working with somebody with disability who, who got the disability after 65, uh, the answer is no. However, the recipient can ask the worker to apply for an NDIS uh, worker screening check. Um, how long will the screening process take? Uh, it, it, it might take days. It just depends on the information that's given, uh, given to the organisation, to the agency. Uh, however, uh, the second question was, can people work while waiting for that check to come through? Uh, yes, you can. But the CEO can issue an interim bar to stop somebody from working in the sector, and in some cases must. Uh, the Honourable Alison Zamon also asked a question in relation to uh, the issue of exemptions for work experience students, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm advised we will mirror what is in place in Queensland. So that, that will be, uh, and that will be done in the regulations. Um, you asked about risk assessment. Uh, we haven't got a template, but certainly every matter uh, is considered on its merit. Now, if I can touch on uh, the Honourable Michael Mission's contribution, um, and can I, at the outset, thank you for uh, for. Uh, uh, for your um, good work uh, uh, so as chair of the Uniform Legislation Statutes Review Committee. And I thank your um, fellow members of the committee too, the Honourable Pierre Young, I think it's your deputy chair, the Honourable Robert Scott and the Honourable Laurie Graham, I understand as the committee. Thank you all. Uh, I'm particularly grateful for you um, getting your report back earlier than you needed to, and that did give us some time to, to address the, the issues that you raised uh, in your report. Um, 
So I certainly welcome, uh, I welcome, uh, welcome the report. Uh, and obviously, as the Honourable uh, Michael Mission has indicated, uh, there was a, um, uh, I think it was a finding, or was it a recommendation, uh, in relation to in, in relation to the explanatory memorandum. I think it was a finding. It wasn't. It wasn't a recommendation. I don't think you made it. Yeah. No. But just in terms there of there were two recommendations. In terms Maybe. of the explanatory memorandum yeah, itself, yeah. I was trying to find the, the correct words. So it has been suggested that, uh, that um, uh, an, an updated explanatory memorandum should be provided. So I'd like to take this opportunity to table an updated explanatory memorandum uh, for the bill. That takes uh, the, 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 essentially the changes that are in the... Uh, yeah, the Minister sought to table the explanatory memorandum. Let's just table it, yeah. yeah tabled. Thank you. Um, so the changes in that explanatory memorandum explanatory memorandum take on board uh, the recommendations that have been made uh, by the committee in their report number uh, number 130. Um, so, as the Honourable Michael Mission has pointed out, the committee's re report found that the Bill's Clause 2, uh, in providing the operational provisions of the Bill, will commence on a day fixed by proclamation by the Executive, erodes the Parliament's sovereignty, sovereignty and lawmaking powers. And the committee's recommendation 1 was that Clause 2 of the Bill be amended to require the proposed National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Act 2020 to be automatically repealed, if not operational, at the expiration of 10 years of receiving royal assent. Um, I have made, uh, made that change and, uh, to the explanatory memorandum, and indeed uh, I have also lodged on the supplementary notice paper uh, an amendment uh, that, deal with that, that deals with that issue. Um, the, in terms of the, uh, in terms of, so just also on that supplementary notice paper, there are um, a couple of other uh, amendments to clauses 39 and 89, um, which reflect the recent passage of the High Risk Serious, uh, Serious Offenders Act 2020, which repealed the Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act 2006, and so those changes are made too. Um, but the remainder of the committee's, committee's report, as the Honourable Michael Mission pointed out, um, was concerned with. Uh, Henry VIII clauses in the bill, uh, and so um, I um, have uh, taken those uh, taken those concerns on board. Uh, I have made the suggested changes to the uh, the updated explanatory memorandum. Um, I also note that you did the committee's findings five, nine, and thirteen uh, were that were that the Henry VIII clauses were acceptable by reason uh, of the need for Western Australia to maintain nationally consistent workers work consistent worker screening uh, and to effect a smooth transition to the new requirements. And so I certainly welcome, uh, welcome those findings. Um, uh, however, uh, I have taken on board your suggestion to, uh, to acknowledge the, the use of the Henry, Henry VIII clauses, and so they are in the updated uh, explanatory memorandum. Um, this, is, this is very important um, and indeed landmark legislation for Western Australia. Uh, it does, um, it does um, yeah, it will make a difference. Uh, it's not, you know, uh, will it stop some people from doing uh, from doing certain things? It might not. But this is uh, another level of protection that um, I think, well, certainly I know, uh, is uh, is supported uh, and welcomed by people across the sector. So I do uh, I do want to again thank the committee for their work and thank the honourable Peter Collier in particular. Uh, for helping us get to the place where we are today and having this legislation before the House. So with that, uh, I commend the bill to the House. Members, the question is, the bill will be read a second time. All of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020, second reading. We now move to committee.
question is that clause one do stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Grant. Chairman, uh, Minister, uh, you will be aware um, from discussions that we had uh, behind the chair that I didn't intend to do a second reading speech with respect to this uh, bill, which has my support, but I just wanted to get on the record certain things uh, that have been discussed between our respective officers um, in the preparation uh, for today. Um, I might just conveniently just deal with it all under, under clause one. Uh, and uh, I, I start with the uh, date that this bill is intended to come into uh, operation. Now, if we look at the, the bill and we cast our eye ahead to clause two, we see that uh, with the exception of part one, the rest of the Act will come into operation on a day fixed for proclamation. And importantly, the clause says that different days may be fixed for different provisions. Now, in the report from the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statute Review, Report 130, reference is made there to a letter of advice that you provided to the committee dated the 22nd of September this year. Uh, and it's also attached as Appendix 1 to the report. In it, you've indicated that the entirety of the Act is expected to come into operation on 1 February 2021, with the exception of Clause 23. Can you just confirm that that uh, expected date of operation remains the same? Mr Deputy Chair, uh, I can confirm that, that remains the same. The Honourable Nick Garan. Now, uh, Minister, Clause 23, which is the one exception uh, with respect to the commencement period of the 1st of February 2021, is uh, one of the key clauses of interest uh, to me. Now, I understand that uh, in that same letter of advice of the 22nd of September this year, you indicated that Clause 23 is included in the bill to allow for potential future alignment of the duration of an individual's National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Check Clearance Certificate (NDIS clearance) and Working with Children Assessment Notice (Working with Children Check), and that Clause 23 is not intended to commence until such time as relevant amendments to the Working with Children Act may be passed and enacted. And later in that letter, you indicate commencement of Clause 23 without an amendment to the WWC Act could lead to ongoing requests for NDIS clearances to be in force for less than five years. And later in the letter, you say such decisions would never align the time periods of an individual's NDIS clearance and WWC check unless the duration of the NDIS clearance was continually reduced. The exercise of this discretion would therefore undermine the intent of the Intergovernmental Agreement of Nationally Consistent Worker Screening for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which, a clause 76, which at Clause 76 provides NDIS clearances will be valid for up to five years subject to ongoing monitoring. Now, um, I understand that in part, Minister, uh, because it is the case that you intend the operation of the Act, of the provisions with the exception of Clause 23 to come into effect on the 1st of February 2021, this is uh, in part why you are agreeable to bringing in the amendment on the supplementary notice paper found in your name at uh, 2 oblique 2. That said, uh, Minister, what I want to do is just to confirm that the information that your office has kindly provided to me prior to today's date uh, remains, uh, remains correct. And this is in regards to Clause 23. And it may just be useful at this time, Minister, if I just uh, quote uh, from this email that I received uh, on Monday of last week, the 16th of November, 
where the following remarks are made. Further to our emails last week, Minister Dawson offers the following information relating to your query regarding the commencement and intent of Clause 23 of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020 for your consideration. As you'll be aware, an NDIS worker check clearance certificate NDIS clearance is intended to have a duration of five years, while an assessment notice in the form of a WWC card issued under the Working with Children Criminal Record Checking Act 2004 WWC Act currently has a duration of three years. Clause 23 of the bill provides discretion for the Chief Executive Officer of the Department of Communities to reduce the period of an NDIS clearance or permit an application for a further NDIS clearance sooner than three months before the expiry of the current NDIS clearance. This clause seeks to facilitate an alignment of the timeframes for application for a WWC card and an NDIS clearance for individuals who must apply for both checks. Now, I'm just going to pause there, Minister, before we continue on to the other um, uh, comments made in that helpful email. Can I just confirm then that the purpose is that a person who has to apply for both will be able to, because of clause 23 when it comes into effect, make one application rather than two? Minister. Thank you. No, they, they, they still have to do two applications, but they can make them at the same time. Right. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Minister. And those, those two applications that can be made concurrently um, can be made to the uh, one Chief Executive Officer being the CEO of the Department of Communities? That is correct. Minister. The Honourable Nick Garan. Now, Minister, until such time as Clause 23 comes into uh, operation, is it going to be the case, and we don't know when that will be, but we understand that that will be on a date later than the 1st of February next year. Is it the case that a person will continue to have to make two applications but they won't be able to make them uh, at the same time? Minister. Yes. Honourable Nick Ram. Now, Minister, back to this uh, email of the 16th of November uh, this year. It goes on to say, the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse in its Working with Children Check report recommended a five-year duration for a WWC card subject to continuous national ongoing monitoring of criminal history information. Clause 23 is not intended to commence until such time as future amendments to the WWC Act may be passed and enacted, which include increasing the duration of a WWC card, a matter for a distinct amendment bill. The email goes on to say, for the purposes of the operation of Clause 23, practically it will not be possible to align the two checks while a WWC card's duration is three years, hence the intention for a different commencement date for this clause. Clause 23 was drafted for a future WWC amendment bill being passed by the Parliament if a future amendment bill to increase the duration of the WWC card is not passed by the Parliament, the amendment I propose to the commencement provision of the bill will result in the automatic repeal of Clause 23 if it does not commence within 10 years after royal assent. And I just want to seek your confirmation, Minister, that all of that information that was kindly provided by your office on the 16th of November remains the position of the government. Minister. Thank you. I can't confirm that, Honourable Member. Members, the Honourable Nick Graham. Thanks, uh, Mr Deputy Chairman. Now, um, it won't be too much uh, longer, Minister, but I don't think I'll be able to uh, deal with this all prior to the uh, adjournment. Um, I want to just quickly look at the Royal Commission's uh, Working with Children's Checks report from 2015, and in particular, I'm just going to quote uh, briefly from pages 108 to uh, 110 under the heading of duration and continuous monitoring. Now, the relevance of this is that, Minister, in that email that I received uh, kindly from your office last week, uh, the author of the, um, of the email quite correctly underlined this particular phrase, subject to continuous national ongoing monitoring of criminal history information. 
because I agree with the author that that is um, a key component uh, to the potential invoking of Clause 23. Now, in the Royal Commission's report from 2015, under this heading, or Chapter 7.2, Duration and Continuous Monitoring, the following remarks are made under the heading Current Approaches. WWCCs in each state and territory are granted for a set period of time, ranging from two years in the Northern Territory to five years in New South Wales and Victoria. After this time has lapsed, people who wish to continue in child-related work must apply to have their WWCC renewed. And there is then a table that sets out the length of time that the Working with Children's Checks remain valid in the various jurisdictions. And of course, in Western Australia, the period of time is three years. In this report, it then goes on to say as follows. The question of how long WWCC should last is linked inextricably to screening agencies' capacity to identify and monitor new relevant records as they arise. The validity period of WWCCs also has implications for, and they then list four dot points, two of which are of particular interest at this time, one being the currency of information held by screening agencies, and the second one, how often a person's suitability to work with children is assessed. It then goes on to say, Mr Deputy Chairman, that to varying degrees, each state and territory currently monitors WWCCs. And noting the time, I will leave the chair to the ringing of the bells. Honourable members, the Deputy Chair of Committees. Members, we're dealing with the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill of 2020 and we're in Committee of the Whole and the question is clause one be standards printed. The Honourable Nick Grant. Deputy Chairman, prior to the uh, adjournment for the luncheon interval, we were dealing with uh, clause one of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill of 2020. And in particular, <coughs> I was uh, seeking to get on the record some of the useful information that the Minister for Disability Services Office had kindly provided to me uh, last week, and uh, I confirmed that that information was reconfirmed by the Minister uh, earlier today. And in particular, Mr Ch Deputy Chairman, we are looking at the intersection between uh, Clause 2 and Clause 23 of the Bill. Um, and I remind members that it is the intention of the government <coughs> to bring into effect all of the clauses, all of the clauses in this 90 clause bill on the 1st of February next year, with the exception of one clause, which is Clause 23. Now, um, Minister, just prior to the adjournment, I was looking at the Royal Commission's report dealing with working with children's checks from 2015. And um, I intend to just take a moment to look at one of the recommendations that arose in that report. Now, before I do, Minister, perhaps in order to uh, expedite the passage of the consideration yeah, yeah, yeah. of this issue, you might be able just to confirm for the House that it is the intention of the government, should it be re-elected on the 13th of March next year, to bring in a further bill to in part deal with reforms on working with children checks and in particular to extend the current three-year period to five years. Are you able to confirm that? 
Minister. Thank you. Uh, I can say, honourable member, that the matter is under consideration by government at the moment. So no bill has been to cabinet uh, in relation to that issue, but the minister is considering it. Well, uh, that encourages me, Minister, because that then gives me an opportunity at this time to, if you like, uh, make some submissions on this point, because uh, uh, I need a fair amount of persuading that, in due course, it will be appropriate for us to extend working with children checks from three years to five years. And I'll explain why. <coughs> because of this intersection between Clause 2 and Clause 23 and the recommendations of the Royal Commission report. Now, in that report that I was quoting from earlier at page 108, after it set out the length of time that the working with children's checks remain valid in the various jurisdictions, it then goes on to say the following. To varying degrees, each state and territory currently monitors working with children's check cardholders on an ongoing basis to identify relevant changes in their circumstances and, if necessary, reassess risks to children. Known as continuous monitoring, this generally involves state and territory screening agencies ac accessing criminal records from their respective police services on a daily or weekly basis, generally through arrangements facilitated by CrimTrack. However, we note that there are variations to this approach. <clears throat> These arrangements do not currently enable agencies to access cardholders' national criminal records, meaning that continuous monitoring is restricted to records arising in the jurisdiction that issued the Working with Children's Check. The practical effect of this is that a cardholder could commit an offence in another jurisdiction that remains undetected until their working with children's cheque is due for renewal, which, if known, would result in the cancellation of their working with children's cheque. Many submissions on issues paper number one noted that WWCC renewals are needed at regular intervals until continuous monitoring is expanded to include national criminal records so that new relevant records are identified and assessed. For example, Victoria reported that since their WWCC scheme commenced in 2006, approximately 54 per cent of all negative notices were issued to existing cardholders demonstrating the value of this type of monitoring. So I pause there, Mr Deputy Chairman, just to remind members that the government have confirmed earlier that the intention with respect to Clause 23 is that it will come into effect on a date to be determined in the future, some date expected to be after the 1st of February next year and that this issue is, if you like, dependent or hinges upon continuous national ongoing monitoring of criminal history information. And that's because of this gap that's been identified in the Royal Commission's report. Now, the report goes on to say, Mr Chairman, we believe, later on page 109, the report says, we believe it is appropriate to grant WWCCs for longer periods of time, provided that there are reliable systems in place for two things. Promptly identifying and assessing changes that may affect a person's risk to children and alerting employers and other relevant bodies to any resulting changes in a person's WWCC clearance status. So you see here, Mr Chairman, Mr Deputy Chairman, that the Royal Commission's report has identified two key prerequisites if a jurisdiction is going to provide for a longer period of time with regard to these working with children's checks. At the moment, in Western Australia, it's three years. The minister has confirmed that it's currently under consideration to extending that out to five years. And I'm glad, for, I for one, I'm glad that it's under consideration. Because we need to make sure, if we're going to go down this path, Mr Deputy Chairman, 
that these things have been addressed before we extend working with children's checks to a five-year period of time. We don't want some of these criminals obtaining a working with children's check, committing crimes in another jurisdiction, it not being alerted to Western Australian authorities and then continuing to access, have access to children over that five year period of time. We don't want that to happen until such time as these gaps have been addressed. Now in this Royal Commission report, Mr Acting <coughs> President, Mr Deputy Chairman, the report goes on to say, conversely, we believe the absence or ineffective operation of such mechanisms should result in working with children's checks being granted for shorter periods to ensure new information about the risks people engaged in child-related work pose to children are identified and assessed. And, Minister, this is what I'm asking the government to consider, is whether, in fact, the period of time should be shorter rather than longer. I well understand the desirability of having the checks with respect to dis disability in line with those for working with children. So I well understand the desirability of that and the efficiencies that are created with having two applications being lodged concurrently to the one authority. And uh, whilst I support the desirability of efficiency, I don't want efficiency to be the driving factor here, least of all in circumstances where child safety might be put at risk. <clears throat> now later uh, in, on the final page that I intend to quote from the Royal Commission's report on 110, they say, we are of the view that there should be an obligation on both people engaged in child-related work and those engaging people in child-related work, for example, the employer, to inform the relevant screening agency when a person commences or ceases the specific child-related work. And this leads to recommendation 31 by the Royal Commission, which reads as follows. Subject to the commencement of continuous monitoring of national criminal history records, state and territory governments should amend their working with children's check laws to specify that A, WWCCs are valid for five years, B, employers and WWCC cardholders engaged in child-related work must inform the screening agency when a person commences or ceases being engaged in specific child-related work, and C, screening agencies are required to notify a person's employer of any change in the person's WWCC status. Now, Minister, the reason that I take some time to underscore these points and uh, bring these matters to your attention and to your government's attention while this issue is under active consideration is because earlier this year, specifically on the 15th of July this year, the Office of the Auditor-General the Office of the Auditor-General issued a media release, a media statement, which in part stated as follows. The Auditor-General today tabled the Working with Children's Checks Managing Compliance Report in Parliament that assessed whether the WA Health System and the Departments of Education and Justice complied with their Working with Children Check requirements. The media release goes on to say, Auditor-General Ms Caroline Spencer said none of the three entities fully complied with their obligations and they could not be sure that everyone who needed a Working with Children card had one goes on to quote the Auditor-General saying, for example, all entities had procedures for managing working with children's checks, but they were not always followed." End quote. So it's for these reasons, Minister, that I'm underscoring these points, because we can see that only a few months ago, the Office of the Auditor-General has been quite critical of the Departments of Education and Justice 
with respect to their handling with working with children check requirements. And we would not want that lack of compliance to then be in place if we are looking to extend the period from three years to five years. We need to make sure these problems are addressed. Mr Deputy Chairman. The Honourable Nick Grant. Now, I also draw to the attention of the Minister and to members a further media statement made by the Auditor General, albeit that this was at the end of last year. This was on the 23rd of October last year. Under the heading, working with children check process has improved, but risks remain. And the Auditor General said on that day as follows in the media statement, and I quote, in 2018-19, communities issued 20% of people who were refused a card with an interim negative notice, temporarily preventing them from working with children until the assessment was finalised. However, 80% of people who were refused a card were not issued with an interim negative notice, meaning they could work with children while communities processed their application. In 2018-19, it took, on average, over 200 days to refuse these applications. We consider revising this approach provides a significant opportunity to reduce risk to children. Ms Spencer said communities has little assurance if employers are complying with the scheme and ensuring that staff who need a working with children card have one. Communities needs to strengthen its regulatory compliance activities and make every effort to minimise risk to children and ensure that employees the self-employed and volunteers in child-related work comply with the legislated requirements and undergo a working with children check. The audit contains a number of recommendations to further improve working with children checks to keep, help keep children safe. So I'll conclude at this point, uh, uh, Minister uh, and Mr Deputy Chairman, simply to say that for all of these reasons, I've indicated that uh, uh, I join with uh, our leader, the Honourable Peter Collier, in expressing support uh, for this bill. I simply make the point that I make no apologies for the reasons that I've just outlined, that when a future bill is introduced into this place, I'm going to require a substantial amount of evidence that the transition puts the safety of children first. I'm not going to be agreeable to extending the checks from three years to five years if all of these matters haven't been addressed. Now, if all of these things have been addressed, then I join with the uh, uh, Royal Commission in its recommendation, which says that you can then have a situation where working with children's checks are valid for five years. But it's not just simply a case of extending it from three to five. There's a mountain of work that needs to be done first. And we know from the work that's been done by the Auditor General as recent as this year that we're not yet in a position to do it. So I can at least, uh, Minister, uh, uh, pass on my thanks that the government have not yet uh, determined a firm position on this, that it's under active consideration. I would encourage that active consideration to continue for as long as is necessary until such time as the Cabinet are satisfied that all of these prerequisites have been satisfied. In the event after the 13th of March next year that I find myself as the Minister for Child Protection, I can certainly give a commitment that I won't be bringing in a bill to extend it from three to five years until these prerequisites have been satisfied. And I thank the uh, Minister for the indulgence of trying to wrap up all of these matters in the Clause 1 debate. Minister. Thanks very much, Mr uh, Deputy Chairman. Uh, Honourable Member, your point is well made, and I shall certainly bring your comments to the attention of the Minister for Child Protection. Members, the question is Clause 1. Do stand as printed? All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, questions now. Clause 2 to stand as printed. Minister. Thanks very much. Mr. Um, 
Mr Deputy Chairman. Uh, you will see, Mr Deputy Chairman, uh, amendments standing in my name uh, at uh, 1 oblique 2 and 2 oblique 2. Um, I have given uh, reasons uh, earlier, earlier this afternoon as to why they appear on the supplementary notice paper, but obviously uh, they appear as a result of the good work of the Uniform uh, Legislation Committee. So I uh, so move those amendments. Actually, can I seek leave to move them in block? Yes, you can seek leave, Minister. Is leave granted? Aye. Aye. Leave, leave's granted. Minister, you can now move the amendments. I so move the amendments standing in my name at 1 oblique 2 and 2 oblique 2. Uh, members, the Minister has moved from supplementary notice paper number 202, issue number 1, the amendment standing in his name at 1 oblique 2 and 2 oblique 2. And the question is that the words to be inserted be inserted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, the question is now that clause 2 as amended be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Can I get indication of further clauses, members? No further clauses. Ah, thank you, Minister. Um, uh, the question, therefore, is that clauses 3 to 38 do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is clause 39 do stand as printed. The Minister. Thanks very much, Mr Deputy Chairman. Uh, I, again, I did previously indicate earlier today uh, I spoke about these two amendments at, that stand in my name at clauses 3 oblique 39 and 4 oblique 89, uh, where, I seek to, where I seek to delete uh, Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act 2006 and insert High Risk Serious Offenders Act 2020. That is uh, as a result of the recent passage of the High Risk Serious Offenders Act 2020, which, appealed, which repealed the Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act 2006. So, um, so again, I would seek leave of the House to move those two amendments on. It's different clauses. Oh, sure it is. Okay, I don't seek any leave. I just uh, see. I just want to move the amendment standing in my name at three oblique thirty-nine. Members, the minister has moved the amendment standing in his name at three oblique thirty-nine on the supplementary notice paper. The question is: Are the words to be deleted? Be deleted. All those of opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the words to be inserted be inserted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is clause 39 as amended be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Indication of further clauses before 89. Therefore, uh, the question is now that clauses 40 to 88 do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, questions of clause 89 do stand as printed to the Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've given the reason why uh, I seek to move this amendment, so uh, I so move the amendment standing in my name at 4 oblique 89. Members, the Minister has moved the amendment standing in his name at 4 oblique 89, page 80, line 22, to, to delete Dangerous Sexual Offenders Act 2006 and insert High Risk Serious Offenders Act 2020. The question is the words to be deleted, be deleted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the words to be inserted, be inserted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is clause 89 as amended, be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Question is clause 90 do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Question is schedule one do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Question is schedule two do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is to be the title of the bill. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you, Mr. That you report the bill to the House. Members, the question is I report the bill to the House. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it.
Madam President, the Committee of the Whole has considered the National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill of 2020 and agreed to same with amendment. Minister for President, I seek leave of the House to consider and adopt the report at this day's sitting. Minister, sorry, the Minister seeks leave uh, to adopt the report at this day's sitting. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. I move that the report be adopted. Members, the question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister for the Environment. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended so as to enable the bill to be now read a third time forthwith. Members, the Minister has moved that motion. An absolute majority is required to pass this suspension motion. And there is an absolute majority in the House. I'm going to put the question. The question is that motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. There's no dissenting voice, so that motion is agreed. Minister for the Environment. Move that the bill be narrowed a third time. Members, I've received from the Deputy Chair of Committees a certificate in writing that this is a true copy of the bill as agreed to in the Committee of the Whole and reported. And the question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. National Disability Insurance Scheme Worker Screening Bill 2020, third reading. Members, we now move to order of the day number 28. Criminal Law Unlawful Consorting Bill 2020 and a return to committee. Members, we are dealing with the Criminal Law Unlawful Consorting Bill 2020, and I draw members' attention to the supplementary notice paper number 161, issue number four. We're dealing with clause six of the bill, uh, to which the Honourable Alison Zamon has moved the amendment standing in her name at one oblique six on the supplementary notice paper to insert certain words. And the question before the chair is the words to be inserted be inserted. The Honourable Alison Zamon. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. So can I just confirm, please, had, uh, had I already moved that amendment? I yes. had. Fantastic. So, um, so I just wanted to speak to my amendment. I had um, already made some reference to this within the course of my second reading contribution. And the point I made at the time was that um, the, bill, um, the bill does explicitly protect one form of communication when it comes to governmental and political matters. And that's and that's the defence which is at clause 9 in relation to necessary consorting in the context of industrial action by members of registered unions for the purposes of the union's business. But as I raised um, um, in the course of my second reading, the concern I've got is that there's no defence or exclusion in the bill for any other form of advocacy, uh, protest and dissent. So ordinarily, in other similar legislation, and I'll just make reference to that in a moment, as well as industrial action, um, which, um, these sorts of this type of action is uh, usually expressly protected by WI legislation. And so I think that to not have that as an explicit inclusion within this bill is uh, quite a substantial departure from what we'd consider to be usual. Um, in the Criminal Organisations Control Act 2012, um, that, there is a double protection at the moment, and uh, that talks about um, that has a specific 
um, protection uh, and has a specific um, purpose of the Act that says that the Act is to be used in a manner that, it, it, that the powers in this Act, um, that there is not the intention of the Parliament, that the powers in this Act be used in a manner that would diminish the freedom of persons in this state to participate in advocacy, protest, dissent or industrial action. And then it, um, it goes on to set out a range of defences, and that includes um, lawful political protest or lawful industrial action. So it actually contemplates um, both um, forms, forms of activity. Um, the out of control gathering provisions in the criminal, co in criminal code um, also talks about um, a gathering that's primarily for the purposes of political advocacy, protest or uh, industri industrial action as an explicit exclusion. And even, with, even our three terrorism laws. So uh, the uh, Terrorism Commonwealth Powers Act 2002, the Terrorism Extraordinary Powers Act 2005 and the Terrorism Preventative Detention Act 2006, all three of them um, introduced um, by a Labor government, all explicitly exclude from their scope advocacy, protest, dissent or industrial action. Um, provided, of, and it goes on to say, provided it's not intended to cause a person's death or, you know, or serious um, physical harm, etc. Um, so, in previous legislation has specifically recognised and upheld, and also acted to explicitly ensure uh, Western Australia's uh, freedom of communication on governmental and, and political um, matters. And uh, it is my understanding that the reason that, that this bill um, seeks to depart from this tradition and not include this, the scope of this activity within this bill is because of concerns that it might, be able to, it might not be able to be drafted narrowly enough to prevent convicted offenders from consorting for criminal purposes under the cover of a protest. But I will say uh, that argument does not seem to have been a problem in relation to the drafting of any of the other ten um, defences. Um, certainly the defence relating to industrial action is drafted narrow narrowly, but there are other more broadly worded defences in the bill that permit consorting that's necessary for a range of purposes. Um, in addition, every defence in the bill contains three protections against the um, defence is being misused. Uh, the onus is on the accused to start with because it's a defence. Um, the consorting must be necessary to the specified purpose and, um, and if it's statutorily deemed to not be necessary and therefore the defence doesn't apply, um, it, it, if it's shown that any of the purposes for consorting um, was to avoid the operation of an unlawful consorting notice or related to criminal activity. So I don't think that including a defence for advocacy, protest or dissent will open the door to um, circumventing um, the defences to any sort of greater degree to, um, to, than to which um, already exists within the bill. I, and I suspect that the um, problem re relates to priority. I'm, I'm concerned that it's simply not being given the same level of significance, um, and hence we're not we're not valuing this, its statutory protection. Uh, but I think members that advocacy, uh, protest and dissent really does matter, just as I also support industrial action. Um, so, uh, so I think that um, I think that this is a, an omission that needs to be seriously addressed. I think it's quite important that we actually maintain some sort of consistency with other similar types of legislation that contemplate large gatherings for a range of reasons, and I, and, um, I ask members to seriously consider supporting this particular amendment. Minister. So the government will not be supporting uh, the amendment. Uh, moved by the Honourable Alison Zamon. The bill's object is accurately stated in clause 6 as it stands, that is to disrupt and restrict the capacity of convicted offenders uh, to organise, plan, support or encourage the carrying out of criminal activity. Consorting by a person the subject of an unlawful consorting notice with another person named in the notice is prohibited to achieve that object and not for the object of diminishing the freedom of persons to engage in advocacy, protest or dissent. While the prohibition on consorting may incidentally uh, impact on the capacity of uh, a person the subject of the notice to engage in advocacy, protest or dissent, that's not the object of the prohibition. A person who is subject to unlawful consorting notice will still be able to engage in advocacy, protest or dissent, provided that the person does not consort with any other person named in the notice. 
um, the purpose of Clause 6 is to state the object of the bill, not what the objects of the bill are not. And the proposed amendment is unnecessary. Further, the proposed amendment to uh, Clause 6 would undermine the object of the bill by creating a potentially wide exception to the prohibition on consorting, which could be exploited by convicted offenders named in the unlawful consorting notice to allow them to organise, plan, support or encourage carrying out criminal activity under the pretext of advocacy, protest or dissent. The bill already provides appropriate exceptions in Clause 9, which recognise that, in, recognise that in some cases it will be necessary or reasonable for a person the subject of an unlawful consorting notice to consort with others named in the notice. Members, questions that weren't inserted be inserted. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, and uh, I understand the and have some sympathy for the Honourable Alison Zamon's intentions here, but I agree with the government that it is not appropriate to make the amendment that is being sought and uh, we won't be supporting it. Um, the qualification in the Criminal Organisations Control Act was to the purposes of the Act so that there could be no misunderstanding of, by way of interpretation, as to what organisations were to be regarded as criminal if they complied with or if they fell within the other parameters uh, that were prescribed by that legislation. Because there was concern, as members that were here will recall, that it could be misapplied, notwithstanding the several checks and balances contained within the procedures in the Act, but misapplied to outlaw uh, organised organisations engaged in uh, employee uh, uh, unionism, um, everything from chess clubs and bicycling clubs and all sorts of things. And so it was intended to make quite plain what the purposes that the Act was intended to apply to would be and to exclude those from operation. But what the Honourable Alison Zamon is intending would be more properly included as a specific exclusion or defence, I would have thought, to particular offence creating provisions or the powers that are afforded the commissioner or senior officers that are delegated the power to issue a consorting notice uh, should, be, uh, should be limited to. I don't think that one can sensibly, as a matter of drafting, or should be, including them as part of an exception to the objects of the Act or qualifying the objects of the Act, because the objects of the Act are intended to stop criminal activity, disrupt and restrict the capacity of convicted offenders to organise, plan, support or encourage the carrying out of criminal activity. Then you have the series of powers to issue the notices and then you have the, uh, the variety of defences that we'll get to in due course. There's also a significant omission, it seems to me, regarding the matters that are being specified in the Honourable Alison Zamon's amendment. And uh, I accept that the word intention was used in the Criminal Organisations Control Act by way of the purposes, but it seems to me that phrasing this as without derogating from subsection one, that is the, the primary intention of the Act, it is not the intention of Parliament that the powers in this Act be used in a manner that would diminish the freedom of persons in this state 
to participate in advocacy, protest or dissent that is not intended to do various things is not particularly pointed. It needs to be actually uh, more substantively attached to some kind of a provision as a limitation of powers to use um, the Act in certain ways. But also that it is not intended, advocacy, protest or dissent that is not intended to cause a person's death, well I would have thought that that would be an offence under the code anyway, to cause serious physical harm to a person, uh, once again, to endanger a person's life other than the life of the person not participating in the advocacy, protest or dissent, well I would have thought that that would be an offence, and to create, or to create a serious risk to the health or safety of the public, well I would have thought that that might be the foundation for an offence. But what's missing is any intention to uh, damage, threaten, deprive people of the use of their property. And so I would have thought that uh, that also ought to be a protection recognised and uh, disqualify advocacy, protest or dissent. Otherwise, how do you ascertain in a group what their advocacy, protest or dissent might uh, involve? Maybe the intention of some to participate to cause a person's death, but does that, but not necessarily the stated and official purpose of that particular protest or dissent or advocacy. Does that, uh, how does one sensibly apply this sort of a, an exclusion and protection? So there are a lot of unexplored issues with it, uh, and in the circumstances, although I know what the Honourable Member is aiming at, uh, the Opposition can't support it. But I do have one question that the Minister might be able to assist us with, because the comparison has been drawn, or analogy has been drawn between uh, what is in the Criminal Organisations Control Act and uh, in this bill, is there a material difference between an object and a person, a purpose for an act? The word, purpose, word object, the objects of this act are, is used in this bill, whereas the Criminal Organisations Control Act talks about the purpose. The purposes of this act are, and it sets them out rather than framing them as objects. Uh, Maybe that uh, uh, you can assist us, if only for future reference, whether there's a material difference in the way in those terms. Minister, uh, Chair, I doubt that I can, Honourable Member. I don't have parliamentary counsel here, uh, and uh, while people are furiously texting away, um, but I, I doubt that I'll be able to. But if something comes in, I'll... I'll I'd appreciate it. It's not, not material to... Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, General Michael Mission. Thank you. Look, it's not material to my, um, uh, my views about the clause as it's printed um, or about the proposed amendment, but if at some stage during the course of our consideration of the bill uh, I could get some indication, I'd appreciate it. The Honourable Aaron Stonehouse. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Um, it's been a bit of a funny day today, the last sitting, last day of sitting for the parliamentary term. Um, While well, we're dealing with normally rather non-contentious bills, uh, and I've been uh, out of the Chamber on urgent parliamentary business, but I thought it was worth coming back uh, in consideration of this amendment uh, and putting some words on the record. Um, <clears throat> now, Mr Deputy Chair, I. I, I have a, a great deal of, uh, of, uh, of sympathy for what is trying to be achieved by the Honourable Alison Zamon with this amendment. And I find myself agreeing with part of the, I suppose, policy intent of this amendment. And it's interesting to see, um, and it's something that I've contemplated before, that when, when dealing with uh, unlawful consorting laws, uh, where is it appropriate to draw the line? Uh, when restricting the activities of people who've been uh, convicted of a crime, um, <clears throat> where do we draw the line? And do we draw that line uh, before it begins to interfere with their, uh, shall we say, uh, fundamental democratic rights um, and their right to, 
the right to engage in uh, political activity, their right to protest, their right to organise uh, uh, activism and advocacy. Uh, and it's interesting, of course, you know, there are debates around the world and in other jurisdictions about whether uh, incarcerated prisoners should have a right to vote in elections uh, and things of that nature. Now, I certainly have some reservations about uh, unlawful consorting laws. I have some concerns about the idea of continuing to punish somebody who has already been released from prison, um, who uh, is no longer uh, serving time, uh, who has effectively uh, paid their debt to society. The idea that you would apply an order to them and restrict their activity uh, goes somewhat against uh, our, our normal understanding of uh, how criminal law functions. Once you've, once you've served your sentence, you should be free uh, to live the rest of your life. Uh, however, uh, unless you pose some kind of unreasonable risk uh, to the public. Um, but in this case, we're not necessarily dealing with people that pose unreasonable risks to the public. We're not dealing with dangerous uh, dangerous violent offenders or dangerous sex offenders necessarily, uh, a, whole, a whole other host uh, of crimes uh, may make you the subject of one of these orders. Um, <clears throat> now, the reason why I find this amendment uh, so interesting, uh, the reason why I find it surprising that the, the government uh, is seemingly opposed to this amendment is that there has been discussion about uh, exempting unions from unlawful consorting laws. So on the one hand, you have the government taking a position that, uh, that there are criminals out there who may consort with each other to conspire to commit further crime, and therefore they need to have orders applied against them. But we must make sure that these orders don't unduly interfere with the activities of, uh, of unions, of trade unions and, uh, and organised labour, because there is some kind of fundamental right uh, to organise uh, as workers. And that cannot be infringed upon, even if that means some criminals continue to consort, continue to conspire to commit crimes. There needs to be an exemption there for unions. Uh, it's interesting for the government to take that view, that you have a fundamental right to organise as a worker and join a union and engage in union activity, but you don't have a fundamental right uh, uh, to... Uh, to do the things uh, mentioned here in this amendment. Um, <clears throat> the freedom of a person to participate in advocacy, protest or dissent. Uh, that's really interesting. I, I can see the argument from someone like perhaps uh, the Honourable Michael Mission to say that, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have any exemptions. If, the, if it's going to be this rule, it should be applied uniformly across the board to everybody, regardless of what organisation they join or what, what activities they engage in. Uh, but it is very, very peculiar for the government to take the position that there should be an exemption for organised labour, uh, but there shouldn't be an exemption uh, for what might be called political activity outside of a union. Uh, I find that rather interesting. I, I do have some problems with this amendment, though. Uh, <clears throat> and one of them stems from uh, what I think might be um, uh, some inconsistency applied, uh, perhaps, by the mover of this amendment, or perhaps uh, the Honourable Member's party. <clears throat> uh, I note here the, the wording here is that uh, without der uh, derogation from subsection 1, it is not the intention of Parliament that the powers in this Act be used in a manner that would diminish the freedom of a person in this state to participate in advocacy, protest or dissent that is not intended to A, cause a person's death, of course, that's reasonable to cause persons physical harm, uh, to cause serious physical harm to a person, to endanger a person's life, uh, or to uh, to create a serious risk to the health or safety of the public. What, what I find interesting is would that same standard be applied to those who want to engage or participate in advocacy, protest, or dissent at the front of an abortion clinic? <coughs> well, obviously, it would not. No. Uh, I, I suspect, and I'm sure, I'm sure the mover of the motion can speak for, for herself, but I suspect her and the members of her party, the Greens, uh, do not apply that same standard consistently across the board, and they would not be happy for people to participate in advocacy, protest or dissent at the front of an abortion clinic, uh, which I find rather interesting. Uh, perhaps there is a certain type of advocacy, protest or dissent that is envisioned with this uh, amendment. Perhaps not. I'm only speculating at this point. And uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that'll be clarified in a moment. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, I, I'm trying to assess this, uh, this amendment on its merits. 
I was listening to the comments by the previous speaker. Um, I'm interested, perhaps, to receive some clarification about uh, about the the intent and the consistency of this amendment here. Um, but uh, but I must say that there is perhaps a line. Uh, but, but perhaps the concern here is not so much that there isn't an exemption specifically for political activity. Perhaps the focus should in should instead be uh, on when these when these orders are issued uh, and where it's appropriate to issue these orders. Uh, because you could have foreseeably, and it's the same problem I have with the exemption for unions, you could have foreseeably a, a person who is a subject to one of these orders circumvent that order by doing it uh, as part of uh, their association with a union. And you could also have them circumvent that order by doing it as part of their association uh, with a political party or an advocacy group uh, or something of that nature. You could have two criminals who want to consort and conspire uh, join, I don't know, Extinction Rebellion, uh, and do all their consorting and all their conspiring under the guise of their advocacy uh, for, uh, for climate change. They could attend a rally and they could pass their notes around and they could do it under that, uh, under that, uh, under that protection. Um, so I have that concern there uh, and I, I'm not sure how this amendment would deal with that, but I'm interested to hear more on it. Members, the question is the words to be inserted be inserted. I'll read the amendment before I put the question. Um, so page six after line 22 to insert two. Without derogating from subsection one, it is not the intention of parliament that the powers in this act be used in a manner that would diminish the freedom of persons in this state to participate in advocacy, protest or dissent that is not intended, A, to cause a person's death, B, to cause serious physical harm to a person, C, to endanger a person's life other than the life of the person participating in the advocacy, protest or dissent, or D, to create a serious risk to the health or safety of the public. And the question is the words to be inserted be inserted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. I think the noes have it. Members, we would now return to the question that clause six do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, members, indication of further clauses before nine. Seven. The question is clause seven. Do stand as printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Clause seven is uh, titled Act Binds Crown. This Act binds the Crown, the right of Western Australia, and so, and so far as the legislative power of the Parliament permits the Crown in all its other capacities. Why is it necessary? Why do we need to have a criminal law un unlawful consorting act when it is passed binding the Crown and the right of the state? Yes, uh, so I'm advised it's now 
um, ordinary practice being adopted by parliamentary council. So it was in high risk and serious offenders, for example, I'm told. I'm just trying to see if I can get a bit more advice from parliamentary council, who are not here, uh, about why they consider it necessary to put it in um, all of the, uh, the bills that they're drafting. But um, until I get that, they may not get it because parliamentary council is not here, uh, but that's what I'm advised. Hang on, let's see if I can. This is from Parliamentary Council. Okay, so the advice I have is that it is appropriate to make it clear in legislation whether an act is to bind the, cra the, ca the Crown. In this case, there are various state entities which have powers and duties under the Act. The Honourable Mark Commission. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, okay, uh, well, I'm. And if those persons, agencies, organisations and the like are told under the Act that they can and cannot do things, I would have thought that's enough to bind them. Uh, but I'm still no clearer as to why such a clause is necessary. And uh, I don't have to hand what was in the High Risk Offenders Bill. And what was the other one you mentioned? I'm Just sorry. Just that. High Risk and Serious Offenders was the one example I gave. All right. There, I... And there may well have been others. Just by interjection, Honourable Member, I'm not sure I... I mean, I understand your line of questioning and I understand why you... Why you're, it's a perfectly reasonable question. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get any further information given mm. I don't have parliamentary counsel here. All right. Um, because I was hoping he might also clarify why it is that uh, it's termed as the crown in the right of Western Australia rather than what was, for example, a formula used in Criminal Organisations Control Act, which was the Act binds the state. And so far as the legislative power of Parliament permits the crown in all its other capacities and provides a qualification in subsection 2 of section 5 of that Act. Nothing in this Act makes the Crown in any capacity liable to prosecution for an offence. I mean, we're worried that Her Majesty or the Vice Regal Representative might be consorting with criminals. Um, I, I can understand that, but I'm at a bit of a loss as to why, why it is necessary, even if it may be just standard drafting practice and whether the bill is any any richer for it or whether it'll be affected if it's removed. Um, also, can I make the point, as I did in respect of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, uh, bill that we just dealt with, unfortunately the explanatory memorandum doesn't help at all, it just says this clause provides that the bill binds the Crown and that's exactly the problem that I was trying to highlight, but simply paraphrasing what the clause says is of no use to anyone at all and uh, I appreciate if you could take that back to, to those who uh, manage this, this sort of legislation so that we can get some, clarity, some more information and it might have avoided my need to ask the question in the first place. But is there any concern about it if this, if this clause were not in the bill? Will there be a problem? Chair, thank you. So it does take a little bit to um, reveal uh, and kind of pull the veil away from the mysteries that are Parliamentary Council. But um, this is what I'm advised. Uh, that there's a general presumption of statutory interpretation that statutes do not bind the Crown in the absence of clear words or necessary implication. The High Court in Brofo held that this presumption only provides limited protection, gives way to express or implied intention that legislation binds the executive. To remove uncertainty, it's best for legislation to expressly state uh, whether it binds the Crown, particularly it's particularly important in terms of clarifying whether the Crown uh, can be prosecuted for offences under the Act. Um, uh, Honourable Member, if it, if it assists you at all, I'd ask the question here that I think it's not unreasonable that legislators are given a reason for why a particular form of drafting has been adopted. 
Um, so it is, um, if, I'm, if this is not going to cause too much offence, it is frustrating to me as well. Um, but I'll take the point that you've made and I'll, uh, I'll pass it on as well. General Michael Michel. Thank you. Look, um, and I appreciate the Minister is doing her best with this and, uh, is it, uh, and I can understand why if you're creating rights and obligations that maybe will expose you to litigation, uh, you might want to bind the Crown or exempt the Crown so that it can or cannot be sued or, and the like, but I'm not quite sure how, how that would be necessary in a bill of this character, because we're certainly not going to prosecute the Commissioner of Police or there's no offence creating provision or anything of that character there, there's no, and, and if there was, it would, would specify that sort of liability. So um, yeah, it just seems a little odd to me and uh, one of those conventions perhaps that is, is unnecessary. But, uh, if you can assure me that, um, well, no, you don't have to assure me. Look, I, uh, I'm a little reluctant, but I won't, I won't take an issue with that clause. It's not going to do any harm. If it's not going to do any harm, we would get rid of it and save a, a bit of paper and ink, but uh, I won't make an issue of it. But thank you. Members, the questions of clause 7 do stand as printed or. Ready. The questions of clause seven do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The questions now clause eight do stand as printed. Gentleman Grant. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chairman. Minister, clause eight, sub clause three, provides that the prosecution does not need to provide, not, does not need to prove that the consorting occurred for a particular purpose, or that the consorting would have led to the commission of an offence. And yet a consorting notice cannot be issued for a by a prescribed officer unless the prescribed officer considers that it is appropriate to issue the notice in order to disrupt or restrict the capacity of the convicted offenders to engage in conduct constituting an indictable offence under clause 10, sub clause 2C. Is there an inconsistency between the policy of clause 10 Sub clause 2C and the policy of clause 8, sub clause 3.
Minister. Thank you. Um, so if I take you to 10 2C, so the basis for issuing the notice is set out there. So the officer needs to consider that it's appropriate to issue the notice in order uh, to disrupt or restrict the capacity named in the notice, right? So that the um, consorting has already been given consideration to. The provisions in three mean that when the matter gets to the court, it's already been established that cons the offence is the consorting. It's the breach of the consorting notice that has uh, that is the matter to be um, determined, um, not whether it occur occurred for a particular purpose uh, and not whether it would have led to the commission of the offence, whether it occurred full stop, whether it occurred at all full stop. Gentleman Garan. Minister, I'll just uh, take a look here at uh, clause 10, subclause 2 again, because in this context it's inextricably linked with the question pertaining to clause 8. And note there that it indicates that a prescribed officer may issue an unlawful consorting notice in respect of a person if the person has reached 18 years of age and the person is a convicted offender who has consorted or is consorting with another convicted offender or the officer suspects on reasonable grounds is likely to consort with another convicted offender and the officer considers that it is appropriate to issue the notice in order to disrupt or restrict the capacity of convicted offenders named in the consorting notice to engage in conduct constituting an indictable offence. Now, will it be necessary, in light of what is contained in Clause 8, will it be necessary for the prosecution to demonstrate that the conduct constituted an indictable offence? Minister. Chair, I'm advised no. Gentleman to Karan. And Minister, is that because of clause 8 sub clause 3? Thank you. No, they, they won't have to demonstrate because um, the, um, the offence is, is constituted by the two um, occasions of breaching uh, the notice, not the purpose for which they breached the notice. It's the breaching itself. Gentleman Nicaran. So, Minister, in regards to the issuing of the notice, um, what's the check and balance to make sure that the prescribed officer has issued the notice lawfully?
Minister. So I guess there's a couple. There's a, at a broad kind of um, uh, level, there's the objects clause itself, and there's the fact that only a, an officer of the rank uh, of, uh, of, or, of or above the rank of commander can issue the consorting notice. Um, but if the accused, for example, was to take issue with the validity uh, of, the, uh, of the order, they can argue that in court. It's also the case that there are the provisions uh, where the commissioner can revoke or vary the terms of an order um, if the subject uh, of those orders uh, requests that. So that's effectively a form of um, review or, or appeal. Um, so there's those things that exist at, at the higher kind of policy level, uh, but then at the, at the more practical level, there's the capacity to uh, revoke uh, or vary. Minister, I'll take that further up when we get to, uh, to, to Clause 10. Um, reverting back to the matters under Clause 8, unlawful consorting with convicted offenders, uh, when this bill was uh, before the other place, it was confirmed that the bill itself goes further than the New South Wales consorting laws. Specifically under the current bill, the person must be found to have breached a consorting notice on two or more occasions, but the breaches may relate to separate breaches against separate named individuals in those consorting no notices. Now, as I understand it, under the New South Wales laws, a person commits the offence if the person consorts with at least to other convicted offenders, whether on the same or separate occasions, and the person consorts with each convicted offender on at least two occasions. Now, under the bill that's before us, it only requires consorting with one other person on the notice, not two other persons. The proposed, the proposed WA consorting offence applies if a person subject to a notice consorts with any other person on that notice on two occasions. So in effect, the New South Wales laws require four strikes while the current bill requires two strikes. Now my question, Minister, is why has the government departed from the New South Wales model in this respect? Thank you. Um, so the honourable member um, has looked at uh, New South Wales. You may well have looked at other jurisdictions as well, honourable member. We didn't model our scheme on New South Wales alone. Um, we, we looked police and uh, 
DPP looked at various elements of uh, models in other jurisdictions. One difference between us and the New South Wales model, for example, is we have a higher threshold for issuing the notice in the first place relating to conviction. Um, so you will find that there are differences between the respective jurisdictions uh, and the model that has been uh, developed here and that is <coughs> included uh, in the bill before us now does take um, does match certain elements in certain jurisdictions but not all of them. The Honourable Nick Grant. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Now, Minister, the New South Wales law were subject to a High Court challenge, and they survived that uh, challenge in Tajul and New South Wales 2014, High Court of Australia 35. Now, given that our bill goes further than the New South Wales consorting laws, is the government confident that the current bill will survive a similar High Court challenge? The Minister. Uh, thank you. Yes, I'm advised yes. So we've sought Solicitor General's advice uh, on that question, uh, and the advice is that we're confident that the model we have uh, will meet any test. The Honourable Nick Garan. And Minister, has the government received. Minister. Staff at the table are worried about what I said? No? Okay. okay. Well, I'm going to clarify what I said. Any test in the High Court, not any test anywhere ever in the world about anything. The Honourable Nick Grant. Thanks, uh, Mr Deputy Chairman. Uh, Minister, has the government received any advice about any provisions in this bill that are more susceptible to a challenge in the High Court? Minister. Chair, thank you. So the advice that we have from the Solicitor General that is that this model before us now in the bill now um, is sufficiently close to the New South Wales model uh, to survive uh, any uh, test in the High Court, but also uh, in other elements it is uh, narrower and tighter tests. Um, so on the basis of the combination of those two things, the advice we have is that um, yes, the model we put together in this bill uh, would be sufficient to survive uh, examination in the High Court. Members, the question is that Clause 8 stand as printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. Uh, Minister, note that um, Clause 8 is framed in terms of people who uh, consort contrary to an unlawful consorting notice served on them, but uh, making that a crime, albeit one that can also be dealt with summarily. And uh, unless uh, I've got it wrong, the earlier equivalent provisions in the Criminal Code relating to consorting were merely framed as offences. Uh, why is uh, the course of making a Section 8 offence under this bill, a crime, uh, been, um, been adopted? The Minister. Yes, so given the target of the provisions before us are uh, serious organised crime, the policy judgment was made that the two years provision which exists in the current uh, consorting provisions in the code was not strong enough. The Honourable Michael Mission. 
Uh, thank you, Minister. Look, I appreciate that, but I'm talking about not so much the penalty that's applicable and to which someone might be liable, but the character of the offending. Previously, it was uh, an offence and hence uh, uh, something that would be ordinarily triable summarily before a magistrate. Um, a process that would have been less cumbersome, let's say, less formal than going before a judge and jury on an indictment. Here you've created it as a crime and hence as an indictable offence. We thought if there was a question of simply penalty, it was a matter of just simply increasing the penalty for consorting while leaving it an offence rather than not categorising it as a crime that can also be prosecuted summarily. Um, that's the question I'd like answered. Why was it elevated to being a crime? Uh, for example, it uh, makes it the equivalent Um, it, it makes it the equivalent of an assault causing bodily harm, even though there may not be actually any physical action involved in it other than collaboration. So you're elevating it to that level, making it a crime. I would have thought it would be far more efficient and effective, less expensive and uh, quicker to simply leave it as an offence and increase the penalties. The Minister. Um, I guess, well, I, I partly answered it in my previous answer. I mean, it does reflect the seriousness of the offence, uh, and the penalty means that this will be an arrestable offence. The Honourable Michael Mission. Sorry. Um, would not a penalty of even two years imprisonment make it an arrestable offence? Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, so setting the penalty at imprisonment for five years enlivens the provisions of Part 12, Division 2 of the Criminal Investigation Act <laughs> 2006, which allows a police officer to arrest a person without warrant if the officer reasonably sus suspects that the person has committed, is committing or is about to commit the offence. Making the offence an indictable offence has the effect of removing the time frame specified in the Criminal Procedure 2004 uh, act uh, within which a prosecution must be commenced. Simple offences must be commenced within 12 months of the date on which the offence was allegedly committed, whereas uh, no such limitation exists for indictable offences unless a written law ex specifies other, which this does not. Uh, police intelligence may span several years and the um, offence uh, charged at a later date. The Honourable Michael Mission. OK, so the rationale for making it a crime was to get around the limitation period and for making it five years was to enliven the opportunity to arrest without warrant. I don't have the Criminal Procedure Act or the Criminal Investigation Act in front of me, so I'll... But uh, that's the rationale for those. And my interjection on the and to reflect the seriousness of the crime? No, I accept that, it, uh, that it's serious, uh, but and I'm glad that you pointed that out, or reminded members of that, because it'll have a bearing on something that I'll get to in a moment. But 
serious or the seriousness of the offence could also be reflected by just making, keeping it an offence and prescribing a five-year penalty for it, I would have thought. But anyway, just chosen to do that. I would have thought that uh, over a period of time, if there is an excessive delay of over 12 months before a prosecution is in initiated and there has been no hatching of a criminal act that uh, can be established, then simply the breach of a consorting notice uh, is not likely to carry much of a penalty from attract much of a penalty by a court. But anyway, all right. So those are the two reasons in any event. My next question then is uh, relating to uh, subsection section eight, subsection one, paragraph B. A person consorts with a convicted offender stated in the notice on two or more occasions. Why? Does it have to be at least two occasions? If you're not supposed to consort with someone because you are so dangerous, potentially, that you're going to hatch some criminal plot of such gravity that it attracts five years imprisonment and has to be dealt with on indictment and not be subject to any limitation period, potentially, why wait for two occasions? Minister. Thanks, Chair. So there's a couple of uh, reasons. So uh, this was included on the advice of the Serious Organised Crime Division uh, and the DPP, and based on their uh, experience, I guess, under the current scheme where habitual uh, consorting has been quite difficult to prove. Um, so putting in a number uh, was viewed as being a way to um, make it easier uh, to achieve uh, a successful um, uh, court outcome in that sense, uh, and so that was the reason. Honourable my permission. Thank you. Well, that's, uh, that raises more questions than it answers. I can understand the difficulty in establishing habitual consorting, or uh, because of the use of the word habitual which may have been uh, clarified by case law and experience as uh, something that involves more than one occasion or some accidental or inadvertent communication or uh, being in company with someone. But we've eliminated the concept of habitual, so we've clarified it. We don't need habitual, so that's irrelevant. We're saying that someone is so serious an offender that the fact that, well, that he's with someone that is proscribed, who is also a serious offender, is such a serious risk to public safety that they ought not to be in, their own, in each other's company. Never mind about whether they're getting together to plot crimes or whether they're getting together to decide uh, on uh, uh, what is their favourite brand of coffee? 
doesn't matter. The fact that they get to communicate, the fact that they are in each other's company, the fact that they happen to be in each other's company and not depart would be enough to establish it. But it has to be two occasions. So you get one free. I don't understand why that is necessary and why it doesn't simply say that anyone that consorts with a convicted offender stated in the notice on one or more occasions commits this crime. Um, uh, the relevance of the difficulty of establishing a habitual course of conduct is irrelevant to this. Why don't we just simply one occasion, on, in, on any occasion? The Minister. Further, I am advised no, there's no jurisdiction in Australia uh, that only uh, applies it to one um, event. Um, so this is, a, a, if you like, the practice that's been adopted around Australia is that it's more than one. Um, and the advice from those on the ground doing work in the Serious Organised Crime Division uh, and the DPP people was that uh, the most uh, appropriate way to get the outcome was for two. But there's no jurisdiction in Australia that only does it on one. Now, I appreciate the line of questioning. I understand the line of questioning, but I'm not sure I can take that uh, much further than what I've said already. Members, the question is that Clause 8 stand as printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. All right. Just, just further on from that, which other jurisdictions in their equivalent legislation use the same concepts in order to establish consorting? Uh, the other jurisdictions, ones which use the formula of habitual, uh, which gives rise to that lack of clarity, or uh, are they all now defining an offence, a consorting offence, as requiring two or more occasions? Do, do, have I made myself sufficiently plain on that? I mean, I can understand it if other jurisdictions are talking about habitually or some equivalent form of words rather than a, a number of occasions that uh, they might use as a, uh, as a uh, indicia of consorting that there's two occasions of, of being in company or whatever. But if you're specifying simply a number of occasions that constitutes a breach, are there any others that do it the same way that we are doing it here? The Minister. Thanks, Chair. So the elements of the offence are slightly different in each jurisdiction, but I'll go through them for you. New South Wales, uh, a person other than a person under 14, commits an offence if the person consorts with at least two convicted offenders and the person consorts with each convicted offender on at least two occasions. Queensland, uh, if the person habitually consorts with at least two recognised offenders. Uh, South Australia, uh, if the person consorts with at least two convicted offenders and the person consorts with each convicted offender on at least two occasions. Victoria, uh, they commit an indictable offence if the person associates with an individual on three or more occasions in a three-month period or six or more occasions in a 12-month period. Tasmania, if the person consorts with another convicted offender on at least two occasions within the five-year period after having been given an official warning. The Honourable Mark Commission. Uh, what was the second example that you quoted that simply used the concept of consorting without specifying a Queensland. number of occasions? Queensland. Yeah, I saw it consorting with another offender. So that, that, well, that, that uh, gives rise to the same problem as the habitual thing, working out what consorting means, whether it's simply being in company or something more than that, or whether it's inadvertent or the like. Okay, so. But the, other, uh, the others do seem to have a, a variety of formulas. Uh, does the occasion have to be on two separate days, or can it be on the same day? The, the reason I raise that, Minister, is because we've had debate in the past over, uh, for example, what is a, a multiple murderer? 
and that's got to be on two separate days. I kill someone before midnight, and I kill someone after midnight. I'm a, I'm a multiple murderer. I can kill some if I'm smart enough and I kill them both before midnight, then I'm not. I want to see if the same silliness arises in this, whether two offenders get together several occasions during the course of a day, 24-hour period, they haven't consulted on two or more occasions, or whether they have to do it on separate days. Is there any difficulty with that? The Minister. Thanks, Chair. There's no reference to it being within uh, it having to be on separate days. So it could happen on the same day. The Honourable Mark Commissioner. Okay, and just uh, so that we don't encounter a problem down the track where the police or the DPP have a problem with any of this, is there uh, are you able to assure us that and them that there is no case law that creates a difficulty if the occasions are on several successive instances over a relatively short period of time. For example, if I were to seek out your company, leave the room, go into another room, seek out someone else's company, the breach of an order, then come back to you a couple of minutes later, that that would be considered two occasions rather than part of the one meeting. I understand the question. <coughs> Are we confident there's been no, no cases where that's been demonstrated to be an issue? Is that what you're... Yeah. So there's no, there's no case? The Minister. Thanks, Chair. I'm advised there are not, and I'm advised that there, uh, the occasion does not have to be on the same day, uh, but it may be. Okay, the Honourable my permission. Uh, can be on the same day, can be within a short period of time. Depends, I suppose, as a matter of fact, as to whether there have been more than one meeting or incident of consorting. But there is no bar to to being fairly short periods, if necessary, between those uh, instances of being in company. All right. OK. Anything else on this? <laughs> Members, the question is that Clause 8 stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We're now dealing with clause nine, and I note that there are two amendments on the supplementary notice paper, one in the name of the Honourable Michael Mission and one in the name of the Honourable Alison Zamon. And so the question before the House now is that clause nine stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Graham. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chairman. Just some preliminary questions in respect to clause nine before we dive deep into the amendments on the supplementary notice paper. Minister, clause nine provides a defence where the consorting was between persons uh, who are family members. The family member of a person who is an Indigenous person is defined in Clause 5 sub Clause 2 to include a person who is regarded as a member of the extended family or kinship group of the Indigenous person under the customary law and culture of the Indigenous person's community. Now, this defence, together with the definition of family member in clause 5, subclause 2, is said to safeguard against these new consorting laws from unfairly impacting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, the Attorney General uh, in the other place explained that the 2016 New South Wales Ombudsman's report into that state's consorting laws documented that the New South Wales consorting law was used against. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and that this should be avoided. Now, Minister, it's not uh, evident how this goes in any way to address the broader issue of consorting laws and their impact on members of our Indigenous communities, that being Clause 9 as currently drafted. Uh, can you explain how 
WA's current consorting laws impact people of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent that will be remedied by these particular provisions? The Minister. Thanks, Lord, you raised this question, as did somebody else, I think, in the second reading debate, and it did reply in the second reading debate, um, <clears throat> and set out the reasons why the government has taken this course of action. That includes um, that as uh, a, a function of history and dispossession, uh, that Indigenous people are, are disproportionately uh, represented uh, in the justice system. That means more of them are likely to have a conviction and therefore more likely uh, to be captured uh, by uh, consorting provisions because it's more likely that members of their family uh, will, uh, will, be, uh, will have a conviction. Um, so uh, I explained that in my second reading reply. That's the, uh, I guess, the policy um, issue that the, that the government was trying to uh, respond to, noting uh, the, uh, the work that had been identified in reports from other jurisdictions like the one that you referred to. <coughs> the Honourable Nick Grant. Now, Minister, the, you are correct in saying that uh, I touched on this matter in my um, second reading speech. Um, but what I didn't ask in my second reading speech is, and what, what I'm asking now is, whether Western Australia's current consorting laws have impacted upon Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, the response that you provided seems to be a, a quantitative one, effectively utilising the statistics or proportion of Aboriginal people who are in the criminal justice system as a explanation as to how they might be impacted by current consorting laws. However, that's not the heart of my question. The heart of my question is encapsulated by what the Attorney-General said during the debate in the other place. He is the one who drew to members' attention the 2016 New South Wales Ombudsman's report, and he's the one who indicated that in New South Wales those laws were being used against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, inverted commas, used against. Now, is it the case that the, our Western Australian current consorting laws are being used against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the sense that they are being used um, improperly, inappropriately, disproportionately, uh, unfairly? Are they being used in the way that the New South Wales Ombudsman's 2016 report was concerned in New South Wales? Or are we able to distance ourselves entirely from the New South Wales uh, operations and say, no, everything in Western Australia in that respect has been uh, fair and equitable? The Minister. Thanks, Chair. Um, so there isn't a report uh, reflecting Western Australian data uh, or consideration of um, particular circumstances in particular geographic areas, for example, of Western Australia, where we might say, and here is the matching evidence for Western Australia. So no, there is no similar report as was done in New South Wales. Um, but you would have to look at the experience of dispossession and racism and uh, disproportionate um, representation in the justice system in New South Wales and say it would be hard to believe that it would be better in Western Australia, uh, given our history. Probably at best it's around about the same, but there may even have been elements in history over time where in Western Australia it was worse. But I don't, I don't, if, if the member is looking for me to provide him with a report, a set of data that demonstrates the exact impact, where, when and how and what numbers in Western Australia, I don't have that. The Honourable Nick Graham. Mr Deputy Chairman. Uh, so, Minister, it would appear from reading the 2016 New South Wales Ombudsman's report in New South Wales consorting laws that the issue is not so much in the drafting of the 
legislation but in the use of police powers in issuing the notices. Now I note at page 63 of that report that it says there is no specific reference to the use of the new consorting law in relation to Aboriginal people in the consorting standard operating procedures. Uh, can you advise the House whether the West Australian Police adopt a form of consorting standard operating procedures which make specific reference to the vulnerability of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people under these laws beyond merely referring to kinship ties amongst Indigenous people? Chair. The Minister. Thank you. So I'm advised in Western Australia that WA Police are in the process now um, of developing a procedures manual uh, to deal with this and that as part of developing that they are looking at uh, the uh, New South Wales Ombudsman's report and the recommendations therein and the references therein to uh, police uh, standard operating procedures I think is how you describe them. The Honourable Nick Graham. Okay, so that's a work in progress. Uh, this may then answer my following question, which is when I look at that report, I note that in the Western region, the police in New South Wales report states that among other strategies, they most commonly use the consorting law in relation to drug, theft, robbery and break and enter offences. And in some local area commands, consorting was valued as providing an additional proactive tool that could be used to approach and engage individuals. However, others advised us that the existing police powers, such as conducting bail compliance checks, search powers and move on directions, provided more effective and less cumbersome proactive tools. That's found at page 64 of the New South Wales Ombudsman's 2016 report. My question, Minister, is will West Australian Police apply existing police powers wherever possible and use these new consorting laws as a last resort, particularly in relation to Indigenous persons? And if the answer to that is yes, what will be the mechanism to direct West Australian Police officers in this way? The Minister. Thanks, Chair. So the objects, remember we had a discussion about the objects of this Act a bit earlier. The objects of this Act, the policy intent of this Act, is as a tool to deal with you know, serious organised crime. So to that extent, the characterisation that you, said, that you referred to um, is correct in that this would be... Uh, I, don't, I don't even think it's correct to say last resort because it would be the first resort in respect to serious organised crime and consorting. Um, but it's not one of the tools that uh, is intended for police to use as a kind of general way of, uh, you know, perhaps um, breaking up antisocial um, behaviour in the community. It is about tackling serious organised crime. The Honourable Nick Grant. Well, Minister. Um this notion of serious organised crime, I'm not sure that that's um, defined or even appears anywhere. I don't uh, have the time. It's certainly not a defined term when I look at page 34 of the bill. My interjection. I mean, that was, that's my that's shorthand language. I was referring to the, you know, the, the stated purpose that's set out in the object. Yes, OK. Well, the objects are stated in Clause 6, as you quite rightly identify, and it says the objects of this Act are to disrupt and restrict the capacity of convicted offenders to organise, plan, support or encourage the carrying out of criminal activity. Now, the provisions of this bill are uh, extraordinary, 
I use the word extraordinary in the context that uh, we know from other jurisdictions that these type of extraordinary restrictions on people's free, ordinary freedoms and liberties have been the subject of High Court challenge. And you will recall from an earlier debate that I certainly had a view that given the seriousness of the restrictions that we should be uh, imposing an organisation like the Corruption and Crime Commission as the oversight body. And it's uh, given, and it's because of those reasons and uh, the severity of the laws that we need to make sure that Western Australian police officers are using them as a last resort where other existing police powers are not uh, able to be used or might be ineffectively used. And that's why I've asked whether there would be a mechanism to direct police officers in that way. Now, Minister, I want to ask one further question in respect to clause 9, sub-clause 1. You'll be aware that this clause <coughs> has three sub-clauses. I do have questions in regards to uh, sub-clauses 2 and 3, but I know that there is a number of other members who have an interest in clause 9 generally, so I'll just ask this question and then um, pause at that point. With respect to clause 9, sub-clause 1, it provides that it is a defence to a charge of a crime under section 8.1 to prove that the consorting was A, between persons who are family members and B, reasonable in the circumstances. What type of consorting might be considered reasonable in the circumstances to provide a successful defence against the charge of unlawful consorting? The Minister. Chair, yeah, thank you. Um, so, example I've been given, Honourable Member, uh, is uh, consider two brothers subject to a consorting notice who are responsible for the care, uh, perhaps, of their elderly parents. It would be considered reasonable that the brothers would need to consort with each other to discuss a care plan or living arrangements for their uh, parents. However, reasonableness still sets a threshold test. It may not be reasonable for those same two brothers to go on a holiday together or inter travel interstate together to participate in a run. And by run, I don't mean marathon, I mean bikey run, uh, where they go, you know, travel together in packs. And I hope using that language doesn't attract them to my house or anything like that. Members, the question is that clause nine stand is printed. The Honourable Michael Mission. Um, thank you. Yeah, look, um, reasonable in the circumstances um, is a very broad concept, and I take the Minister's um, example. Um, and wonder whether or not there may be other specific defences that would allow for such a thing, bearing in mind that the defence is so broad 
as uh, to cover family members and reasonableness in the circumstances when you've got also a defence where the consorting is in the, the course of a variety of activities that are specified, including it being necessary in the circumstances, not even reasonably necessary in the circumstance, but necessary. Um, let's say we have two brothers, as you say, that haven't seen each other for a while. Need to get, want to get together for a meal. Is that not reasonable in the circumstances, just to make an acquaintance and reacquaint each other with, uh, with family members, even in the company of other family members? Family reunion. The minister. Uh, Chair, so it would be a matter of the facts, the particular facts, and so the purpose of the catching up, how regularly they catch up. The example that I gave in response to the Honourable uh, Nick Goran, for example, is where they shared responsibility for the care of elderly parents. So it's not, it's, it may not necessarily be the case uh, that it is deemed reasonable for them just to catch up and have dinner, but depending on the particular circumstances, um, if that was about planning the rosters for the care of their parents, maybe that would be. But it is, I mean, you know, it is not possible for me to prescribe in exactly what circumstances uh, what will constitute the test of reasonableness or not. It is going to depend on the particular facts. The Honourable Michael Hishman. This is where the problem arises. The current consorting laws may not be satisfactory. And part of the difficulty with consorting laws is to try and draw the line as to what is acceptable or unacceptable conduct, bearing in mind that the purpose or the object is to minimise, I'll quote the, the object is to disrupt and restrict not, not the organisation of criminal activity, but the capacity of convicted offenders to organise, plan, support or encourage the carrying out of criminal activity. That's the blanket objective. And yet, we have a defence if the convicted offenders are members of the same family, and in the case of Indigenous offenders, whatever may be regarded as an extended family or kinship group, very, very broad, and is reasonable in the circumstances. Let's say the, uh, let's draw on the godfather, right? Vito Corleone decides that he wants to have a family reunion because he's getting a little old. And Michael Corleone has been off to war and he wants to have all the, a family together. Why is that unreasonable in the circumstances? The Minister. Well, Member, I can, I can appreciate um, uh, wanting to test the question of what is reasonableness or not, but I really I don't think it serves uh, much purpose because it is going to depend on the particular circumstances uh, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to assist you and I, I'm not sure that it's a useful use of our time to explore kind of every possible variation that might exist. Um, it is going to depend on the particulars of, of that particular uh, matter at the time. Honourable my permission. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. Look, I, I accept, Minister, that can't canvas everything and uh, there are certain uh, variations on, on facts that might make a material difference, but we're looking at something that at one view, on one view is a, a, a significant, a very profound limitation on people's ability to seek out or accept other people's company, to communicate them, uh, with other people. Uh, simply on the basis of their having had convictions of certain types without any need to prove what the purpose of their collaboration or company may be, 
but as a blanket rule, the risk is too high, too high that they will be up to mischief and it needs to be stopped. And yet, the risk, albeit that high, that the Commissioner can say, you two aren't allowed to, to see each other or communicate with each other or stay in each other's company, unless, of course, you're family members, crime family, albeit, and it's reasonable, and we're offering no guidance as to what may or may not be reasonable. And we're compounding that by qualifying that alleged risk by saying that there's an even broader scope if you happen to be Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. And we'll get to those defences in a little while. But you're having on the one hand saying this is wholly unacceptable, the risk is enormous. We're talking about child sex offenders, people convicted of an indictable offence, it's a pretty low threshold, but an indictable offence. The risk is so high that the Commissioner can issue a notice and saying, you two, you three, whatever, not allowed to be anywhere near each other, stay away, on at least two occasions at least up to two occasions, stay away. And yet, on the basis of someone's ethnicity, on the basis of someone's race, there's an ex there's a, that is more important than the risk to the public or to particular people. And indeed, there are even more qualifications that if you're family members and it's reasonable in the circumstances, whatever that might be, and we'll leave it to someone else to decide, uh, you, you, you may have a defence to it. I just find that it's, it's a little too loose. And uh, while I accept that we can't explore every possibility, surely the government has some parameters in mind, some concept of what may or may not be reasonable or acceptable or unacceptable, because we're letting police officers here take the burden of deciding that. So I put it again, you have the Corleone family getting together for a family reunion. Is it something that you would expect the police would say, that's not acceptable because you're breaching your, con non uh, your unlawful consorting notice? knowing what we do of that particular family from uh, the movies. I mean, is that an acceptable risk? Is that a reasonable in the circumstances that they get together for a Christmas dinner or a family reunion? Has the government got a view on that sort of thing, that it would be something that ought to be stopped or that it's fair enough? The Minister. Um, I understand. Uh, the question that's been put to me, but I'm, I'm, as I've said already a couple of times, I'm not able to take it any further because we could go down a whole uh, rabbit hole with one uh, particular scenario of uh, versions of the Corleone family and others, and that, would, that could be entirely meaningless because it is going to depend on the particular circumstances. So I'm not able to assist the member on this issue any further. The Honourable Michael Mission. All right. Well, I fear that uh, some of the, the good work that's been gone into this is, is going to be simply unenforceable. You mentioned on several occasions that uh, we're dealing with very serious organised crime. You've taken um, uh, the Honourable Nick Garan did ask uh, about where that is to be found in, in the bill, and you did say that that was... My short. Your shorthand for it. But, but, of course, it's, we're not talking about serious organised crime at all, unless you consider any combination of two people planning something as organised crime. It can be two burglars planning to, who have uh, knocked a place off in the past, might find themselves subject to an unlawful consorting notice. Wouldn't that be right? The Minister. Honourable Member, I, I tried by way of interjection with the Honourable Nick Goyran to just to make the point, um, and it was you know probably inelegant on, on my part in the, in the use of language. I was just using a shorthand. The Honourable Member was asking me a question 
um, about uh, you know, whether this could be used as a tool, um, to, to paraphrase, whether this could be used as a tool against Aboriginal people, mm -hmm. for example. And I was making the point that the purpose of this act is not, a, is not the same as a general kind of tool to be used for the purpose of dealing with you know, antisocial behaviour, for example, which is what uh, the kind of move on laws that the Honourable Member was using in his example have been used for in the past. So um, please don't misinterpret my shorthand language. Um, the, the object of the, of the bill, as the Honourable Nick Goyran then pointed out, is quite clear, but it is targeted. The, point, all, the only point I was trying to make it is this is targeted at something different than the other a kind of range of, uh, of tools that the Honourable Nick Goyram was referring to in the example he was putting to me. So I withdraw that language. I was not trying to, to uh, suggest that this was a bill specifically targeted at serious organised crime. I was using um, sloppy language to try and make the point that there is a specific objective of this legislation and that that is the purpose it would be used for. The Honourable Michael uh, uh, yeah, look, uh, Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. Look, uh, Minister, don't misunderstand me. I'll, I'll, I understand what you were saying and uh, you know, I, I wasn't holding you to that language uh, as, a, as a term of art. But on reflecting on the debate in the other place, that's the sort of language that was being used by the Attorney-General organised you know, uh, outlaw motorcycle gangs. Um, you know, organised crime has no business being in places like the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. That's why there doesn't have to be an exception to that. Um, he, he speaks entirely the purpose that what this will be focused on is motorcycle gangs and things at that level. And let's assume, well, if that is right, if we are talking about outlaw motorcycle gangs, that level of criminality, or if we're talking about child sex offender rings, that level of criminality, it doesn't sit well with making exceptions on the basis of ethnicity, because you are worried that some people in the past, as a group, and their ancestors may have been the subject to uh, oppressive laws, been unfairly treated, or are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Something is either serious enough a threat on the basis of behaviour and risk that it needs to be stopped, or it ain't. And that's where I have a bit of a difficulty with the philosophy of the bill. Now, if you have in the bill, for example, a structure where the ombudsman is meant to be overseeing the operation of this and being able to make exceptions, uh, sorry, uh, make representations to the Commissioner of Police about whether uh, the provisions are being used properly, fairly, in a balanced way, and so on, that seems to be where you start looking at the question of whether a particular demographic is being unreasonably targeted, not by making exceptions for them to make it easier to wriggle out of the consequences and the risk of their previous actions and the risks that they pose to the community. So, Bearing in mind, of course, um, what a convicted offender means. Maybe the, the bar is being set too low. A person against whom a conviction has been recorded for one or more of the following, an indictable offence. That can be anything from assault doing bodily harm on one occasion all the way through to murder or drug dealing drug and the like. Child sex offence, fair enough. An indictable offence against the law of the Commonwealth, very broad an offence against the law of the Commonwealth that if committed in a state would constitute a child sex offence. Very broad, but fair enough. And something uh, akin in uh, other states and territories. So the threshold for being eligible is very low. 
but your defences seem to be very, very broad to get around them. And some of them, it seems to me, are unreasonably based on something that ought not to be a consideration in the, in, uh, the realm of public safety, other than to relieve people of the consequences of what may have happened to others in the past. Anyhow, um, I take it that the uh, defence is then in subsection 2A1 of engaging in a lawful occupation, trade or profession is to not impede people's rehabilitation, notwithstanding that they are such a risk to everyone else that they ought not to be hanging around together. Um, is that... Uh, permits criminals at this level to set up a business, a partnership, say a lawn mowing round. The Minister. Thank you. So if we're going to go into another round of me trying to give you a prescriptive list of what will and will not be considered uh, to meet uh, those defences. I can't do it, honourable member. It, it may mean they set up a, a, law, a lawn mowing business. It may mean they, they cannot, that to do so would not be uh, deemed a reasonable defence in the circumstances. It is going to depend on particular facts. The honourable Michael Mission. Okay. Member, do you want to move your motion to amend? Yes, uh, I think that uh, it's probably a suitable time to do that. Mr Deputy Chair, I uh, move the amendment standing in my name in respect of Clause 9 on Supplementary Notice Paper 161, Issue Number 4, at Serial 36, Oblique 9, to the effect that on page 8 of the bill, lines 22 to 27 be deleted. Now, currently... Member, um, I'll just put the question and then we can speak to your amendment. Members, the Honourable Michael Mission has moved that at 36 oblique 9, page 8, line 22 to 27, to delete the lines. And so the question before the House is that um, the uh, lines to be deleted be deleted. The Honourable Michael Mission. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, Currently, just to put it into a context, proposed section nine is a, a set of defences. Subsection one, as we've dealt with, is a defence uh, to a charge under section eight, subsection one, that the consorting was between persons or family members and reasonable in the circumstances. We haven't had a great deal of uh, fleshing out of what may or may not be reasonable as indicia of what the government regards as acceptable or unacceptable consorting in the circumstances. I accept that uh, it's going to depend on the, on the facts of the particular case um, and uh, the intentions perhaps as well. Subsection 2 makes it a defence to a charge to prove that the consorting and presumably uh, that can be one or more instances that count towards the unlawful consorting which requires two or more instances in order to negate one, one instance, one occasion. And it sets out in paragraph A a series of um, uh, nine circumstances. The one that I'm focusing on at the moment is circumstance uh, eight, which says that reading it in context, that the consorting, it's a defence to a charge of a crime under section 8.1 to prove that the consorting occurred in the course of one or more of the following. Activities undertaken by members of an organisation of employees registered under the Industrial Relations Act 1979 Part 2 Division 4, or the Fair Work Registered Organisations Act 2009 Commonwealth 
for the purposes of the business of the organisation. Now I'll get back to the objectives that are said to motivate and direct this particular bill, its objects, which is to not stop, merely stop the organisation. Uh, order member, noting the time, I shall leave the chair until the reading of the bills. Position. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, which some is given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. One, has Lottery West received any training from the Equal Opportunity Commission since March 2017? Two, yes to one, on what dates and which employees and or board members received the training? Leader of the House. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, no. Two, not applicable. Leader of the Opposition. None of them estimates, but never mind. Right, a question without notice, which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Planning. Uh, I refer to the single access roads to Gracetown in the south west and I ask one, what fire uh, management plan is in place to ensure residents have an alternative uh, way to exit the town in case of a fire emergency this summer? Two, are any plans for a second uh, for a, are there any plans for a second access road? If not, why not? Three, if yes to two, at what stage of the plans will that way they be finalised? And four, what other options, if any, are being considered? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Planning. One, a fire management plan is the responsibility of the local government. Two, yes. Three to four, six alignment options have been considered for Gracetown. The recommended option of a 4,400 metre north-south inland road that extends from Salter Street to Ellenbrook Road Ellen Brook Road has the endorsement of the steering group. It is not, however, supported by the Shire of Augusta Margaret River, who opposed it for environmental reasons. The Shire has resolved not to endorse the recommendation. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, President, and, um, my question, of which some notice has been given, is directed to the Leader of the House representing the Attorney General. Given that the position of full time Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission has been vacant since 28 April this year because the government had chosen not to appoint either of the two candidates recommended by the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission as suitable for appointment, one, to what extent has the lack of a full time Commissioner significantly disrupted or compromised operational activities? Two, provide evidence to support those assertions. Three, have you since April asked for or received any further reports from the Commission of its own going? ongoing or emerging investigations, and if so, when and for what purpose? And four, have any investigations pursued when the Honourable John McEchnie QC retired as Commissioner been discontinued or compromised solely by reason of his not having been reappointed, and if so, why? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. Uh, I do thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question, but I am astonished that you would want to be asking about the Triple C today. Um, one to four. The government continues to support the Honourable John McKechnie QC, who was considered by the nominating committee to be the outstanding candidate for the role of Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission. Order. Given his integrity and professional experience, including the roles of Director of Public Prosecutions, a Senior Judge of the Supreme Court of Western Australia, and most recently as Commissioner of the Triple C. The nominating committee comprised the Chief Justice of Western Australia Australia, the Chief Judge of the District Court and a Community Representative. The Government, in its dealings with the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission and the Liberal Party on this critical appointment, maintains its strong support for Mr McKechnie QC. The Honourable you, order. You are tone order. Deaf. Order. Order. I would really like to give the call to the Honourable Donna Farragher, who I'm sure has got a very interesting question to pose. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has are we ready? Mm. Um, has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Lands. I refer to the former Swan District Hospital site and I ask, can the, minister conf can the Minister confirm the Government's intent for the future of this site and does it impact on the application previously lodged with the City of Swan to rezone the site from public purpose hospital to special use residential R60 private clubs and public open space? 
Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, I just uh, draw your attention to the fact that this was asked on the 11th of November, so it's current as at that date. It's, I, I'm aware of some changes since then. Uh, the former Swan District Hospital site has been committed to the Noongar uh, Budget Trust as part of the Noongar Land Estate under the South West Native Title Settlement on the basis it seeks to deliver an aged care outcome on portion of the site. This does not, not impact the application previously lodged with the City of Swan. Honourable Nick Garan. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for the Environment representing the Treasurer. I refer to answer to question without notice number 1267, and I ask one, why is the $291.1 million funded in legal fees not being recouped from the Bell litigation settlement sum and retained or repaid to the Insurance Commission of Western Australia? Two, of the $665.4 million received by ICWA, how much is being paid to the government? And three, further to two, by what statutory mechanism, please name the section of the Act, is ICWA lawfully able to pay this specific sum to the government? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam mm -hmm. President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Treasurer. One, the amount spent on the Bell litigation were expressed. The amount spent uh, on the Bell litigation was expressed. It was expensed in each year. The costs were incurred. Uh, in determining dividends to be transferred to government, the Insurance Commission's board takes into account its net profit after tax, solvency and capital adequacy requirements. Tax payments are made in line with the national tax equivalent regime. Two, $655.4 million is expected to be paid to the government. Three, sections 28 and 29 of the Insurance Commission of Western Australia Act 1986 and the national tax equivalent regime provide the mechanisms for the payment of dividends and tax equivalent payments. The Honourable Jackie Boydell. Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to an article published by WA Today on the 25th of November titled Prison Officer Suspended Over Fraud Allegations Gets a $100,000 Government Grant for Pilbara Tours. And I ask, one, will the Minister explain the local and government due diligence process for checking the accountability and credibility of the applicants for regional economic development grants? Two, given that the application is now in doubt, what will happen to the $100,000 allocated uh, towards that grant uh, if it's not given to the original recipient? And three, given that the role of the local development commissions is to bring the element of local knowledge and content to the process, and there was media coverage of this issue prior to the grant round closing, yet the issue was still missed. Will the minister undertake to restoring development commissions to staffing levels that will allow them to undertake their role more effectively? Good question. Minister for Regional Development. The member for the uh, question. The applications for REDS grants uh, require applicants to provide details of all partners, directors and senior management in the business who are uh, applying for a grant. In this instance, a sole director was listed and this was not the person referred to in the WA Today article. Accountability and credibility of, list of, of the listed applicants is taken, is determined using local knowledge and where relevant credit checks are also undertaken. In the Pilbara, the assessment of applications involves up to three assessors providing comment on the suitability of the project and the proponent. The full application as well as an overview of the project and recommendations from the assessors are then presented to the Board of Commission for final approval. Two, any, un any unallocated grant funds are made available for future red grant rounds. We now understand that Ms Vandenberg uh, had stood down from the management of the company prior to the Commission or myself becoming aware of the uh, charges. Uh, I note that the project was assessed very highly by the Commission for its potential economic benefits, including long-term tourism jobs for Aboriginal people on the borough. Three, applications to round three red grants closed on 7 July and the, and the assessment of the applications began on the 8th of July. The Commission is unaware of any Reedy reports uh, naming the person identified in the article prior to the 12th of August. There are currently eight staff in the Commission's Carrather office, which is similar to the staffing levels under the previous government. Um, the member will be aware that under the previous government, much of the Pilbara Development Commission staff were based in Perth. 
I note the Commission's recent stakeholder survey with over 100 responses showing very positive results across all indicators, suggesting uh, they are well engaged and well regarded in the Pilbara. The Honourable Colin Holt. Thanks, Madam President. My question is some of those has been given is the Minister for Regional Development. I referred a question without notice 1318 asked on the 24th of November, and I ask one, what role does the Minister for Regional Development play in the market led proposal process? Two, has the Minister played any role in assessing or presenting the Bustleton Jetty? MLP application? If so, what has been her involvement? Three, the proponent has been told that the proposal has been on the Minister for Regional Development's desk now for nine months, waiting for her to take it to Cabinet. A, is this true and what has been the hold up in taking it to Cabinet? And B, why has the assessment and lack of notification of the Bustle and Jenny MLP failed the Steering Committee's own 99 day notice period? Minister for Regional Development. Under the market-led proposal guidelines, the lead agency minister is responsible for presenting a cabinet submission on the findings of the market-led proposal steering committee. Uh, my involvement in the assessment of the Bustleton Jetty Incorporated application process has been consistent with the guidelines. Three, I acknowledge that this process, this proposal, has not progressed as quickly as the proponent would have liked. However, as per the terms of the MLP policy, I'm not in a position to disclose information on the process. The Honourable Rick Mazza. Thank you, Madam President. Um, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emergency Services. I refer to the November 12, 2020 Farm Weekly article, Government Agrees with Most Fire Recommendations, in which the Minister said the State Government will seek to undertake a review of communication capabilities in the Esperance region and investigate flexible and mobile solutions that provide digital radio communications and enhance Wi-Fi and phone coverage. He added the State Government recognised that current technology is limited in its capacity to service growing demand, so I ask one. When will the review into Esperance communications capabilities commence? Two, how long will the review last? And three, in the meantime, what is the Government doing to improve communication capabilities in the Esperance region. Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. One, the review and identification for an additional radio repeater site in the Esperance North East region is currently underway. Two, the review is scheduled for completion in June 2021, with works to commence in the 2021-22 financial year. Three, the State Government is enhancing emergency communications networks across the state. In partnership with DBCA, an additional radio repeater was installed at Peak Charles in June 2020 to improve radio communications in the northern part of the Esperance local government area. DFES is testing, uh, testing upgrading mobile satellite capabilities to improve communications in remote areas. The Commonwealth Government has primary responsibility for telecommunications. The State Government has raised with the Commonwealth the need for improved telecommunications in WA. DFES is currently working with NBN and the Strengthening Telecommunications Against Natural Disasters program to install satellite-based Wi-Fi services at 21 community evacuation centres, local government buildings and emergency services buildings in high-risk isolated communities by December 2020, with a further 55 locations across the state to receive satellite services in 2021. Aaron my question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Local Government, Heritage, Culture and the Arts. I refer the Minister to the response he gave in the other place on the 4th of April 2019 in relation to the Local Government Act review, and specifically to his comments that the Government intended to, and I quote, create a green bill that we can further consult on before we bring landmark reform legislation to Parliament in the near future. Given that 18 months have passed, and we are now heading into an election in which jobs and local economy will be central. And given that the local government sector now accounts for approximately $4 billion of economic throughput across, the, across Western Australia each year, I ask, one, what stage is the Green Bill currently at? And two, since it will not now be tabled prior to Parliament rising, is the Minister able to table at least an executive summary of its proposed provisions so that the electors of Western Australia know what they can expect in this space from any future government of which he or his colleagues might be a part? Leader of the House. The Honourable Member, for some notice of the question, one to two, the details of the Local Government Green Bill will be provided when the bill is finalised and released for public consultation. The Honourable Colin Tinknell. Question without notice, of which some notice is given. This is to the Minister for Regional Development regarding Collie Industrial Land. In reference to a question without notice, 1295 on the 11th of November, 
noting a land reference in the answer, the shot strategic industrial area is available for mining related industry only. The land in Kemerton is not within the Shire of Collie and the land in Collie Light industrial area is not available for heavy industry. Noting this government's stated commitment to diversifying the economy of Collie region, one I ask, can the minister outline what plans the government has, if any, to address the land, the lack of land available in the Collie Shire for either lease or purchase for the operation of job creating heavy industry not directly relating to mining sector. Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question. And member, um, some months ago, the uh, uh, Collie Steering Committee resolved, uh, and I think uh, had that uh, approved by Cabinet, uh, to proceed to change uh, the, uh, the zoning for uh, that heavy industrial site. So, so currently it uh, is just related. Uh, it needs to be a coal-related heavy industry. Uh, and we are now going through that process of advertising the change to the uh, local planning scheme, because we agree that there, it should not be limited uh, to coal. So that process is um, underway at the moment, and the comment period uh, closes on the 18th of January. Um, but of course, if anyone in the meantime is applying and looking at that, we are going to be treating this as if that is uh, that has already gone. Um, uh, in addition, the South West Development Commission has uh, commissioned an engineering and assessment for current and potential industrial land in and around Collie. Uh, the assessment seeks to identify the current capability and constraints on industrial land, including access to water, power, wastewater, and to inform the potential industry attraction and development strategies. And uh, that additional, which has been going on for some time, uh, is also due to be completed in January 2021. Uh, and, uh, and as the member would be aware, we have already invested, um, um, uh, I would say, in excess of uh, uh, $50 million in that diversification project and, and some of those that are showing great success, in particular uh, the West Track uh, um, Pearsontini propose a project, um, but there are many more underway. The Honourable Alison Zamon. And my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Environment. I refer to the request the Minister made in 2018 that the EPA review the implementation conditions regarding greenhouse gases on the Wheatstone Development Ministerial Statement 873 and Gorgon Gas Development Ministerial Statement 800, and I ask one. Can the Minister please advise when each of these reports are expected to be completed? Two, will the Minister please confirm that these reports will both be released in full to the public upon completion? And three, will the Minister commit to requiring these projects comply with any any recommendations the EPA might make regarding greenhouse gas emission reductions. Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. One, the Environmental Protection Authority, EPA, published its report on its inquiry into Condition 26 of Ministerial Statement 800 for the Gorgon Gas Development Revised and Expanded Proposal in September 2019. Ministerial, Ministerial Statement 1136 was subsequently released in May 2020. With regard to my request for an inquiry into Ministerial Statement 873 for Wheatstone development, I am advised that the EPA is still conducting its inquiry and is expecting to report in mid-2021. Two, yes, the Environmental Protection Act 1986, the EP Act, requires that EPA reports on inquiries made under Section 46 are published. Three, for the Wheatstone development, I will consider the EPA's advice and recommendation and consult with other decision-making authorities in accordance with the EP Act before making my decision on the implementation conditions. This is the statutory process that was followed in issuing Ministerial Statement 1136 for the amendment to Condition 26 for the Gorgon Gas Development Revised and Expanded Proposal. The Honourable Tim Clifford. President, my question about notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister uh, for the Environment representing the Minister for Transport. And I ask one, could the Minister advise how the McGowan Government plans to transition the Transperth bus fleet to full electric? Um, or does the McGowan Government policy still stand as per question about notice 127 that the Government has no plans to transition the fleet away from diesel? And two, could the Minister advise how the recent 10-year contract with Volvo to supply 900 diesel buses 
for the Transperth fleet is in line with the McGowan government's aspiration of net zero emissions by 2050. Minister for the Environment. Madam President, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Transport. One, on the 2nd of July 2020, the McGowan government announced that a trial of electric buses will be undertaken on the Joondalup cart route. Work is currently underway to upgrade the Joondalup depot to facilitate this trial, which is expected to commence from early 2022. Following this trial, further decisions can be made as to the deployment of further electric buses. 2A, not applicable. 2, sorry, 1A, not applicable. 2, as per the 2nd of July 2020 media statement, the contract allows for the provision of alternative technology. The Honourable Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister of the Environment representing the Treasurer. I refer to the 2018-19 to 2020-21 mini boom of iron ore royalties and ask, one, what is the current spot price of iron ore as measured by the government? Two, what, iron ore, what amount of iron ore royalty income has the government received for 2021 financial year to date? Three, how much higher is the answer to two than the income that would have been received if the iron ore price had averaged 2021 budget price of US $96.60 a tonne? And four, has the government modelled the fiscal impact of an iron ore price over 100 US dollars a tonne for 2021, or would such an assumption be considered highly unrealistic? Minister for the Environment. President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, uh, US 127.85 cents per tonne. Two, an update will be provided in the, in the 2020-2021 mid-year review. Three, see response to question two. Four, the honourable member does not seem to understand the key but basic point that iron ore prices are highly volatile. Yeah. As the honourable member has been informed on previous occasions, this government makes no apologies for its conservative revenue assumptions. It will not repeat the mistakes of the previous Liberal national government in assuming high revenue assumptions when there is a very high level of uncertainty. It was this reckless approach that delivered nine budgets with nine cash deficits, totalling $27.8 billion. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Well President, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to the annual report 2019-20 of the Regional Development Trust and ask one, has the Trust provided advice to you in 2019-20 or from 1 July 2020 to date under the Section 12A? of the Royalties for Regions Act 2009, if so, please table that advice. Two, have you sought the advice of the Trust in 2019-20 or from 1 July 2020 to date under Section 12B of the Royalties for Regions Act 2009, if so, please table the request and the advice received. Three, I refer to the membership of Ms Gail Reynolds-Adamson on the Trust satisfying Section 13 1A of the Act and noting that Ms Reynolds-Adamson only attended one of five Trust meetings in 2019-20 but still received her full remuneration of $11,309.83. What explanation can be provided for this? And four, how are regional development commissions being adequately represented on the Regional Development Trust in these circumstances? The Minister for Regional Development. Uh, thank the um, member for the question uh, and uh, uh, advise that um, no formal advice has been requested or provided, but the chair of the trust has kept me abreast of, uh, of their uh, activities, and the trust uh, certainly continues to lead a greater collaboration across the regional development portfolio, uh, including the alignment of strategic themes and planning. This uh, a greater degree, degree of integration was highlighted during uh, our response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and certainly uh, the Trust is providing thought leadership in terms of regional uh, development generally across the state. Uh, three, remuneration and allowances are provided in accordance with uh, Section 20 of the Royalties for Regions Act 2009, while Ms Reynolds Adamson's other commitments made it difficult for her to attend meetings. I am advised she was still able to contribute to the work of the Trust. Um, Ms uh, Red Reynolds Adamson uh, was appointed only for one year. Uh, four, the Chair of the Regional Development Trust is also Chair of the Pilbara Development Commission Board um, and a member of the Regional Development Council, so I consider uh, that the Development Commissions are adequately represented on the Regional Development Trust. The Honourable Robin Chappell. I have a question without notice, uh, of which some notice has been given uh, to the Minister of Environment. 
I refer to the Quabbaganalu Road in Carnarvon, recommended by the Department of Parks and Wildlife, uh, Depor, uh, to remain closed until 2023. Depor's correspondence with the Shire and the outcomes of the Shire meeting, and I ask, is the Minister aware that the Shire intends to reopen the road as an adventure track without reinforcing or protecting the track or surrounds? And is the Minister aware that the track runs through the National Heritage Place ID uh, number 105881. Uh, is the Minister aware that the track was closed in, 19, in the 1960s due to safety concerns? Four, is the Minister aware that the surrounding dunes have been damaged as a result of irresponsible 4x4 use? Five, given that this is a National Heritage listed area, will the Minister ensure that such inappropriate activity will be rejected by the Department? And six, if notified, why not? Minister for the Environment. <coughs> to the question one to six, the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, or DBCA, and Ningaloo Coast Joint Management Body have provided advice to the Shire of Carnarvon regarding the reopening of the road. This has included a suggested roadmap to address cultural, safety and environmental concerns associated with reopening the road and requesting an extension of the road closure period for five years until these matters are resolved. However, whilst DBCA has management responsibility for the adjacent Ningaloo Coastal Reserves, the Shire of Carnarvon has management responsibility for the road. The Honourable, Rob, uh, the Honourable Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Forestry. I refer to the Forest Management Regulation 1993 Part 2 Registration of Timber Workers, and I ask, one, how many workers are currently registered to engage in timber harvesting in a state forest or timber reserve? Two, how many workers are currently registered to engage in the transport of log timber harvested in a state forest or timber reserve? And three, how many workers are registered for both timber harvesting and the transport of log timber? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question. The following information has been provided by the Minister for Forestry. One to three, 792 timber workers are currently registered to engage in timber harvesting in the state forest or timber reserve or in the transport of log timber harvested in a state forest or timber reserve. The FPC register is maintained in accordance with the Forest Management Regulations 1993, which do not require registration for harvesting and transport activities to be recorded separately. The Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for the Environment, representing the Treasurer and Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I refer to the state budget and the three quarters of a billion dollars to be spent on, and I quote, enhancing Aboriginal wellbeing package. I ask one, how will the success of this package be measured? Two, who will be accountable for any failures? And three, if the outcomes for Aboriginal people don't improve, will the government stand by its policy of avoiding intervention and continue instead with its partnership model? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One to three. The Western Australian Government is making a record investment in Aboriginal communities to progress its commitment to building the resilience and, ca and capacity of Aboriginal people and communities. The WA Government is a signatory to the National Ag Agreement on Closing the Gap, and the comprehensive reporting requirements under this agreement will capture the majority of commitments for socio-economic change for Aboriginal communities through one consolidated reporting mechanism. This government is committed to reset, resetting the relationship between the state and Aboriginal communities and working in partnership to improve outcomes for Aboriginal people. The Honourable Colin de Broussa. Madam President, uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Water. I refer to the determination of spring rights as it applies to surface water irrigators in the Manjimup Pemberton Irrigation District. And I ask one. Why are some farmers with previously approved spring rights now being told they no longer have spring rights? Two, why are farmers with an A-class water licence now being told they need a licence again when they were previously told they didn't need a licence due to spring rights? And three, given that catchments are fully allocated in the region, when will this quagmire of uncertainty be resolved and how will this be communicated to all in the region? Minister for Regional Development. Um, I thank the uh, member for the, uh, for the question uh, and uh, the following uh, uh, information has been provided by the Minister for Water. 
the questions uh, contain uh, a certain number of uh, misconceptions. Firstly, one of the deficiencies of the current legislation, which was not remedied by the previous government, is that there is no formal process for farmers to get a definitive declaration that they have a spring right. Uh, De Wer has put in place a voluntary process, a voluntary process to assist, uh, to assist farmers. Um, and uh, we, are, we believe that, uh, uh, that it is going to be necessary uh, to modernise water management in West Australia, including uh, improving processes around establishing a spring right. Uh, but Minister Kelly has advised that his office is willing to meet with anyone um, who has a concern, and Member, I would be um, more than prepared to uh, organise a briefing for you with, uh, with Minister Kelly to go through the detail. Well, I thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Planning. And I again refer to the draft Swan Valley Plan scheme or the scheme that was published for public comment from 14 October until 14 November 2020. And I ask one, to what degree was the City of Swan consulted on the draft scheme prior to its publication? On what dates with whom did that consultation occur and what specific written advice was provided to your departmental offices? And how was that advice incorporated into the draft scheme? Two, how many public and or private comments were received throughout the consultation process? Three, will these comments be published, and if not, why not? And four, will the minister be afforded adequate time to contemplate and, where possible, incorporate those comments, including those representations made by business following the closure of the public comment period before the scheme is gazetted? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. And I thank the honourable member for some notes to the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Planning. One, the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage engages extensively with the City of Swan. Um, and has received feedback from City staff on the draft Swan Valley Planning Scheme. At a recent Council meeting, the City resolved to recommend support for the draft scheme, with four modifications suggested. The City's recommendation will help inform the final scheme. Two, 76 submissions have been received. Three, a schedule of submissions will be made available on the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage website once the scheme has been finalised, and four, yes. The Honourable Ken Baston. My question without notice was some notice is given is, uh, to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the ABC article published online on the 25th of November reporting that 40 cars have been stolen in the last 30 days in Broome and the upcoming Community Safety Forum posted by the Shire of Broome and, and on Monday the 7th of December. And I ask, one, will the Minister please advise who of the following will be at attendance of this forum? A. Government MPs, B. Government Ministers, C. Department Director Generals, and D. Government Agency Representatives. Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One, from the Police Portfolio, Acting Assistant Commissioner Darrell Gaunt and relevant Kimberley Police District personnel will attend. Information regarding other attendees would need to be requested from the relevant Minister or the Shire. Uh, Leader of the House. Business of the House is resumed. Are there any further answers from any minister? The Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. Uh, on behalf of the Minister for Community Services, I'd like to table the Target 120 Evaluation Progress Report in relation to the Honourable Colin Ticknell's question uh, without notice 1274, asked on the uh, 11th of November 2020. And Those documents are tabled. I think there's something underneath. Da -da -da -da. Oh, no. Same thing. Are there any further answers, the Minister for the Environment? Thanks very much, Madam President. Uh, I would like to provide answers in relation to the following questions without notice and seek leave to have them incorporated into hindsight. So, 1219 asked by the Honourable Tim, Tim Clifford, uh, asked on the 4th of November 2020 to the Minister for Energy. 1307 asked by the Honourable Peter Collier. 1312 asked by the Honourable, the Honourable Martin Aldridge on the 24th of November to the Minister for Police. And 1281 asked by the Honourable Colin de Grusser on the 11th of November. Uh, which I also table the attached document. That document's tabled. Uh, I might put those separately because I, there may very well be different answers for different questions. Who knows? Um, so the, minute, the first one, Minister, was for. Uh, 1219, asked by the Honourable Tim Clifford. OK, on... if you just wait a second. The Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister, the second one. Uh, the Honourable. Peter Collier, 1307, it says. Oh, sorry, I've got two. 1305, uh, sorry, the number's wrong on my thing. 
The minister seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Minister? Sorry, I think they've used the different numbers. It is 1355. It's the one you wanted. Uh, sorry, the Honourable. Um, uh, 1347 asked by the Honourable Martin Aldridge to the Minister for Police. Yet his answer. The Minister seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Are there any further answers? And the Honourable Colin de Grusser, uh, 1309, asked by the Honourable Colin de Grusser to me, representing the Minister for Emergency Services. Minister on... seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Aye. Leave is granted. And with that one, Madam President, I. There's an attachment that, to it. And that document is tabled. Are there any further answers? The Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. Uh, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 3406, asked by the Honourable Diane Everest. That document is tabled. Are there any further answers by any Minister? The Minister for Regional Development. Uh, thank you. Um, I table documents in relation to questions on notice numbers 3345, asked by the Honourable Robin Chappell. 3376 and 3387 asked by the Honourable Alison Simon and 3410 asked by the Honourable Diane Evers. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further answers by any Minister or Parliamentary Secretary? No? The Honourable Rick Mazza. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I seek leave to make a personal statement in relation to today's Triple um, C report. Members, the Honourable Rick Mazza seeks leave to make a personal statement. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. The Honourable Rick Mazza. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I wish to make some comments on the report tabled today, titled Report on Electoral Allowances and Management of Electoral Officers. The report does not suggest any adverse findings against me. Um, however, I wish to make some comments on it. Paragraph 195 of the report notes that I argued that the C has mischaracterised the electoral allowance as public money, because once the allowance was paid to me, the money became my property and consequently was lawfully entitled under the terms of the determination to spend the money as I saw fit in the same way as I deal with my salary. Under the current determination, this, can, uh, easily be for, uh, this view can easily be formed for the following reasons. The determination of the Salaries and Allowances Tribunal remuneration of Members of Parliament made 30 November 2017 under Section 6 of the Salaries and Allowance Act 1975, the determination, makes it clear that the electoral allowance, which is dealt with in Part 3 of the determination, upon payment becomes the property of the member under Section 2.15. At this time, the funds clearly ceased to be public money. In this respect, the determination draws no distinction between the base remuneration and additional remuneration, that is salary, provided for in Part 2 of the determination and the electoral allowance. The absence of a distinction is deliberate, as both matters are dealt with in Section 2.15. Consistently with this, the bank reference for all electoral allowance payments I have received states salary. Further, in Section 3.12 of the determination, notes that the electoral allowance may be used at the member's discretion but shall not be used for campaigning, electioneering or political party promotion. This may be interesting for those members that pay a levy to their party and claim tax deductions. The words shall not are mandatory and clearly prohibit the use of the electoral allowance for the purposes specified in 3.12. Section 3.22 of the determination states that it is intended that the electoral allowance be used for the expenses incurred to assist with serving the electorate and includes seven examples of expenses of that type. The words it is intended will be used in section 3.22 clearly differ in effect and intent to the words shall not be used in section 3.12. The relevant provisions of the determination are set out are the same in all respects as the provisions of the determination of the Salaries and Allowance Tribunal, remuneration, as a mem uh, remuneration of members of parliament made and which came into operation on the 15th of April 2016. This interpretation of section 3.22 is consistent with section 2.15 and 3.12 of the determination, which makes it clear that immediately upon payment of the allowance, it becomes the property of the member and is able to be used at the member's discretion. It's also important to note that the determination does not require members to account for the manner in which the electoral allowance is spent in particular, it does not require the keeping of records to justify the expenditure of the electoral allowance. The C itself acknowledged in its earlier misconduct risks in electoral allowances for members of Parliament, dated the 17th of December 2019, at paragraph 37, 
that Parliament has no oversight over the use, acquittal or accounting of, of the electoral amounts paid fortnightly to each member. Consistently with the fact that the electoral allowance becomes the property of the member immediately upon payment, there is no provision for any part of the electoral allowance to be repaid. It is not expended in accordance with the Statement of Intention in section 3.22. The C itself acknowledged at paragraph 80 of its earlier report that a member is not required to return any unspent electoral allowance. There is no provision for a member to claim any amount in excess of the electoral allowance should its expenditure on the matters set out in section 3.22 exceed the electoral allowance payment. Consistently with the money becoming the property of the member, at which time it clearly ceases to be public funds, the ATO treats the electoral allowance as income for taxation purposes. ATO tax ruling TR 1999 of late 10, the ATO ruling, states that a payment is an allowance when a member is paid a definitive predetermined amount to cover an estimated expense. It is an amount contributed towards an expected expense and is made regardless of whether the member incurs the expected expense. The, statement of the spending of the allowance is at the complete discretion of the member. Paragraph 8. And receipt of the allowance does not in itself entitle a member to a deduction. That is, the electoral allowance could be acquitted on matters which may not satisfy the test for deductibility. Paragraph 9. All of the above factors support a conclusion that the electoral allowance, like a member's salary, is able to be spent by the member as and when they see fit, subject only to the prohibitions of section 3.12 against its use for campaigning, electioneering or political party promotion. In fact, the determination in stating that both the salary and the electoral allowance become the immediate property of the member treat these payments in the same manner. At the time of my induction into Parliament, I, like others here, were informed that the electoral allowance was mine to spend as I saw fit, but if it was not acquitted on parliamentary business, I would need to pay income tax on that money. Despite the above, the C has suggested at paragraph 228 of the report that whilst the determination provides no sanction for failing to spend the electoral allowance for the benefit of the electorate, this does not relieve the member from the duty to comply with the intention of the determination. Further, in paragraph 247 of its report, the C states that whilst the determination does not prohibit, it places a positive obligation on members to use the allowance for electoral purposes. Further, at paragraph 496, the C has concluded that my conduct is an example of expenditure which does not reflect the use of the electoral allowance intended by the determination. For the reasons set out above, no such duty or obligation is imposed by the determination and I have not at any time used my allowance in a way prohibited by the determination. Also at paragraph 486 of the report, the C has suggested that members had a pecuniary interest in maximising the taxation benefit that would be received from the ATO, so their assessable income from the electoral allowance could be matched by the claim expenditure and that some expenditure was plainly for private purposes and the electoral allowance should not be used. Again, the determination simply does not prohibit the use of the electoral allowance for private purposes, and I also pay significant additional tax each year on my income. I strenuously deny that I incorrectly used my electoral allowance. I may have some errors in my tax return, which at my earliest opportunity I will have reviewed and submitted amended return as required, but otherwise I reject any suggestion that I have not properly acquitted my electoral allowance. I would also like to point out that I have no connection to Craig Peacock, whom I was only acquainted with on three, uh, three occasions. As Trade Commissioner to Japan for nearly 20 years and who, has, who, and who has hosted many members of parliament from various political parties, including ministers and premiers, I had no reason to suspect anything untoward when invited to dinner. There was no discussion at that dinner in relation to the reasons for his presence in Perth. The report of paragraphs 468, sorry, 463 and 464 also note that I was the recipient of certain information from Mr Edmund. This was clearly out of my control and I could not stop people from sending me messages. Furthermore, once I started receiving messages from Mr Edmund, I blocked Mr Edmund on my phone. At no time did I engage in any discussions with Mr Edmund or others in relation to the matter, the subject of the investigation, and at no time did I disclose the subject matter of the investigation to other parties. I at all times respected and maintained a strict regime of confidentiality. 
particularly as a former member of the Procedures and Privileges Committee, as I have on every parliamentary committee I have served on. In conclusion, Madam President, I am pleased that this report has been uh, tabled as it highlights the need for greater clarity around the application of the electoral allowance. Members, I'm going to provide a ruling on a matter of privilege raised by the Honourable Peter Collier. Yesterday, the Leader of the Opposition raised a matter of privilege under Standing Order 93. The matter relates to the non-compliance by the Leader of the House with an audit of the Council for the production of documents made on the 4th of November 2020. On the 11th of November 2020, the Leader of the House tabled documents in part compliance with, an order, with the order of the Council. The Leader of the House cited a number of reasons for partial compliance, such as practical concerns with the scope of the order, the limited time provided for compliance, cabinet confidentiality and a desire to redact personal information. When determining whether there is substance to a matter of privilege under Standing Order 93, Schedule 4 of the Standing Orders establishes a number of threshold questions. Relevant considerations are whether a person knowingly committed an act amounting to contempt, the existence of any other remedy, and whether a person has a, had a reasonable excuse for the commission of any act constituting a contempt. I am, the view, I am of the view that it is premature to treat the Leader of the House's partial compliance with the Order of the Council as a substantial matter of privilege. The Leader of the House has not outright refused to comply with the Council's order and she does not appear to have obviously misled the Council. She has instead raised a number of practical objections to the production or unredacted production of a number of the documents that have been ordered to be produced. It is ultimately a matter for the Council to decide whether those objections amount to a reasonable excuse not to fully comply with the order. If not, it is, it is within the Council's competence to make further orders, including adjudging a person guilty of a contempt. I note that the Council has a range of options available to it to effectively deal with aspects of the partial non-compliance with its order immediately in a public manner, both prior to prorogation and also to enable it to pursue the matter further in the next parliament. For instance, the Council may reissue the order with another, more generous time for compliance and by delivery of the documents to the clerk if the Council is not sitting. It may issue a new, more narrowly focused order for the production of documents. It may order the Leader of the House to stand in her place and provide further details of both her compliance and non-compliance with the order. It may order that the Leader of the House produce certifying letters from the offices of the Premier, the Minister for Health and the Chief Medical Officer that all documents the subject of any order have been identified and produced. Or it may establish a select committee to obtain further relevant oral and written evidence by way of public hearings. I am accordingly of the view that at this stage there is no substantive matter of privilege to be investigated. Members, now I'm not sure whether we're moving back to orders of the day at this late stage of the day. I don't know whether you need to report out, Minister, from committee. Uh, yeah, I think I do. So, members, we will just briefly return to order of the day 28, Criminal Law Unlawful Consorting Bill 2020, and a return to committee. But I'll actually stay here. Mm. Uh, members, we return to the Criminal Law Unlawful Consorting Bill 2020 in committee. Uh, the Leader of the House. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I move that you do report progress. Report the bill to the House. Report the bill to the House. And uh, the question is, I do report the bill no, to no, the no. House. It, it, it is progress. We're, we're only part way through. Right. We don't get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Mm. Not very much progress, but. Progress. Uh, members, uh, the Leader has moved I do report progress. And seek to sit again. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. 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 No. I think the ayes have it.
Madam President, the Committee of the Whole House has considered the Criminal Law on Consorting Bill 2020, Bill Number 161, Bar 2, made progress and will seek to sit again. Leader of the House. Move the report be adopted. Members, the question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Members, noting the time, I think it's time for members' statements. The Honourable Aaron Stonehouse. I'd like to make a, a quick and brief uh, statement um, uh, to uh, make members aware of something that transpired and, and something I learned during budget estimates that I think is rather disturbing. Uh, but before I get there, I'd like to first remind members of what seems to be the positions of the, uh, of the Premier and of the new Leader of the Opposition, uh, which is a view uh, that we should be uh, basing our COVID-19 response purely on the advice from the Chief Health Officer. These are comments that have been made by the Premier time and time again, that all decisions about COVID-19 are based on advice from the CHO, uh, and they're comments made by uh, the new Leader of the Opposition, uh, where he has said uh, that he will continue to follow the advice of the CHO, adding uh, that he would do so without hesitation or equivocation. Now, Madam President, this is concerning to me because it has become quite clear uh, through questioning uh, that I engaged in during budget estimates that the Chief Health Officer is not passing on mental health advice to the State Disaster Council or to the, uh, to the State Emergency Coordinator. Uh, in the advice that the CHO has tabled, uh, there is no mention of mental health considerations in the advice passed to the SEC, the State Emergency Coordinator. That means that, a dire that directions are being written seemingly, seemingly, at least through the evidence that I could get through budget hearings, seemingly without mental health advice being incorporated. Now, I asked several questions. I asked questions of the Department of Health, of the CHO himself, uh, of uh, the Mental Health Commission, of police. I asked questions of the Leader of the House and, the, uh, and DPC. And all of those questions seem to imply, uh, all the answers I received seem to imply that the Chief Health Officer receives all the advice, uh, including mental health and economic and, and uh, welfare advice. He distills that all down, bundles it all together, and then incorporates that into the advice that he passes on to the State Emergency Coordinator and the State Disaster Council. But when you look at the, the written advice that is provided, Madam President, that is clearly not the case. It is clearly not the case. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to go back and ask the Chief Health Officer if that is true, uh, because we, we had the Chief Health Officer appear first before all those other agencies. Um, but, but that has me deeply concerned. The government, uh, to their credit, created a new role back in, I believe, June, a Chief Health Officer for Mental Health. I commend the government for creating that role. It is fantastic. But that officer... That, that, that officer sits below, at a much lower level, buried beneath a, a Kafkaesque uh, uh, tapestry of bureaucracy. FIOC, uh, SWIC, SHIC, the SDC, the SEG, the SECG, all these various bureaucratic committees that report to various ministers and various agencies and various director generals. The mental health advice is clearly being lost in the mix here. Uh, the State Disaster Council, I asked questions of the government of various agencies. I tried to confirm who actually sat on the highly secret State Disaster Council, which is rather, it's rather interesting, Madam President. You would be aware, I'm sure, that the State Disaster Council is sitting concurrently. Uh, the, the State Emergency uh, sorry, uh, Management Committee, uh, now I may get my acronyms confused here, but this is part of my point. The committee that's created when a state of emergency is declared, which is a state disaster council, is sitting concurrently with a subcommittee of cabinet, which means all the deliberations of the state disaster council are subject to cabinet confidence. Uh, cabinet confidentiality. We have no idea what goes on inside those meetings, and I believe it may be by design. It may be intentional. But the chief health officer for mental health does not have a seat at the table at the State Disaster Council. The Chief Psychiatrist does not have a seat at the table at the State Disaster Council. The Commissioner for Mental Health does not have a seat at the table at the State Disaster Council. Now, the government will say, well, that's because the Director General for Health or the Minister for Mental Health or even the CHO has a seat at the Council, and so we don't need mental health professionals there giving up-to-date, minute-by-minute advice. Uh, well, I'm sorry, but none of those people I just mentioned, the, the Minister for Mental Health or the Director General or the CHO, are experts in that field. They are not. And when you have the advice being given several layers down 
and you expect uh, a higher level uh, public servants to relay that information to the SEC with the same level of urgency, the same professionalism, and the same intimate knowledge of that subject matter that the Chief Health Officer for Mental Health uh, or the Chief Psychiatrist might be able to. I I'm sorry, but something's being lost here in translation. Uh, it, it is deeply concerning when we have people confined to hotel quarantine, where, where at least at the earlier stages, uh, they had uh, no exercise, no fresh air, uh, very little sunlight. People were contained uh, in what, what could really be best described as solitary confinement. And mental health advice about what that might do to somebody psychologically, emotionally, mentally, was, was not being provided by the experts in that field to the state emergency coordinator. Uh, that, that is an absolute disaster. And this comes on the heels of the Mental Health Commission in their budget recognising that, that there is an increased demand on suicide prevention services. We are looking down the barrel of a mental health crisis created by the government's COVID-19 restrictions. And it seems that the most important decision makers are not receiving direct mental health advice about the decisions that they make for West Australians. That is a disaster. And if I just go back, I'll wrap up shortly. If I just go back to the statements made by the Premier and by the Leader of the Opposition, that they will follow the CHO's advice, they will follow the Chief Health Officer's advice, whatever it is, without hesitation or, or uh, equivocation, according to the Leader of the Opposition, uh, that is an abdication of their responsibility. I'm sorry, but we don't live in a technocracy, OK? The bureaucrats don't run the show. We live in a representative democracy where MPs, members of parliament, and indeed even the Premier, are responsible to their electors, and they need to consider all the factors. They need to consider what is best for health, clinical health. They need to consider what is best for mental health. They need to consider what is best for the economy, what is best for our society. They need to weigh all these various factors. They need to exercise their own judgment. I'm sorry, Mr Premier, I'm sorry, Mr Leader of the Opposition, but you do not get to uh, uh, hand off your responsibility to make tough decisions to unelected bureaucrats. Uh, and, and, if, and if there are, if there are costs due to the mental health crisis that we're looking at now, the government is going to have to answer the tough questions. Why wasn't the Chief Health Officer for Mental Health, why wasn't the Chief Psychiatrist, why wasn't the Commissioner for Mental Health in the room at the secret State Disaster Council meetings, in the room there, giving their up-to-date and frank advice when decisions were made to lock down our state and subject people to social isolation? Halt. I found an interesting article in the paper today, and I want to share it with uh, members in the House. Um, and it's on page three, and it talks about states, and the headline is state, states sick of navy gazing on the subs deal. And uh, I want to highlight this because I want to lead into something else. And I'll read in part. The state government will renew a national campaign today to convince the country the WA should win a multi billion dollar submarine maintenance contract. The advertising blitz will run across all media platforms to pressure the federal government to finally announce where the full cycle docking work will be shifted from South Australia to WA. There's a few quotes in here from State Defence Issues Minister Paul Papalia. Said, the federal government was almost a year past its self-imposed deadline for a decision and had not provided any updates on the timeline. He rejected the assertion the Labor state government's advertising campaign was timed to hurt the Liberals ahead of the state election in March. It's a WA government demanding a decision from the federal government who should have made that decision already, he said. What works, as we've seen with the GST debate, is public awareness. Public pressure encourages governments to make the right decisions. I'll just repeat that. Public pressure encourages governments to make the right decision. Now, if you turn over a few pages to page uh, 15, there's the advert, full page advert. Canberra, it's time to make a decision and put the national interest first. I've got no problem with this. It's got a little checklist. We have highly skilled trans tradespeople ready to go, tick. We have experienced businesses, tick. We have world-class infrastructure, tick. Now all we need is a decision. I want to raise that because I've raised a number of questions this time, uh, this week in questions without notice around two issues. One being the Bustleton Jetty um, market-led proposal, which is stuck in the quagmire of no decision from government. I've tried to get to the bottom of who's responsible, where's the timeline, when do they expect to hear, uh, and yet they haven't made, there's no decision 
coming, and it's, it's hidden in, in the terms of reference and the processes of the steering committee. Even though they themselves said, if it goes beyond the, within 99 days, we will let the proponents know what is happening, or at least give an indication of some timelines. I tried to get to the bottom of that question today with the Minister for Regional Development, who gave me no answer. So they themselves have gone outside their own timeline. Federal government haven't, haven't answered for a year. State government gets all uh, shirty with them and decide we better take out an advertising campaign. The, uh, the Bustle and Jetty people put a proposal in, want to hear something, can't get to the bottom of it. Maybe they need to put out a full page ad. But of course they haven't got the means to do that. The second issue I've raised this week is about retired police officer Laurie Morley, who put in an application for a ex gratia payment. Ex police officer Laurie Morley was seriously assaulted in 2015 in Harvey. He's, um, he's now discharged from the police, police force. He doesn't qualify for medical retired uh, compensation, and the information that came out just a few days ago to address that is not retrospective. Um, he has put in an ex gratia payment that has been sitting with a commissioner or someone else, and the information I got this week was with the state solicitor, for 18 months. Now, should Laurie Morley be required to take out a full paid edge that maybe shows the 43 bruises he got on, the, on his back from the, the assault with a hammer to get his point across. Remember, this is the Minister for State Defence Issues. What works, as we have seen in the GST debate, is public awareness. Public pressure encourages governments to make the right decisions. Well, Laurie Morley has got, not got the means to put out an ad like that, to put into the paper to, to raise the public's um, understanding of the issues he faces, to force the government to say, time to make a decision on his ex gratia payment. I think it's a disgrace. He hasn't got that ability. And maybe the Seven West Media would like to do some pro bono advertising for Mr Laurie Morley to get his answer to his ex gratia payment application, which has been sitting within government for 18 months. And I would encourage the minister, who represented the minister for police in this place, and who I regard as a great minister, to take up the cause, because the answer that he gave on behalf of that minister yesterday left Laurie Morley nowhere to go. And while the government thinks it's OK when they have they've been missed deadlines and ask the federal government to come clean, why are there not people who are waiting for this government to make a decision do, should do the same thing? Honourable Yawn Sidmer. I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that there are other members wishing to speak on this very last um, uh, sitting day before um, we head inevitably to the election, and it had been my intention to do so earlier. Uh, so I will um, uh, amend and shorten my, my prepared remarks accordingly. But I, I did not want it to pass unmentioned that um, last Thursday, uh, the 19th of November, I had the great pleasure to accept an invitation. Uh, from the Perth Korean War Memorial uh, Committee Incorporated uh, and uh, the Korean Veterans Association of Western Australia to attend the 2020 uh, Korean War Veterans and Korean War Memorial fundraising dinner. Um, I'd like to speak here very briefly again in support of this worthy project. And that project, in simple terms, is to build a suitable memorial within the grounds of Kings Park. Uh, identified actually more specifically now within the vicinity of the Tobruk uh, Memorial Precinct uh, to honour the service of Australian forces and particularly those of Western Australian origin who fought during the 1950 to 1953 uh, Korean War. Uh, it is a project that I've been involved in uh, almost since inception, which is not to claim uh, ownership of the concept, but uh, it's certainly uh, received my uh, full support and I've moved it along uh, to the best of my capacity, albeit from the diminished resourced, uh, resourcing of uh, an opposition member. Uh, so last week I was also pleased to announce that uh, a future Liberal government would commit $300,000 towards uh, the building of that memorial. 
um, with the object of completing that task, as well as completing an adjoining <coughs> friendship memorial uh, in time for the 70th anniversary of the armistice, uh, which concluded to some degree that conflict. Uh, my hope would be, uh, at a bipartisan level, that should uh, the McGowan government uh, be successful at the election, that that would, in the very least, match that commitment. And I do want to acknowledge uh, the efforts of both Ministers Dawson and Tinley uh, for the support that they have shown for this project, and also to acknowledge uh, the hard work of the good people of the Board of the um, Botanic uh, Gardens and Parks Authority, uh, which have approved essentially stage one of the concept. Uh, this is providing a degree of reassurance to those volunteers who are working towards this uh, particularly worthy cause. And I might just reflect on the fact uh, that this concept and, and this commitment is actually deeply appreciated by the people and the government of the Republic of Korea. Uh, and I have borne witness to this gratitude repeatedly over the last few years uh, on a number of poignant occasions uh, where I have witnessed the awarding of Ambassador for Peace medallions on behalf of the Korean government to surviving veterans of that conflict. Uh, they are an ageing, uh, diminishing, uh, but certainly noble cohort of our fellow Western Australians. And it was also a pleasure at last week's function, uh, a, a real reinvigoration, because there was a concept that the giving of gratitude, which is not a sentiment that we as politicians bear witness to very frequently in the course of our uh, public engagement. So it was refreshing. Uh, and to some degree um, humbling to witness the expression of the gratitude at the most official level of the Korean government to not only the Australian people, the Australian government, but particularly those servicemen and their families. Um, the Korean War, as we might understand, is commonly referred to as the Forgotten War. And for reasons which are understandable but also uh, quite lamentable. Uh, I think that we have within our grasp uh, the clear opportunity to atone uh, for that historical oversight, and we should, and indeed we must take that opportunity should we have the power. And should I say that I have every confidence that this project will materialise in some form, and I think there is also that opportunity, should it present itself, to reinvigorate this state's trade relationship with our Korean trade partners. It is a relationship that we often don't have cause to reflect upon, and I think that we should absolutely do so. The Honourable Colin de Grusso. Thanks, um, in 2015, I witnessed firsthand the devastation of the Cascades, Merivale and Cape Arid fires near my hometown of Esperance. And the fifth anniversary of that event has just passed, and I have to say that while the community is, is moving on to the best of their ability, it's still left a significant scar uh, on the community. These are fires that burn through 322,000 hectares, tragically taking four lives, doing enormous damage to thousands of hectares of crops, of crop, 4,500 head of livestock, um, countless infrastructure, um, buildings and so on. Uh, on the 4th of this month, I raised questions in this House regarding the government's response to the coroner's inquest, which was tabled uh, almost a year ago. Uh, or just over a year ago, actually, in, this, uh, in, the, in Parliament. By happenstance, or maybe as a direct result of my question, the Minister um, for Emergency Services tabled the State Government's response to the recommendations the very next day, and they make for interesting readings, and I just wanted to make some observations on those. In the first instance, I think it is appropriate to acknowledge that the Government has taken sensible, if somewhat slow, steps towards a more proactive fire mitigation approach, and there has been some progress in improving um, in improving area, uh, mobile firefighting capability and for, uh, construction of fire sheds and additional communications, as we heard about today uh, from the question by the Hon. Rick Mazza. Uh, given the time available, I'm going to focus comments on the recommendations that the government hasn't uh, supported but has simply paid lip service to. Recommendation one. The DFIS immediately state, take steps to create and fill the additional positions of a district officer, area officer, rural competencies and bushfire risk management officer to supplement the current, current area officer at Esperance. The government response, DFIS has employed a community emergency services manager for the Shire of Esperance 
and as an interim measure, sec seconded a natural hazards district officer from the Kalgoorlie office to the Esperance office. The reality is that the co coroner actually recommended three new positions, leading to a total of four and a half full-time funded DFIS positions in Esperance. At the time of the fires, there were one and a half funded positions. There are now two and a half funded positions. The supposedly new position is actually an existing role relocated from Kalgoorlie to Esperance and still doing the work they were doing in Kalgoorlie. What is bizarre is that the government supposedly supported the coroner's recommendation, but they've only chosen to provide one additional FTE, which isn't a new FTE and isn't actually doing work for the local community. Uh, recommendation four. The state government should give consideration to giving a higher drafting priority to the Consolidated Emergency Services Act. The government's response, the state government will review a higher drafting priority to the new amalgamated emergency services legislation in the second term of the McGowan state government. So, no, no hurry there. No hurry. Um, this has been a year since this, this report was uh, um, presented by the coroner. We've been crying out for clarity on this legislation because it's a major change to the, to, the, to the legislation. And the government's position is not that they're going to uh, give it a higher priority, but they'll review giving it a higher priority, priority but they'll wait till after the election. So there's no, no response there. Recommendation five, DFIS should fund an additional two light tanker appliances and one heavy duty appliance to be used by the Esperance Volunteer Bushfire Brigades at their discretion. The appliances should be provided on a permanent basis. The government's response, DFIS is committed to, committed to undertaking a review and potential expansion of the summer season firefighting fleet allocation across the South West Land Division based on a risk to capability assessment. The reality is, during the fire season, uh, Esperance, the Esperance community, as other communities, can apply for access to vehicles in the high season fleet, but approval and access is not guaranteed. This is not an ideal situation and does not meet the standards recommended by the coroner. Uh, there have been some progress on general upgrades to bush fire brigade trucks as part of the normal replacement process, but that has nothing to do with the coroner's, uh, coroner's recommendation. In addition, the appliances recommended by the coroner the Esperance also requires four light appliances, which can be utilised as rapid response vehicles. Um, locals are, are using their own vehicles in this, uh, in this capacity at the moment because they, they don't have those light tankers. Uh, recommendation nine, the WA government should undertake an assessment of established airstrips in the Esperance Shire to identify airstrips that can be enhanced to permit operation by water bombers. Once a suitable site has been identified, priority should be given to funding the necessary upgrades to make the airstrip suitable for that purpose. The government's response, the state government supports an assessment of airstrips in the Shire of Esperance. DBCA has the operation, operational capacity to assist DFIS and local government with the identification and assessment of existing airstrips to determine suitability for aerial suppression operations. The reality, not a commitment, not doing anything. Essentially, um, four or five or six lines there uh, actually saying we've done nothing. We've done nothing on that. And this is actually an incredibly important issue um, because a lot of those airstrips located on private land would make for far more efficient water bombing uh, when necessary. And this is a, a really important issue where government needs to step up, take control of that issue and get on with um, understanding what airstrips are out there and what, what they can, how they can be uh, made appropriate. Recommendation 10, the government should give priority to funding a wheat belt based aerial fire suppression response for the full fire season, commencing in the wheat belt and concluding in Esperance. Uh, the state government's response, uh, they support this in principle. Uh, that's great. We support it in principle, we're not doing anything about it. I've raised the availability of water bomber capability directly with the minister responsible, and it, as it is one of the most important single issues raised by uh, volunteers, especially when it comes to control of fires in land managed by DPCA. The current arrangements are inherently inefficient and leave plenty of communities without the capability. There is already capacity, for example, in Esperance to do water bombing, but because of exclusive contracting arrangements, um, those aircraft can't be used. Uh, so that needs to change. What is disappointing is that the government's response uh, is in the government's response is that they've not chosen to deal uh, with the most critical recommendations of the coroner's report. I think uh, the Esperance community and all of our communities indeed deserve better. As we enter into the fire season, uh, these sort of things uh, become very, very come to the front of mind. In closing, in the limited time left, I'm just going to quote directly from the coroner's report, just so members get a, a clear picture of what actually happened on that day. 
and why the coroner made the recommendations that she did and why the response from the government is so inadequate. And I'll quote from the report. Weather conditions recorded around this time showed a wind velocity of 101 kilometres per hour, a temperature of 43.2 degrees and relative humidity of 0.8 per cent. The people on the ground had never seen conditions like this with a fire raging and after the fact they came to understand that they were the most extreme fire conditions recorded in Australia to date. The fire front was estimated to be five kilometres wide at its largest. As the bushfire travelled across the crops, it was unstoppable, burning everything in its wake. The speed of the fire was among the highest ever recorded. The fire jumped all of the mitigation work and fire breaks, despite the efforts that had been put in to try to contain the fire. The fire was also circling around and restarting after fire crews had doused it, which was unusual and made it even harder to fight. By 4pm, the fire was travelling at a rate of approximately 36 kilometres an hour, and it was gaining pace at an extraordinary rate. Its speed may have reached close to 50 kilometres per hour, which is unheard of. On the ground and at the DFAS office, people were struggling to map the fire movement and predict where the fire would go due to its unprecedented speed and magnitude. A DFAS officer said the fire nearly tripled anything he had anticipated in terms of the distance it travelled, and he was in disbelief at its awe and ferocity. The Cascades fire had jumped the highway and the Merivale fire had crossed Cape Le Grand Road by this stage and both fires were out of control. The incident control centre was overloaded and the firefighters on the ground were just desperately trying to outrun the fire in order just to save their lives. The Honourable Robin Scott. Thank you, to continue my remarks from my member statement from last night, but I will temper my remarks, Madam President, so that I don't have to experience the, uh, the pouting and the squealing that I did last night. That's no way uh, to talk about the presiding officer, member. OK. I started off speaking about optimism, Madam President, and that optimism is due to the, uh, the hard work, the resilience and the perseverance of the people in the regions, which includes the Kimberley, the Pilbara, North West Central and uh, the Goldfields. But the future of the regions, Madam President, is very, very fragile. And since the McGowan government won't support the regions, we need to make sure that industry is given certainty so that they can continue to do the heavy lifting. And that means that the government can't go raising royalty rates for our resources. They actually tried that uh, a few years ago with the gold industry. Unfortunately, my party, the One Nation Party, was successful in stopping it. And I hope that any future plans for any royalty rate hikes have been put on the back burner because that's where they should stay. And I want the government to know that I'll be looking very forward to being elected to the uh, 41st Parliament, so I'll be keeping a close watch on that, and I'm sure the gold industry will be too. The people of the regions can no longer afford the government using their royalties as, their, as an ATM machine, because once that piggy bank is empty, Madam President, it will be empty for good. And I want to conclude, Madam President, by saying I'm here to help the government. I'm here, Madam President, to keep them posted about what is needed in the regions. Not what the people want, but what they need, Madam President. Everybody wants a big house, fancy car and a yacht with a helipad on it. But it's what they need, Madam President, and that is what I'll be pushing for. For the last three and a half years, that's what I've been doing every day while I've been doing my job. And it's the least I can do for the people of the mining and the parcel region who have been let down by this government time and time again. Thank you. Are there any further members' statements? The Honourable Martin Pritchard. Yeah, festive season. I just hope everybody in this place, for you and your families, I hope you're happy over the festive season and you and your families stay safe. Thank you. Are there any more for members' statements? Good. Members, I'm just going to ignore the clock for a little while and as is customary at this time of year, I'm going to make some comments about our year. So indeed, we've had another very, very busy year. Uh, we would have, we sh certainly would have expected that year in the this year in the final sitting year of a, the 40th Parliament, but I don't think anyone uh, could have foreseen how challenging this year would have turned out to be. The coronavirus pandemic and the resulting state of emergency declared in March 2020 certainly significantly changed the way in which we both live our lives and, and uh, how we manage our work arrangements. Our usual practices and some long-standing parliamentary procedures were 
uh, change to ensure that the work of the Legislative Council continued in the way that was safe for both members and staff. So I want to thank everyone, members and staff, for accepting the changes and adapting to them with both grace and understanding, as tough as that might have been at some times. The cross-party collaboration in the Chamber has been very positive this year, with members working together to agree to an additional sitting days to deal with urgent COVID-19 legislation. Do you want to find a seat? Twenty-one bills in total were passed during that COVID period in the best interests of all Western Australians. We've sat for 21 weeks this year, 63 days, and this year we've had 49 bills passed. Came close to 50 today, but didn't quite get there. 29 bills, of which were amended in the Legislative Council, which again demonstrates that the work we do so well here is the House of Review. We've asked more than 1,350 questions without notice, of which some notice was given, and almost 600 and, uh, 680 questions were placed on notice. In addition to the work in the chamber, there has been a tremendous amount of committee work undertaken, with 42 reports being tabled this year, which really isn't the best measurement of the depth and breadth of the work undertaken, but it's a significant measurement nevertheless. As members are usually on more than one committee, I believe it's been a very busy year for the vast majority of members in this chamber. Before I move on to talk about and acknowledge individuals in the chamber, I just want to make one brief comment on the Corruption and Crime Commission report on electorate allowances and management of electorate officers, which was tabled earlier today and where it references on page 84 of that document a code of conduct for members of the Legislative Council. Given that a code of conduct for members of the Legislative Assembly has been in place for a number of years, it's my opinion, in my opinion, this matter, the development of a code of conduct for members of the Legislative Council is worthy of discussion, development and implementation in the next parliament. And I would encourage members to give this matter appropriate consideration. So moving on to acknowledge members in the chamber. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of the Deputy President, the Honourable Simon O'Brien, and I thank him very much for, for his fine efforts in uh, managing the Deputy Speakers, the, in the, the Deputy Chairs in this chamber. I want to note the hard work of all of the Deputy Chairs of the uh, committees, the Honourable Martin Aldridge, the Honourable Steve Thomas, who has moved from uh, PFAS to Iron Ore, so we look forward to what his challenge is for next year. Uh, the Honourable Robin Chappell, the Honourable Matthew Swinbourne and the Honourable Adele Farina. They've all worked diligently throughout the year in their capacity as Deputy Chairs and I thank them for their work. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the party leaders in this place and their team. So the Honourable Sue Allery, the Leader of the House and the Labor team. The Honourable Peter Collier, the Leader of the Opposition and his colleagues in the Liberal Party. The Honourable Jackie Bordell, the Deputy Leader of the Nationals, WA and her members. The Honourable Alison Zamon and the members of the Greens. The Honourable Colin Tinknell and the Honourable Robin Scott from Pauline, the Pauline Hanson One Nation. The Honourable Rick Mazza from the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. The Honourable Aaron Stonehouse of the Liberal Democrats and the Honourable Charles Smith, a member of the West Australian Party. I know I say this every year and it's true, we're very fortunate to have an excellent group of people who work here at Parliament I'd like to acknowledge them. Firstly, I want to acknowledge Rob Hunter and the executive team from the Parliamentary Services Department. The mission of the Parliamentary Services Department is to provide effective apolitical support to the operations of the Parliament and I believe they do this exceptionally well. They work very hard to ensure the House and all the services their team provide are good to go at any given, any given time. In alphabetical order, I'm going to acknowledge and thank Building Services. We thank them for looking after our accommodation and repairs to and maintenance of Parliament House. I congratulate them again on the completion of the Fountains Development Project, Redevelopment Project. I want to give a special shout out to our fabulous gardeners who do an admirable job caring for the gardens and the grounds of Parliament House. I want to acknowledge catering services who continue to provide us with fabulous um, food service in the parliament. And I also want to thank the parliament's kitchen staff for, the, for preparing meals that were distributed to people in need by the food rescue charity Odds Harvest whilst the parliament was in COVID-19 shutdown. I want to acknowledge the finance department for all their very good work getting the bills paid, reimbursements and other payments done in a very quiet and efficient manner. I also acknowledge Human Resources for providing advice to management and staff in all areas of human resources and staff payroll and their work arranging health and wellbeing activities. 
Information technology, they've had a very significant year. Amazing work implementing at short notice a COVID work from home platform for the majority of Parliament staff and providing for a range of business critical applications to be accessed remotely, including Hansard recording finance and payroll systems. And I don't think there's anyone in this chamber who would have thought they would have been using the words Zoom, Teams or WebEx at the beginning of this year that you frequently have in your conversations now. I acknowledge library and information services who do a magnificent job providing information and media monitoring services to members, members, electorate staff and others. I want to give a special mention to all of those who work in the Parliament's social media. The Parliament of Western Australia's Facebook page is fantastic and the posts are interesting, uh, quite often fun and always professional. To the Parliamentary Education Office, uh, they are a, a superb team of people providing education services and community relation activities, public tours and the like that promote and enhance awareness, knowledge and understanding of the history, the role and functions of the Parliament of Western Australia, both here in, within our own building and certainly in the regions as well. To reception services for their frontline customer service, they welcome people to the Parliament, deal with telephone and face-to-face -face inquiries, they connect guests with their hosts and always represent the Parliament in a very professional manner and for that we thank them. Reporting services, Hansard, are always making the transcripts read better than we actually speak and the broadcast team who provides television and audio services. They've had a very interesting year with all they've had to deal with with the changes in the chamber, trying to keep track of who's speaking and who may not be seated in their usual spot. And last but not least, for security, for providing us with a safe environment within the parliamentary precinct in which we work. So I want to thank all of those groups and all of those individuals. I also want to acknowledge my colleague in the Assembly, the Honourable Peter Watson, who has been a fabulous person to work with in our capacity as presiding officers. And I've certainly worked with uh, the Honourable Peter Watson for nearly 20 years as a member in this parliament. And so I wish him well in his retirement. And I also acknowledge the support of his clerk, Ms Kirsten Robinson. I'd like to recognise some of our own Legislative Council staff who reached very significant service milestones this year. Our Parliamentary Officer Chris Hunt, who served 35 years, our Deputy Usher of the Black Rod, Peter Gale, and Senior Projects Officer Kelly Orcock, who attained 25 years, our own Clerk Nigel Pratt uh, for 15 years of service, albeit uh, broken with a stint in Tasmania, to our Parliamentary Officer Hayley Brown, our Committee Clerk Claire Seaver, and our Usher of the Black Rod, John Seal Pollard, who all reached 10-year milestones, and our Advisory Officer Stephen Brockway, who's now been with the Legislative Council for five years. So I congratulate them and thank them for the excellent work they do for all of us. And I especially thank the Department of the Legislative Council Management Team, our Clerk Nigel Pratt, our Deputy Clerk Paul Grant, our Clerk Assistant Committees Ms Christine Kane, our Clerk Assistant House Mr Sam Hastings and our Usher of the Black Rod Mr John Seal Pollard for their support, their hard work and their dedication, all of which is appreciated. A number of our other staff work extremely hard for us in and around the chamber. I've already mentioned Mr Sam Hastings and Mr John Seal Pollard. I'd also like to acknowledge Mr Peter Gale, Mr Brian Conn, Ms Hayley Brown, Ms Lauren Levia, Mr Grant Hitchcock, Mr Chris Hunt, Ms Renee Jewell and Ms Rebecca Burton, who is not only the Executive Officer of the Clerk but also now assists in the chamber. I want to acknowledge the staff that work across the road in the Legislative Council Committee Office, a very talented and, mostly, uh, and, and an exceptionally professional uh, team, led by the Clerk Assistant Committees Christine Kane and Parliamentary Officer Committee Ms Lauren Wells. I will also want to acknowledge Deb Kapoor, my steward, and Tina O'Connor, my Executive Officer, who do an exceptionally good job of looking after me. So as I said, it's been an extremely busy year, a very unusual year, hopefully one that we will never have to deal with again in the same way. And so members, as we head towards Christmas and a very, um, a very much longer than usual recess with a state general election taking place in March 2021 and with a yet to be determined resumption date next year, I would like to say thank you very much for your contributions made in the Legislative Council this year on behalf of and in the service of the Western Australian community. I wish everyone here a very happy and safe Christmas with your families and a wonderful new year. And I hope that when we finish up today, members will join the staff in the members lounge for refreshments to wrap up the year. I look forward to seeing you all when we return in 2021. Thank you. Madam President.
Thanks very much, Madam President. Can I join you uh, and endorse your comments in thanking uh, the parliamentary staff in particular across the precinct uh, and across the many and varied functions who do an exemplary job uh, behind the scenes. In particular, I want to thank the staff who work in this chamber, the clerk and his team who keep this place held together and to whom we can all uh, turn uh, for advice. And of course, thank you, Madam President, uh, for the leadership role you've played. This time last year, we were coming to the end of a debate in which every single member of this chamber contributed. That's not always the case, but that was an extraordinary debate. And I think we all thought we would never go through another parliamentary year as draining uh, or as uh, challenging as we did last year because of that particular piece of legislation. And then we entered 2020 and COVID-19 happened. Uh, and I think this year will be remembered uh, by all of us for the remainder of our lives. The legislation that we've had to deal with and pass this year has been extraordinary to match extraordinary times. Madam President, I think referred <coughs> to 21 COVID-19 related bills passed in the interests of keeping WA safe and supporting uh, the state and all of the functions uh, through the pandemic. Um, that is by far the most, I'm advised, uh, COVID-related legislation passed of uh, most parliaments uh, in Australia. And I want to sincerely thank members of this House for their role in helping uh, to, to achieve that. Now, uh, Madam President referred uh, to the report that was issued uh, today, and I, I hadn't planned to mention it, but I think her um, a suggestion that we give consideration uh, to a code of conduct is one worthy um, of consideration. Our role as members of parliament and members of this place is one in, uh, in which the community places an enormous amount of trust. And uh, it, it was um, disappointing and shocking in, in varying degrees to see that uh, what that report is telling us is that not everybody values and respects uh, that trust uh, as much as they should. And so I think the President's uh, suggestion is one worthy of consideration. I do want to thank um, a few people. I continue to value the working relationship I have with the Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, and uh, long may he remain uh, leader of the Liberal Opposition uh, in the Legislative Council. Yeah. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank the Honourable Donna Farragher, as, uh, who's out of the House on urgent parliamentary business, uh, as the shadow uh, in my portfolios. I want to thank all of the members uh, of the Liberal Party uh, as well. I want to thank even my, my nemesis uh, over there, um, but fellow Eagle supporter, so try to find something positive to think about the Honourable Nick Horan. Um, I want to thank members of the, uh, of the Nationals, uh, led by the Honourable Jackie Boydell, who has had a challenging end uh, to her parliamentary year um, as well. I've put on the public record before my respect for the position she took in respect to those issues, and uh, I stand with you. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Alison Zamon and uh, the team in the Greens. Now, if there was a trophy, Honourable Members, uh, for the amount of member statements that can be made in any one year, then the Greens are right up there. Over 80 statements have been made by the Greens, 47 of them by the honest, Honourable Alison Zamon. Now, I have to confess, Honourable Member, um, it's not always the case that we think kind thoughts uh, about you when we get to uh, members' uh, member statements. Um, I, we know. Um, I want to thank uh, members of the crossbench as well. I want to thank the Honourable Colin Tinknell and his team, uh, One Nation team, the Honourable Aaron Stonehouse, the Honourable Rick Mazza and the Honourable Charles Smith. If we put aside the politics uh, that is uh, par for the course between us, um, COVID has demonstrated that when we need to, uh, and in the interests of West Australians, in fact, we can work collegiately together. We don't always agree. Uh, but my aim has been to make sure that I manage my working relationships with each party leader in a respectful way. Uh, and most times we've been able to find a way forward. So I want to thank everybody for their assistance in that. Of course, my biggest thanks go to Team Red. 
Um, the members of the government benches, I thank them for their flexibility. I thank them for their willingness to give up uh, their opportunities to speak when I know they are desperate to do it. I thank them for understanding the death stare uh, when it is applied in their general uh, direction. Um, not looking at anyone in particular. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I want to thank them for uh, their ongoing uh, support, uh, their outstanding uh, representation of the McGowan government uh, in this chamber uh, and elsewhere. I know that being a government backbencher uh, can be challenging at times, but each of you have brought a strength to our team and I do appreciate um, your contributions. In particular, I want to acknowledge uh, Deputy Leader of the Government in the Legislative Council, the Honourable Stephen Dawson. Um, and I want to thank uh, my ministerial colleague, the Honourable Alana McTiernan, as well, who uh, in the last year has overcome uh, greater challenges than most of us uh, during the course of this term and is so often the defender of the government's honour uh, on a Thursday during a non-government business. So I want to say thank you to her. I also want to pay a particular thank you to the Whip, uh, the Honourable Pierre Yang, for his uh, dedication and support as well. Now, because my role as leader, Madam President, means uh, that others who work for me and with me uh, have to take an extra burden, I do want to uh, thank the staff in my ministerial and electorate offices. They are a hard-working, dedicated team that ride the highs and the lows with me, and I certainly could not do it without them. I want to um, seek indulgence of the House, I'm told, by the person uh, who wrote this speech. Um, to make a couple of uh, thank yous that are a little bit unusual. Um, this is literally what the three um, amigos, I could think of another term, but I'll just call them that, uh, Ollie, Shelley and Chris, who work for the Honourable Stephen Dawson, the Honourable Alana McTiernan and I, um, have hijacked my speech and they've written this bit. They've asked me to thank the members and parliament staff in this place for the good working relationship they've had with them over this term, and particularly the, the government MPs they've worked so closely uh, for, and they say not to mention the three impressive ministers they work for. Um, um, <laughs> Ministers, uh, are, as, as well, from time to time, we need to be in other places. So uh, the Honourable Stephen Dawson has reminded me in particular uh, to thank the drivers who wait for us uh, out the, uh, the side, uh, the south entrance, as we run in and out, and they safely get us to where um, we need to be. The second special thank you that I want to make, though, is to my Chief of Staff, Liz Carey. Um, there was a deal when Liz uh, came to work with me as my Chief of Staff uh, that when her son Lewis was ready to start school, um, she would be moving back to Victoria. Well, the time has come, despite the fact that I've tried to put every obstacle in the way of Lewis reaching um, school age, um, it has happened. And so Liz is moving uh, to Victoria uh, and uh, her family, I know, uh, Victoria and, and to be with, with family. Uh, I know many members uh, will have dealt with and spoken with Liz on a range of issues uh, in my portfolios. And I, I know that she is highly regarded by those who have spoken with her. She's worked tirelessly at an incredibly high standard. If you know me, you know that I do have high standards. I know that she's respected across government uh, and I know that she's uh, respected uh, across politics as well. She's certainly respected uh, by me. I wish her, Joe, and Lewis every success uh, for the next phase of their life. I'm confident that whatever Liz Carey puts her mind to, she will be successful at. Uh, Honourable members, there are 107 days until the next election. To everybody who's heading out to every corner of Western Australia to campaign in their electorates, good luck. But of course, if you're not on Team Red, then actually not very much luck at all. Um, I will see you out there uh, in the trenches. I do wish sincerely everybody a really peaceful and joyous Christmas uh, and festive season. Enjoy the time with your family and friends. Rest, recharge and stay safe. Uh, we will be back. Um, sometime after the election and before those members who are leaving us uh, um, actually do finish their term uh, in, uh, in late May. So I know that we will uh, have the opportunity to celebrate the contribution that they have all made uh, to this place. So we'll see you back here in 2021. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Prince, I'd just like to stand to make a few comments at the conclusion of the, not just this year, but this parliamentary session. Uh, to start with, can I just uh, go through the chamber and through the House and thank, um, first of all, the Honourable Sue Ellery. Ours is actually turning into a very long-term relationship. 
I thought it was about to end and um, uh, it's uh, uh, decided to continue it. And, you know, we've had our moments, but we've always had a very, dare I say, constructive and productive relationship, and I thank you. I also thank the Honourable Stephen Dawson in his capacity as Deputy, but also as uh, our Minister for Disability Services. And we have a very good working relationship and a very effective working relationship, so thank you. And to all members of the Labor Party, thank you for your contribution, particularly in this very challenging year. Um, to the crossbench, to the mem members of the National Party, uh, and to the Greens, collectively. Um, you know, we are what make up a rich tapestry, as I've said, rich tapestry of uh, the alternate government. And, um, uh, and everyone that's not in the government is an potentially an alternate government. Now, I've spent a lot of time working with you guys, and we have spent a lot of time working with you guys over the last four years, and the last year in particular. And it's always been an extraordinarily fruitful um, and rewarding experience. You know, we don't always agree on things, the same as we do with the government. But the relationship is always honest, open and transparent. And uh, I regard each and every one of you as friends, as I do with the government, let us say. But I spent a lot more time negotiating and working um, with the members of the non-government party. So thank you very much for contributing to what is a dynamic legislative council. So thank you very much. Um, to the blue team, to my, to my guys. As I say every year, it's my absolute privilege to be your leader, um, and I'm delighted to be continuing. Um, we're a small group, but dare I say, it, I'd like to think we're a very effective group, and we are an extraordinarily harmonious group. As everyone knows, it's in a, one of the major parties. Sometimes you have your little battles and your little um, your little groupings, but we just don't have that in the in the uh, with the Legislative Council group in the uh, uh, in the Liberal Party. I was waiting for some smart aleck quip from the Honourable Simon O'Brien, then he was just about to open his mouth and he decided against it. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, uh, I firmly believe that. I'm going to lose, you know, the, dep the Deputy, the Honourable Michael Mission, I'm going to lose, but dare I say, am I allowed to call you the grandfather of the house or is it the father of the house? Uh, the father of the house, um, Simon O'Brien and our whipping the Honourable Ken Baston um, next year, and I'll have more to say, of course, about that. But I'm really going to miss you guys. I really, really am going to miss you guys. It's not going to be the same without you, but I'll have more to say about that next year. Um, so collectively, thanks to everyone. It's a continue. We, you know, we always, we always comment about the values and the attributes of the Legislative Council. When you are a part of it, you really understand why Nothing beats a Legislative Council. So thanks to each and every one of you. Um, Madam President, it's always a pleasure. You, you know your experience, your expertise, um, your effectiveness, your efficiency, the fact that you're so balanced in your rulings and your judgment and the manner in which you conduct the proceedings of this House is testament to your character. So thank you. Um, to the clerk, Nigel Pratt, and to your, the Chamber staff, exceptional. Um, you really do a good job. You keep the, you know, the engine room, the Rolls-Royce engine room that keeps this place humming. So to you and collectively to the chamber staff, thank you so much. As with Hansard, who always make us sound or read a lot better than we actually probably say. So well done to Hansard. You guys are also exceptional. And uh, Madam President, I won't go through the, the entire um, parliamentary precinct. Suffice to say, the catering staff are extraordinary. Security ground staff, the committee staff are wonderful. Exceptionally pro professional working environment um, to, uh, to be employed under. As the Leader of the House has said, this has been an exceptional year and you don't need any of, any of us to just keep on repeating that. But what we've tried to do, and I think we've done effectively, is to rise to the challenges and meet those challenges as a legislative body in assisting the government uh, to facilitate the swift passage of legislation which has ensured that Western Australians have remained safe. And that, again, is testament to the professionalism of everyone that, that, uh, that's in this chamber. Um, and um, so COVID did bring with us its challenges. Uh, we rose to that challenge and uh, we will do so again if required. But as well as that, of course, we had the other legislation to deal with that, of course, uh, perhaps it's not as seamless or as prompt or, or uh, dare I say, as efficient as probably the Leader of the House would have preferred. I've been in that chair. I know what it's like. Um, ideally, we won't have the same... Um, whoever is in power, we won't have the same 
um, challenges that we did this year. So having said that to everyone, um, thank you once again. I do wish you all a blessed Christmas. Um, for those that you love and those that love you, I hope that is a wonderful time of the year for you. And that for 2021, uh, I hope that it brings each and every one of you good health and happiness. And we'll see what happens after March 13, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie Bordell. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I rise as well on behalf of the National Party to um, make some comments about the, the year that we've had. And, and um, it has really been an unprecedented year. There's no doubt about that. Um, I do want to uh, thank, on behalf of West Australians, and congratulate as well the McGowan government on how you have dealt with the COVID response for Western Australia. Um, I think it really has placed Western Australians with a degree of confidence regarding how we've managed uh, our response to COVID. Um, and I also think in terms of negotiating with the federal government, it's really a new paradigm of how that can happen. And that's been one of the things that I've really watched with interest around how we can now carry that forward as a state and one of the most important states in Western Australia, we really should have that voice and should be heard and perhaps this shows a way that it can be done differently. So that has been um, something that I think all West Australians would want to congratulate the government on. Um, there's no doubt that on the 1st of January 2020, uh, nobody thought that we would be dealing with a global pandemic and not only the health risk that that created for everyone, uh, but also the economic risk that then were a fallout um, and we'll probably be involved in managing that for some time to come. Um, I think particularly in a regional sense being removed, it's been one of the things being representatives of a regional area like all of the National Party are, how do you get that extra layer of, um, I guess, risk management in a regional sense and in, in terms of health and economic recovery? Uh, because we want to ensure that all of West Australians get the opportunity to take advantage uh, now as we turn to recovery. So um, I know the National Party will be focused on that way past my time here, but I, I really do think that's been one of the important roles the National Party has played this year in highlighting maybe some of um, the extra uniqueness that, that are the challenges that uh, people in regional WA face. Um, I also want to, uh, Madam President, just take a moment for the House to reflect on the condolence motions that we've passed this year and some fairly significant ones. Uh, for me, particularly uh, a former member of the National Party, the Honourable Tom McNeill, and we did his condolence motion recently. Uh, the Honourable Kevin Lay, who was a friend uh, of mine since I was a young person and also came from uh, Carnarvon, and I respected him greatly and um, enjoyed the opportunity and the privilege and the honour to be able to make some comments uh, in relation to the time he served here. Uh, the, also, the Honourable Clive Griffiths, uh, a former president of the House and well-respected member um, and also, whilst not a condolence motion, certainly um, the reflection on the life of Andrea Mitchell, a member of the other place, uh, was deeply felt by members of the Legislative Council. And uh, we, we, again, place on our record our thanks to those former members uh, who served their time while they were custodians in this place um, to the best of their ability. Um, in relation to, the, to some of the issues that I've highlighted, uh, may also reflect a code of conduct, uh, Madam President, that I think it, it is time. Uh, the parliament is a place of leadership. It's a place where people expect us as members and the parliamentary process to support the public and a leader in this space. And um, highlighting issues, uh, particularly on a personal nature, is never easy. Uh, but while you are here and you have the opportunity, no matter how hard it is, you should do it in response to other people who don't have that opportunity. And, um, and the hundreds of messages, Madam President, that I have received 
uh, since highlighting some of those issues has been really overwhelming and something that I will be forever grateful for. Um, and I will continue to work with the National Party uh, to ensure that we get a better process. Uh, I want to also thank the members of the Legislative Council and uh, the staff in their support of me during that time um, and, and, and an ongoing basis. Some people have said to me, would, as a retiring member, would I miss the Legislative Council? And I said, well, no, because I will always feel that I'm a member of it and the people that I've served with during my time here will always um, have a place in my heart and mind and particularly around the support that I've received from members across the chamber and I really thank you wholeheartedly for that. Um, our challenge for next year, obviously, everybody's challenge is uh, the state election. It won't be mine. I might be on a beach somewhere <laughs> and I'll enjoy that. <laughs> um, uh, but I wish uh, all members of this place uh, luck with the election uh, and I'm sure that the Legislative Council, uh, with the exceptional leadership of uh, the clerk of the council, the president and your team, that you will welcome new members and you will see retiring members and, and out um, in the way that we do. And uh, I have no doubt that the next parliament will be as well supported as I have been in this place. So Merry Christmas to everybody and stay safe to your families in particular. And do take some time to reflect and replenish your soul <laughs> for next year, uh, because it'll be the start of another four year term and an exciting opportunity. So. Thank you all very much and have a restful season. Yeah. Thank you, Madam President. And I rise on behalf um, of the Greens um, to note the end of what has been an interesting term and a quite unprecedented and extraordinary year. Um, every year of, of this term, uh, my, my members, the, our members have taken turns uh, doing the traditional Christmas greeting. And here I am at the end of the term. And I was concerned that members had not heard enough from me. And so I'm here to, uh, to ensure that you get to hear more, more from me now. Um, I'd want to, I want to thank everybody in, in this chamber um, for their friendship and um, for, make, for, their, for being fun, frankly, and for, and for an, extra, an extraordinary um, time. Um, I, I, want to I want to thank the, 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 Hon the Honourable C. Ellery and also the Honourable Steve Dawson for your leadership in, in this place. Um, and I also I want to thank um, the other um, parliamentary leaders as well. I want to thank the Honourable Peter Collier, the Honourable Jackie Rodell, uh, the Honourable Colin Tinknell, uh, the Honourable um, Aaron Stonehouse, the Honourable, the Honourable Rick Mazza and the Honourable um, Charles Smith. Uh, we've we've um, certainly attempted to uh, make sure that communication is open and that we are working um, as uh, working to try to uh, make sure that the um, chamber is able to um, progress its business as effectively as as possible. It certainly has been a um, very challenging year for the community and uh, I will note that while people were talking about taking time out to learn how to make sourdough and to learn languages, we were working harder than ever and um, that's, that's the thing that uh, I think a lot of the members of the public don't, didn't necessarily see. I note that the federal parliament wasn't meeting and people presumed that we, w that we weren't either and we were working very hard and extended hours in order to try to ensure that we were um, facilitating the necessary um, actions that needed to be undertaken in order to address um, this unprecedented crisis of, of COVID-19. Um, and Madam President, I particularly would like to thank you uh, for the way that you, as a presiding officer, um, steered uh, the way that the Chamber was able to respond to that, uh, having to take um, unprecedented actions simply in terms of how we were going to make sure that this, safe as our, this place as our workplace uh, remained safe for us and all the staff um, that, that were in it. And I want to echo the concerns that have, uh, the, the comments that have already been made about you um, and as as um, president, I thank you for um, doing a marvellous job and to, um, and to make it clear that the Greens hold you in the highest regard and in terms of the way that you have um, conducted yourself. 
Um, I also want to um, thank quite a number of um, pe the people that helped make this parliament um, work. Uh, Madam President, you went through a lot of them, but I've got to acknowledge the committee staff in particular, uh, who make all of us look good. Let's be very clear. The committee staff are, are often the brains trust of a lot of the work that um, happens um, yeah, and with, this, with this chamber. And um, I want to thank them for their diligence and um, their commitment to um, ensuring uh, commitment to um, uh, excellence. Thank you so much. And my thanks also to the parliamentary staff. And again, there, was, there were so many that were already listed, but uh, we are talking the dining staff, the cleaning staff, the front desk, the building services, gardeners, kitchen, admin, IT, HR. The list is, is huge because there's so many people um, that help to make sure that um, parliament is able to be a well-oiled oiled machine. But I want to give a particular thanks to NO Schiff, um, who has been extraordinarily helpful to me as I've hosted a number of functions throughout the course uh, of, of this term, so thank you um, to him. I also want to particularly have a shout out to Tony Patterson and his staff with security um, who have gone over, over and above. Um, I'm very grateful um, to them. I'm very grateful to them um, for responding concerns um, as, as they arise. And, I, and all of this, of course, has happened under the um, very capable leadership of Rob Hunter, and I particularly want to thank him for finally getting rid of those ridiculous <laughs> sewage pipes um, out the front of Parliament House, even though as a, as a mini driver I, they made for a great little um, rally, um, you know, rally obstacle, po um, obstacle course. Um, I don't think that they uh, really did this um, place any, any favours, and so I'm pleased that they're gone. And of course... <laughs> And, I, and of course, um, I want to thank the, um, the, 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 the staff in this chamber. Um, you're all so professional and friendly and, and uh, incredibly helpful. And this is, um, and particularly I want to acknowledge our clerk, um, Nigel Pratt. So thank you very much for the leadership that you've, and for being so accessible and, um, and so helpful uh, all the time. But I wanted to have a particular shout out to the Hansard um, staff as well. Um, the Hansard staff have a huge job having to um, obviously uh, keep track of uh, everything we're saying. And a lot of, and obviously, a lot of what I'm saying in this in this place. And I'm sh quite sure that they um, probably uh, go back to their offices and have uh, have some quite a bit to say amongst themselves about the sorts of things that we say and the sorts of things that we do. But I wanted to say that to the Hansard staff, I'd like to point out that. We note you as well, and um, in particular, um, on this front bench, and I um, would particularly like to note the Honourable Sam Rowe, the Honourable Darren West, myself, and the Honourable Tim Clifford, is that we we, we will notice when you have, when you come in looking particularly good, when you're wearing a particularly nice outfit, when your hair is when your hair's been done, when you're back from leave, um, and we'll often have co um, comments amongst ourselves about how um, good um, you know a particular um, hands are people are looking um, on any particular day. So, you, so um, by, by all means, I'm sure that comments are made about us, but we're favourably commenting um, on you and we're noting, we're noting you as well. So I just thought I'd, I'd point that out. Um, I, I did want to say also, um, I've, I've had the privilege of being able to uh, head up to uh, um, two parliamentary friends groups and I wanted to acknowledge uh, the parliamentary friends of children, co-leads, um, Lisa Baker and Mia Davies and in this place, the Honourable Do um, Donna Farragher. And also I've, um, um, I've, I've headed up um, the Parliamentary Friends of Refugees uh, with the Honourable Janine Freeman. And um, I'd like to acknowledge her and, the, and uh, her recent announcement that she will not be um, recontesting. And I want to thank them for that. Um, going a bit closer to home, an enormous thanks to um, all the green staff for all of our officers. Um, they w work so hard and they work over and above. They are absolutely committed um, to the work that we do, to what it is we stand for, and um, and I'm and I'm just forever um, I I forever grateful for what they do. I particularly want to acknowledge to Castor, Kirsten, Aaron Piper, Tom, and James from my office. Um, but I think all four of us would would like to give a special um, shout out thanks to Tonya Brasich who is our WIPS clerk and our research assistant and she is extraordinarily good and I thank her. Um, I want to thank my Greens colleagues 
Um, yeah, there's only four of us in this place, but we, we try very hard um, to, to, um, to, to apply ourselves diligently to the work in this chamber. And I particularly want to note the Honourable Robin Chappell, um, who will not be contesting the next election. Robin and I have been um, friends um, since about 1994, um, and so we've known each other for a very, very long time. Um, he has served in this chamber for a very long time period of time. Um, I am really glad that um, he is finally going to be able to um, take some time to be able to rest, although I really don't think he's going to be taking much of a rest from the issues that are core to his heart, and that's particularly looking at issues of, of Aboriginal heritage. But I did want to thank him um, very much and, and, acknowledge, and acknowledge him. Um, so I just um, want to say uh, for those of you who um, celebrate Christmas, and I'm one of the people who celebrates Christmas with my family, um, I would like to wish you all a happy Christmas, otherwise happy Hanukkah, happy Gita Gianti, happy Kwanzaa, or happy Festivus, if that's your thing. Uh, whatever it is, uh, it is a time for us to be with loved ones um, and hopefully um, to be able to stay safe and uh, hopefully to have a little bit of a rest. For many of us, we are going into a, an election year. I hope people, um, I hope people are kind. Um, I hope people look after themselves. I'll be attempting to hold on to my seat, as will my colleagues, and we're hoping to be joined um, by others. But I do wish everyone a wonderful Christmas. Um, I wish everyone a wonderful holidays. Please stay safe. Thanks, Madam President. Um, just want to make a brief statement. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone in this chamber. It's actually an honour to be a, a member of the uh, Legislative Council. Uh, I really do love the debates that go on in this place. It's actually a pleasure to be a part of the, that rich tapestry that Peter mentioned before, the Honourable Peter Collier, um, where we have a, a lot of different parties. To the major parties, uh, to the other crossbench parties, thank you for working with us. Um, One Nation is new to Parliament and we've enjoyed our uh, four years and we will be fighting as hard as you know to come back again. And um, I want to say a special thanks to the crossbench, to all the staff, the President, both the Parliament committees and especially our, our staff for the Honourable uh, Robin uh, uh, Scott and myself. Um, I want to say thank you to, to our staff as well. Um, Christmas is a special time. I hope everyone stays safe. I hope everyone has a fantastic Merry Christmas and a really good Happy New Year. And I, uh, I'll see you all uh, probably on Election Day, but I'll also see you all in May. Honourable Rick Mazza. Thank you, Madam President. And I don't intend to delay the House too long. We've got a very important event, of course, once the House rises. Look, it's been a very interesting year for me, um, Madam President, in, at many levels. One thing that I have uh, experienced on the um, PPC is the enormous dedication, capacity and intellect of the clerks of this Legislative Council. And I don't think we really appreciate just uh, how dedicated and uh, how professional they are. And I'm very grateful for um, the clerks' uh, support over this last 12 months and their guidance, particularly, um, the hon uh, not the Honourable, particularly Nigel Pratt, who, lead who obviously leads those clerks. Madam President, um, I got a bit of an early Christmas present. I've obviously had a fair bit of um, pressure over this last few months. But on the 14th of this month, my 10th grandchild, uh, Liam Grayson Mazza, was born. A very healthy eight and a half pound and uh, little brother to uh, Jackson Ricky Mazza. Um, <laughs> so I was very pleased about that. And, and I just wanted to mention that because uh, Liam's mother, very soon after giving birth, uh, had a, a code blue emergency and uh, she was at the Bunbury Regional Hospital and as my son uh, had explained it, there was a swarm of uh, professional medical staff there within seconds and they managed to deal with that issue very, very quickly. So because of the dedication of those people, I know that we quite often um, criticise you know, the health department, whatever the case may be, but Western Australia has an absolute first-class health system, the WA Country Health System, uh, and those staff at the Bunbury Regional Hospital did a fantastic job. And because of their dedication, we will have a very Merry Christmas this year, which could have gone another way. 
Also, uh, I'd like to, to thank um, my electorate staff in, in Anne, uh, Lucy and, and Tim, who have been there with me for the last four years. They're, they're a wonderful um, group of people, very dedicated, uh, and sort of keep, uh, keep things real for me when I'm in here and they're sort of feeding information in and out. Uh, without their support, um, I would be all the poorer, that's for sure. So, Madam President, uh, I thank you for your leadership. Um, I will echo uh, the sentiments of others in relation to the parliament as a whole when it comes to um, you know, the dining staff or those that keep the, the grounds of the parliament in first class condition or whatever. Uh, with that, Madam President, I wish uh, every member of this place a very merry and safe um, Christmas. It has been a pleasure working with you all. Uh, I thought I'd make a few comments on the basis that um, I don't know whether I'll be here next Christmas uh, as a member of this, of this council or not. It's a candle in the wind, we never know. But um, I do wish you all the best, and if I don't happen to see you between now and, uh, and May, um, enjoy the time. Yeah. Are there any further comments? Oh. Members, I wish you a very happy and safe Christmas, and I'll see you on the other side. The House is now adjourned. <laughs>